So I'm a pretty skeptical person when it comes to the paranormal, albeit having a vested interest in the tales and evidence. I'm the kind of person who browses ghost hunter videos on YouTube and stories on Reddit. I've also visited plenty of purportedly haunted locations in the US, including but not limited to places like the Omni Parker House, the Molly Brown House, the Whaley House, Alcatraz at night, the Winchester House more than once, and none of them have yielded any sort of evidence. A part of me wants to believe, but is also terrified at the prospect of witnessing something. I was mostly a non-believer, up until a couple of months ago. In short, I had wanted to plan a surprise party and get away for my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She had mentioned wanting to hit the slopes. It was January, so it was still winter time at this point. I organized this months ahead and had invited some of her closest friends to join. I ended up renting an Airbnb cabin that had enough rooms to house 10 people or five couples. One entire lower floor basement level with two beds a room on the first floor, and three rooms upstairs. Also adding that this cabin was in a beautiful rural neighborhood in Tahoe, California, with tons of cabins next door, down the street, adjacent, etc. So there's plenty of housing around us. Nothing peculiar about it. And there are other people staying around. Of course, my girlfriend and I take the master bedroom upstairs, and right across the hall is another couple in one room and my girlfriend's cousin by herself in the third room next door. All rooms are taken, and the middle floor is a lively area with games, a fireplace, and a foosball table. These details are somewhat relevant and important later in the story. The first night was a night of merry drinking and games. To celebrate the occasion, we had decorated the living area and blown up balloons to be loosely strewn about the large and cozy living room and the family room where we imbibed. It was almost uneventful with respect to weird happenings, except toward the end of the night, balloons would randomly pop at odd intervals. Someone in our group suggested that it was the balloons getting attracted toward the heater vents and popping. I was dismissive of this because not all of them that popped were congregated near vents. I just took note. I didn't want to argue or suggest anything weird at this point. After we all retired for the night and all the lights were off, we could hear balloons popping downstairs at random intervals that reverberated through the silent house. This happened between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. The next morning, there were still plenty of healthy balloons strewn about. Fast forward to night two. After we return from snow activities, we prep for drinking and the usual. After a full day's worth of shredding the snow, we're all collectively tired a bit earlier than the previous night, and we decide to retire around 11.30 to midnight. Here's where I personally experienced things that got me feeling irked. Since it was cold, I decided to go downstairs to turn on the thermostat or heater. Our couple friends across the hall had their door slightly open ajar, the lights were on, and the bathroom was in use. As I'm going downstairs in the dark stairwell, I hear the floorboards behind me creak. I figure it was my friend coming out to follow me for a cup of water or to go to the kitchen. As I walk across the living room and stop at the thermostat, the lights are still off at this point and the creaks continue. And then I hear it stop a few feet behind me near the kitchen. The kitchen lights don't turn on and I hear nothing else. Feeling like he was waiting behind me and I was being watched, I said, What's up, dude? Need something? I turn around and nobody is there. I've only ever read about this dreadful feeling of being watched, and it is indeed every bit as dreadful upon realization in person. A minute ago, I swore someone followed me down. I was taken aback and my skeptical self once again took note and spoke nothing of it. I went back upstairs. About 30 minutes pass and it's still cold. At this point, everyone is asleep and I decide to turn up the thermostat a couple of notches, nothing crazy. 
I turn on the upstairs hallway light bright enough to light the steps and see from downstairs. I proceeded to head downstairs and stop once again at the thermostat. No floorboard creaks except for my own this time. As I'm turning up the thermostat and thinking to myself how odd that creaking was the first time, a noise broke my train of thought. I hear the ball from the foosball table several feet away near the fireplace audibly roll across its surface and hit one of the side walls. Nobody is around and I am certainly too far away to touch it. I froze in fear and hastily went back upstairs. Somehow I went back to sleep, not even knowing how to mentally process the increasingly evident occurrences. I eventually fall asleep under the pretense that nothing is definitive enough for me to be conclusively sure that this cabin is haunted. I don't mention or wake anyone up about my experiences. The next morning as we leave and drive back home, the balloons were brought up by my girlfriend's friend and couple who stayed across the hall. I took this as an opening to talk about my experiences and I disclosed them. At this point, my girlfriend's friend goes pale gets really serious and tells us that the previous night she was still wide awake when she noticed a dark figure standing at the foot of her bed. She states that she went into panic mode after blinking and realizing that it wasn't a dream or a hallucination. She shook her boyfriend awake, the guy that I thought had followed me down the stairs earlier that night, only to have it disappear when he woke up. This, by far, coupled with my experiences, is undeniable evidence. I myself was wide-eyed upon hearing this solid piece of information. My girlfriend's cousin, who stayed in the room next to us, then mentions that she heard what sounded like breathing in her room, but dismissed it as naturally occurring sounds of the walls of the cabin. These events standalone could be nominal and may be explained, but collectively, it's really hard to deny that something was present and amiss. I'm hoping that this is the extent of my run-ins with the paranormal, because I don't want to experience anything like this again. The universe has made this skeptic more of a believer. telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now. These are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, 
And I'm not the only one. My parents avoided too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy, despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. 
It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. This past New Year's was mine and my boyfriend's four year anniversary. We typically don't do much, so this year we decided to make it special by planning a romantic getaway. At the time, the two of us were living in Seattle and wanted to rent a cabin in a snowy small town for the weekend. We found an Airbnb with a hot tub and we were sold. The cabin was, of course, the last house on the road. To get to it, you had to drive down a small removed private road that ended in a roundabout. Off the roundabout was a long uphill driveway leading to our cabin. We got to the cabin and it was snowy and beautiful. The cabin itself sat on top of a garage and you needed to take stairs on the back side of the property to get to the front door. When we got inside, there was a booklet with all of the cabin's info outlined. The book said that during the snowy season, don't be surprised if their contracted snowplowers showed up to clear off the driveway. Okay, sounds good. We unpacked and realized that there was no service on either of our phones, but the booklet told us there was a landline in the cabin if we needed anything. We spent the first night by the fire playing board games and drinking wine. The weekend was exactly what we needed. We planned to spend the next day in town, and that night, I had booked us a reservation for a nice dinner. We were gone almost all day, only returning briefly to get dressed up and enjoy some good food. Dinner was great, and we were excited to head back to the cabin for some champagne hot tubbing. While at dinner, the temperature had dropped and it snowed for the first time that day coating everything in a fresh layer of powder. We drove down the private road and got to the driveway. At that point, my boyfriend stopped the car, headlights shining in front, and asked if I noticed the new tire tracks. I looked at the driveway, hoping to quickly disregard the new tire tracks, but there they were. Immediately, we remembered that the snow powers could have stopped by. But the issue was we saw the tire tracks because of the snow and who plows in the dark. We also knew that once we were at the cabin, we had no service on our cell phones. So we figured that we would head back into town and message our Airbnb hosts and ask them if them or one of their friends had stopped by the apartments. We waited for a while in town for a reply from our hosts, but didn't hear back. 
We could have called at that point, but it was past ten and we didn't want to be bad guests. We figured we blew the whole thing out of proportion and might as well head back to the cabin. After all, I am big into true crime, spooky subreddits, and horror movies, so I figured I was probably just psyching myself out. My boyfriend drove us back, and this time we actually drove up the driveway. Toward the top of the hill, I noticed something. My stomach dropped as I noticed footprints on the property. We backed down the driveway and took a closer look to see if there were more footprints. From what it looked like, someone had driven up the driveway, reversed down, parked, and then got out of the car and walked onto the property. Since we had now also driven on the tracks, we couldn't find where the footprints ended. The property was quite large, with tons of trees and brush, and we knew that these footprints could go anywhere. The moment we saw footprints, we decided to call the police. We figured it was better safe than sorry. We would just have the officer go onto the property with us to check everything out. We drove down the road until we had service, called the police, and waited for their arrival. The policeman showed up and we followed him onto the property. The police officer scanned the property and determined that there was nobody out there. Obviously, we were a little shaken up and a lot embarrassed, but we thanked the officer as he left. Needless to say, neither of us wanted to sit in the hot tub in the dark woods after what we'd seen. Instead, we locked the doors and watched a movie, Champagneless. We were both tired from the day and we passed out pretty quickly. At 3 a.m., we both woke up on the couch with the TV on and all the lights, laughing about how the night hadn't turned out quite as planned. As my boyfriend went to brush his teeth, we heard a noise. It sounded mechanical and it only lasted a few seconds. We looked at each other and froze. The garage door. There are very few reasons that somebody would need to open the garage door of a guest-occupied Airbnb at 3 in the morning. Like I said, we woke up to all of our lights on, and the cabin had lots of windows. We knew that if somebody was outside, they knew we were there, and they could see us. I immediately grabbed the landline and dialed 911. We sat crouched in the Airbnb, praying for the police to arrive. We knew that whoever had made those tracks was still on the property, and this time they were making noise. As I sat talking to the operator, we heard a bang on our balcony, as if somebody had thrown something up onto it. I was losing my absolute mind when the operator told me that the police were nearby. All of a sudden, they were there. We saw the police lights and watched them search the property. Soon we heard banging on the door, it was the police. We were okay. At the door were two policemen, one right in front of us and one a little bit behind, kind of kicking around snow and looking at the ground. I immediately noticed that the police officer in the back was the one that had done the initial check on the property. The police officer told us that not only was the garage door shut, but it was locked, and again there were no signs of somebody on the property. We discussed leaving, but the police officer said that the road conditions were too dangerous at that time of night. I looked over at the police officer, who had to come out to the property twice, and I felt that I had deeply disappointed him. My boyfriend and I went back inside, again locking all the doors, and tried to sleep. The next day, we were leaving, and while we survived the night, I didn't feel right in the cabin anymore. It was forever the spooky cabin in my head, and I wanted to leave. As we packed, we heard the same noise that we had heard at 3 a.m. It turns out it was the heater. A heater that sounded just like the garage and lasted for the same duration. My boyfriend looked at me and immediately said, you really need to give up your murder shows, and walked away, as if. As for the banging on the balcony, it was just the perfectly timed fall of a pine cone. A really big pine cone. I promise I'm not paranoid. 
I think back on this story a lot, and I'm very embarrassed about how little came of it, but also incredibly grateful for the same reason. But, still, somebody drove onto that property and walked around. And that part still deeply unsettles me. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory we made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks and since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20-something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, I come along, thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at around 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much, so our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river, into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. 
On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked, along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes. Except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs her smiling face undulating from the shadows. I'm 18 now, but from the ages of three to 11, my family and I lived in a large four bedroom Victorian home. It wasn't really the location you would expect a haunted house to be in. We were right next to a busy street, in a row of other houses. All very old, though. The house had three floors, as the attic had been converted into two bedrooms, and a large walk-in storage cupboard separated the two rooms. I lived with my three older half-siblings, and so it was very common for us to swap rooms every few months. I had slept in every room, my parents' room quite often as I was terrified every night, the large room opposite theirs, and the two attic rooms. Each one seemed to have its own different type of horror. For the first few years, I was too terrified to sleep on my own, 
I barely slept, and when I did, I suffered from terrible nightmares, so I would sleep in a camp bed in my parents' room. That was where I had my first encounter with sleep paralysis. I couldn't have been older than six, but I still remember it vividly. A small boy with a paper bag over his head seemed to emerge from the wall next to my mother's side of the bed and slowly but surely walked around their bed toward me. I remember looking to my side and there was what I can only describe as a tall black stick figure, like one of those drawings, who was looking above me. I couldn't move, I was sweating profusely, but I knew that I was awake. The next thing I knew, he was crouching down to me, and the boy had reached the foot of my bed. It was at that moment that I managed to let out a scream. I have never had anything as vivid as that happen again, but I will never forget it. When I was seven or eight, I started wanting to have my own room. I did a lot of reading to distract myself from the fear, and often I would stay up until the early hours of the morning reading, too terrified to sleep waking up in the morning with my book still in my arms. I was given one of the attic rooms. By that point, my older sister had the room opposite mine, but she had gone off to university, so I was alone up there. I would never dare sleep without the light on, and to be honest, old habits never die, as even now I still sleep with a light on, unless I'm with my boyfriend. Most nights would be me reading in bed as long as I could, until I just had to close my eyes. It was then that the voices would start up, like there was a couple arguing in the hall. On some of the worst nights, I swore that I could hear breathing coming from under my bed. It got to a point where I was so scared, I had to have my dog and cat sleep in my room with me, but they couldn't settle. My dog would just keep crying and my cat was constantly spooked. They hated being in there so I had no choice but to remain alone. The night terrors continued. I'd wake up and I just couldn't stand to be in the room anymore. So I'd creep down to the second floor and sleep outside my parents' door. I don't know how I even functioned with so little sleep. Most times I couldn't have sleepovers as my friends would complain of being scared and hearing things. My siblings had similar experiences when my sister had her friends over, often her friend would recount waking up in the night, and my sister was sitting up in bed, still asleep, but talking to the dark corner of the room. My brother would have his covers pulled off of him at night, and my other sister recalled her toes being pinched while she slept. Everyone had their own experiences in that house, even non-believers. My dad recounted being locked out from the outside of the house when he went to the garden even though he was the only one home, and seeing a dark shadow glide next to the door as he struggled to open it. There were times I would be sitting outside my parents' room at three in the morning, and I would hear the cutlery drawer downstairs being shaken, the TV being turned on for a split second, then turned off, even though I knew that everyone was asleep. I couldn't do anything in that house without the feeling that I was being watched. If I was alone in the house, I would stay out in the garden the whole time, but even then I felt extremely uneasy. I would sit on my trampoline and feel a pair of eyes watch me from the living room window that looked out onto the garden. Our elderly neighbor told my father the backstory of the house when my dad would sometimes recount the strange occurrences going on. He told us years before we moved in there lived a very reclusive middle-aged woman known to be very cold and unwelcoming. She didn't leave often, only to go to work as a gym teacher. She was known to be sadistic. He mentioned something extremely chilling though, which was that she had confided in him once that she lived in fear of the house and that she refused to go into the attic because it terrified her. She died several years before we moved. One of the most chilling things was that once she passed, the house was completely renovated. The attics turned into rooms, as I mentioned. The flower beds that Mrs. Evans had taken so much pride in were torn up and everything changed. 
The work was mostly done by one man, who had been hired to do so by the local council, who inherited the house, as Mrs. Evans had no family to speak of. Just days after he'd finished up the renovation, his daughter died in a freak lightning accident. I personally have no idea if it was related, but it's terribly unfortunate either way. But the neighbors seemed to think that whatever was in that house certainly did not take kindly to it being changed and decided to take revenge. That's just hearsay, mind you, but it's a little chilling nonetheless. I do believe that there were several entities in that house, including possibly Mrs. Evans herself, but the strongest resided in the attic. I felt things up there that I have never since encountered, a genuine feeling of something evil, something that wants to hurt you. I can't even recall how many times people were seemingly pushed when going down the stairs from the attic, or whenever my cat, who was usually the loveliest boy, was near those stairs, he would viciously attack you with no explanation for the outburst. The whole house had its moments. It was in a constant state of darkness and bitter cold, but the attic? I don't even have the words to describe what that was. We finally moved when I was 11, and as if by magic, the nightmares disappeared. I could finally sleep easily. We've moved several times since then, and I have never encountered a house like that again. Honestly, I haven't had any paranormal experiences at all that I can think of since being in that house, but that is fine with me. It was enough for a lifetime. I do think it will always be with me, though. Sometimes I'll have the most vivid dreams that I'm back there, and I'm so glad to be there. Almost as though the house in the attic is calling me back. I have so many stories of creepy things happening, so much so that I'd have to talk for hours to tell them all. But I think it's more than enough for now. This story was posted to Reddit by user Wernover Klimt, who tells about a theater with a ghostly reputation. Here's the tale. About 30 years ago, I spent several years working in movie theaters in Worcester, Massachusetts. My favorite was the huge old building that had been chopped up into four separate cinemas. It had been a beautiful theater back when it was built in 1926 as the Poli Palace. Though it had been semi-destroyed during modernization in the late 50s, there were still many original features of the building that remained. As a manager, I had been issued a big keychain that gave me access to the entirety of the building, and I spent countless hours exploring nearly every part of that building. Except the curtain loft, which would have required climbing an iron ladder up about 80 feet. No thank you. The building had attics and basements and crawl spaces. There was an area in the front of the building on the second floor that had two or three abandoned businesses that had been walled off. There was a music store and a ballet studio and maybe an office. There was also a bathroom. Everything looked like it was from the 1940s or 50s. Faded wallpaper with ballerina motif, a peeling mirror on the wall. In another section of the building was the old manager's office, with high ceilings and crown molding and a beautiful stained glass window that I believe dated back to 1912 and had previously been part of an adjacent theater. There was still an old safe in the office. I found a newspaper article in the public library from 1942 or 44 that detailed an armed robbery when two men had tied up the managers in the office and robbed the safe. One of those men was later executed in the electric chair for an unrelated crime. We used the old manager's office to store giant 30-gallon bags of popcorn. There was also a sort of crawl space under the box office that was accessible by lifting a hinged plywood panel and climbing over a four-foot wall. On the other side, 
were the remains of a couple of basement rooms with broken concrete and bricks strewn about. In one of those rooms, I found an old flared Coca-Cola glass in perfect condition. I kept it for years. I also found a deck of cards in a handmade leather pouch with a snap closure, fashioned out of a buffalo nickel. There were also old dressing rooms with makeup mirrors and light bulbs. The paint was peeling off the walls in potato chip sized flakes. As you can surmise, the building was purported to be haunted. The head manager claimed to have had ghostly experiences, so I'll start there, I guess. When the building was remodeled in the late 1950s, the men's room in the basement was converted into the manager's office. One night, while closing up, the manager, my boss, made his way up to the stairs to the main lobby. As he emerged, something caught his eye. Way up by the ornate 30-foot ceiling, he saw an apparition floating there. It disappeared into the ceiling. Terrified, he ran back down the stairs and hid in the office until daylight. Another time, he was again working late. There were several arcade machines in an area of the lobby, and they were normally powered off when the last shows were in. As he climbed the stairs, he heard all of the machines making their electronic bleeps and bloops. He was annoyed that the usher had clearly failed to turn off the machines before punching out, and realized that he would have to go do it himself. As soon as he opened the door, though, the noises stopped dead. Looking across the lobby from where he emerged, the machines were all dark. They were indeed powered off. A projectionist claimed that he looked out of the booth window one night in the big theater upstairs while shutting things down and saw a face looking in at him. I take those stories with a grain of salt. I was always skeptical of those based on the sources, but here's my experience. I was obsessed with the history of the building and would research newspaper archives for articles about it. There were rumors that a stagehand had died there in an accident during the time that it had been a vaudeville theater. I was never able to confirm that. I had talked about the building to my mother, and she, in turn, happened to discuss it with a woman that she worked with. The woman claimed to be a psychic or clairvoyant, or maybe just that she would get feelings about things. She told my mother that she had been to that theater, and that she felt that somebody had indeed been killed there, and that his name began with the letter M. My reaction was, okay, sure, she sounds nutty. Sometime later, I was the sole manager on duty on a slow night midweek. I was alone in the office in the basement. The seven o'clock shows were in, and I was doing paperwork. The intercom buzzed. It was the box office cashier calling to tell me that I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and she said that she didn't know. I hung up the intercom and pushed the button for the main incoming line where the call was holding. The earpiece erupted with a loud, close squealing and static. I used the word close because it was so loud and distinct that I assumed that it was something wrong with the phone PBX in our building rather than the line itself or the caller's phone. It was just the impression I had. Hello? Nothing. Just more squealing and static. Hello, I repeated. Hello? A man's voice. Calm, flat, distinct. Then nothing further. Who is this? I was a bit perplexed. All of the noise on the line and the callers seemingly reluctant to speak. This is Mike. Calm, quiet, not shouting over the noise of the line like he couldn't even hear it. Quite audible and clear then nothing but the awful squealing and static. I waited a few seconds for the caller to continue. After all, he called me. Presumably there was a reason, but nothing. Mike who, I said, feeling a little bit impatient. Mike is a common name, and there were two Mikes employed there at the time. One of them had a fairly high-pitched voice that sounded nothing like the caller. It didn't sound like the other Mike either. The line abruptly went dead, silent, 
The squealing and hissing stopped. I waited. Nobody called back. I called Sandy, the box office cashier, and asked her if they had asked for me personally or just to speak to the manager. She said that the caller had asked for me by name. And suddenly, I remembered my mother's friend. A man's name beginning with the letter M. Mike. It never happened again, and the phone never made those noises again. No one ever confessed to some kind of a prank. And I never figured out who it was. A couple of years ago, I babysat for a family friend. She and her husband lived with their two kids, a girl about seven who we'll call Kay, and a boy about 12 who we can call Jay. I babysat these kids so much that we became very close, brother and sister type deal. They weren't difficult kids. They had a hard home life because their parents were borderline abusive, but they were still good kids. I tried my best to be a positive adult I was only 18 or 19 during this experience. The family moved around a lot. I've known them now for over six years, and they have moved every single year. This experience happened in 2015. I was halfway through my senior year when the family moved into this house. It was really nice. It had just been built in 2013 or something like that. It was a nice neighborhood, but rent was really low. The mother often bragged about the steal of a deal she got for the house. To put it in perspective, the average rent in this area is about $1,200 a month just for an apartment. These guys got a whole two-story house, three beds, four baths, freshly built in a nice neighborhood for $650 a month. I thought it was weird and asked if there was anything wrong with the home, to which she replied that the inspection had come back clear. I didn't think much about it beyond that. I started babysitting, and I immediately felt something was off. I have anxiety, so going to new places really puts me in a funk. So I just figured that's what it was, at first. The way the home is set up is important. On the bottom floor, they had a living room, a dining area, and a kitchen with some other rooms. I spent most of my time in the living room, working on things for school while the kids were upstairs playing games or hanging out with friends. While you're in the living room, there's a wall that blocks you from seeing the stairs. Upstairs, there are bedrooms. Immediately off the stairs and above the living room is the parents' room, which was off limits to the kids. Then there was a loft area that looked down over the front door to make a grand foyer feeling. There's a light that can be on which can be seen from downstairs because of the loft. Then the kids' bedrooms were down the hall. So nothing really happened at first that was too mind-boggling. Little noises here and there, knocks on the walls, things being misplaced, lights flickering, but nothing that made me think ghosts. I figured they got what they paid for and my memory was garbage. After a couple of months, things started to pick up and I could no longer blame it on a bad memory or a faulty electrical system. The kids, who were usually very sweet and kind to each other, started becoming noticeably more snappy to everyone, especially Jay. He complained about having nightmares, about somebody standing in his doorway watching him. His parents wouldn't listen, though. Their behavior grew even worse as time went on. It was a weekend, and the parents were going to be gone for a while. The kids were upstairs just doing their thing. I was downstairs in the living room, looking at pizza to order for lunch. Out of nowhere, I hear really loud footsteps coming from above me in the parents' bedroom, thunderous even. Thinking that it was the kids being little dingus meats, I immediately headed upstairs to tell them to get out. But I was greeted with the two kids standing in their doorways, staring at the closed door to their parents' room. The footsteps and bangs were still going on inside. At this point, I thought it was an intruder. I instructed the kids to get into their rooms and lock their doors, 
and I called emergency and explained the situation. As I stayed on the phone, the footsteps continued to walk around the room. I could hear them moving in different locations. Two officers arrived, so I grabbed the kids and we waited outside. The banging still went on as one of the officers escorted us out. They came out empty-handed and said that there was nothing there and that there may have been something with the door because the banging stopped as soon as they opened it. I had felt the shaking of the floor moving around the room, so I knew that it wasn't a door, but I guess in my denial I ignored it. I took the kids out for ice cream and tried not to think about it. Another time, the kids and I were sitting in the dining area eating dinner. It was just us three in the house. From the dining area, you could see the light upstairs was on, and it cast a shadow onto the floor. I was making a joke about how I'm the only one who knows how to turn a light off around here, and that's when I saw a shadow of a hand from upstairs on the front door. And I think that's when it really started settling down with me, that the house was haunted. The kids didn't see it, and I didn't tell them. I figured it would just add stress that they really didn't need. I told the parents that night when they came home, but they brushed me off, saying they've never experienced anything at all. This continued on for a while. I would experience something, the kids would, but the parents wouldn't believe any of us. It was summer, just after I graduated high school. I remember it vividly because I was awake, reading articles about a huge thing that happened in my town. That's when the banging from upstairs started happening. I was used to it at this point, but what I was not used to was the banging footsteps coming down the stairs. These steps were methodical and menacing. I felt terrible energy in the room and it was cold, despite it being in the middle of summer in the south. I counted the seconds between steps, and it was five, every single time. I called out to the kids and told them to stop joking around, but I knew it wasn't them. I was terrified. The footsteps stopped at the bottom of the stairs, and I couldn't see who was there. Then I saw an apparition of a little girl. She had brunette hair and a red dress. She looked innocent enough, but the energy in the room was so heavy I almost threw up. She looked at me, and I looked at her, and she didn't move. I thought I was hallucinating, so I started to rub my eyes. But when I finished rubbing them, she was still there, right in front of me. No longer at the foot of the stairs. I never heard her move. In that situation, I couldn't move or do anything. My mind just went to kid brain, and I hid under the blanket I was using. I called the parents crying and told them to come back immediately. When they came, the energy in the room lightened, and I finally came out from under the blanket. She was gone. They asked what was wrong and what happened, and I told them, but of course it didn't matter, because they wouldn't believe me. I then informed them that they needed to find another babysitter, because I would not be returning. I still wonder about the kids. I hope they ended up okay. They moved out of that house at the end of the year, but I'm not sure if what I saw was attached to them or not. I'm still not sure what I saw. Anyway, I still have nightmares about the girl, and it's still a really frightening event for me. I am a 30-year-old male. When I was in my early 20s, I had a strange encounter with a man who claimed to be from my future. I'm not entirely sure that this could be considered a glitch. However, this incident was definitely peculiar and I haven't been able to completely forget about it since. Admittedly, some details are now hazy as this happened to me over 10 years ago but I have tried my hardest to remember as much information as I could in hopes of getting some closure. Around 2011, I was taking Japanese night classes once per week at a local university here in the UK. At the time, my classes would finish at around 9pm, and I would usually return home via train. 
I was still living with my parents back then, and I distinctly remember having a small window of time to catch the infrequent night train back to my hometown after my lessons would end. It was winter, and I recall the station being busy with Christmas shoppers. I had unfortunately missed my usual train, and had to wait over an hour for the next arrival. I was looking up at the live departure board with frustration when I was approached by a friendly American man in his early to mid forties. I remember that he was underdressed for the weather, or even the season, as it had been snowing for days and was particularly cold outside. He was wearing only a baseball cap, a sweatshirt, and a light windbreaker. Nothing about this struck me as too odd at the time, as I gathered he must just be a tourist who had not anticipated how cold it could be. Back then, I was incredibly shy, and I wasn't the type to strike up conversations with strangers. However, I recall feeling entirely at ease from the moment I saw him. He was tall, athletic, and spoke with a strong accent. He was friendly and approachable. Nothing about him gave off any warning signals. If anything, I was taken aback at how unconventionally attractive he was. Our first interaction was brief. He initiated our conversation by asking if I had been waiting long. I naturally replied out of politeness if he had been stuck waiting for a while too. He was, in fact, quote, waiting for a friend and had just gotten into town. This quickly evolved into us both making small talk, with him introducing himself as John. Eventually, he asked if I wanted to grab a coffee on the account of how easily we hit things off. My train was due to arrive and I didn't have much time, so John quickly asked if I wanted to pick up where we'd left off again over coffee tomorrow. I agreed, we exchanged numbers, and I left to catch my train home. I remember after this instance, I felt a feeling similar to deja vu. It was like a wave of familiarity had washed over me. I was 100% sure that I had never met John in my life. However, I was left with this strange, overwhelming feeling after departing. I felt intrigued by him. When I arrived home, I received a few text messages from John and we agreed to meet up in the same location the following day. At this time in my life, I was still closeted and I hadn't come out to my parents as being gay and I wasn't prepared to tell them I was meeting with a stranger. I usually pride myself on being a good judge of character, and I would not have agreed to meet John if I hadn't felt that the situation was safe. After all, it was difficult to meet guys at that age, and I wasn't about to pass up the opportunity of a date with this handsome older dude who I just felt an abundance of chemistry with. However, I did make sure to let some of my friends know my situation in case anything were to happen. The following day, John was waiting for me at the same location we had met the night before. Despite the freezing weather, he was still wearing the same light clothing and baseball cap. I can recall him being incredibly charming, and I felt the same overwhelming sense of being familiar with him from the moment we met. I was definitely curious, and I was eager to find out more about him. At this point, we couldn't decide on a location and wandered aimlessly around before deciding to grab coffee at a local Starbucks. As we started to make conversation, I noticed that he was only interested in talking about what I had to say. I remember that he seemed overly happy to be talking with me. When I would speak, he was often so excited that he would barely let me finish before moving on to another topic of conversation. I almost got the impression that he knew what I was about to say already. For instance, he knew that I had a sister before I told him. I also noticed that he would rarely talk about himself, often sidestepping my questions or changing the flow of conversation when I asked him anything directly. He was definitely quirky, and for the most part we spoke about our shared interests. I remember thinking that he was odd but I definitely didn't feel suspicious of him, despite the fact that he seemed rather private. The only information I remember about him was that he was from America, but that he had been traveling for some time, the way he put it. He claimed to play several instruments and was in a band, and he mentioned that he had a troubled religious upbringing. However, this is where things get strange.
John and I left the coffee shop and decided to go for another walk around the city. We spoke for a long time, and I remember that we'd been laughing a lot and generally enjoying the time we'd spent together. However, we eventually stopped along the riverfront that runs throughout my city, leaning over a bridge as we spoke some more about each other's lives. This is when John asked if he could give me a hug. I remember looking up at him, and his expression seemed genuinely melancholic all of a sudden. Almost bittersweet. Although I was feeling a little confused, I said of course, and hesitantly leaned in for the embrace. I remember that he hugged me incredibly tightly, and when we eventually let go, there were tears in his eyes. I asked him if he was okay, and asked what was going on. Admittedly now feeling incredibly confused and a little bit concerned by what was happening all of a sudden, he said, you're never going to believe me. I can't quite remember the entire flow of the conversation that followed, however, I will try to summarize everything as best I can. We took a seat on a nearby bench, where I remember that his composure was incredibly calm, and he said everything with the sincerest conviction. He told me that he was somebody from my near future, and that we knew each other very well. He told me that he had traveled back in time to visit me. However, he was incredibly adamant about not answering how or why he had managed to do so, only stating that it was, quote, recreational, and that time travel, quote, doesn't work how we think, stating to me that he had only wanted to visit me once more, adding that I was much younger than he had anticipated, and that I looked so different from when he knew me. He almost hinted that he had found me at the wrong age. I could tell that there was a feeling of sadness throughout everything he was telling me, as he kept repeating over and over how happy he was to see me, yet he said everything with tears in his eyes. I instantly began taking everything he was saying as a joke, feeling skeptical and ready to leave immediately. I remember standing up and telling him that I had to go, the information was too much for me to process and I felt the same overwhelming flood of deja vu creep back into my system. The sensation was so intense that I remember trembling as I stood up to leave, with the atmosphere around me suddenly experiencing a drop in pressure. This is when he took me by the hand and said, I'll see you again someday. I ran away without saying anything. I remember being so overcome by emotion that I burst into tears as soon as I was out of sight. Afterwards, I was so confused and disturbed by the situation, it took me days to process it all before attempting to articulate it to my younger sister and friends, all of whom remember this incident as the crazy tourist I went on a date with. However, 10 years have passed, and I can't help but feel affected by this incident. Every now and then, I remember the face of John and the strange feeling of contentment and familiarity I had around him. After our date, I remember trying to text or call the number that he contacted me on, only to be notified that that number no longer exists by an automated message. He had seemingly vanished without a trace, with no further instances of seeing or being contacted by him since. This definitely could have been a case of an individual who was clearly unhinged, but it was so eerie that I haven't been able to forget about it. I have always wondered who John was, or perhaps who I was to him in this possible future. Nowadays, I am currently in a happy relationship with my partner of six years, whom I have no intention of ever leaving. But every time I recall this enigmatic encounter I had with John, I can't help but wonder if I had glimpsed into a possible or parallel future, one where things have drastically changed for me on a personal level. I have so many questions surrounding what he told me. Was I still alive in his time? Were we romantically involved? Was he a future colleague or even family? Every time I recall these long distant memories, I'm overcome by an inexplicable wave of emotion almost like I've lost something. It's incredibly difficult for me to articulate the feeling that I felt that night. I have never been able to forget about it, 
and I am entirely sure that I would still recognize John today if I ever encountered him again. This is the first time I have ever shared the full version of this story outside of my immediate circle, but after discovering the community here, I felt the need to share. Has anyone ever experienced anything similar? Or have perhaps read other relatable stories, or have suggestions or ideas? I've felt almost haunted by this meeting since it happened, and I would love a little bit of insight from those more experienced in theories and concepts of time travels and glitches. Back in 2009, me, my mom, and my stepdad moved into a really old, rustic rural cottage in England. My father had passed away not too long before, and this was going to be a new start for us all. The house was an absolute bargain. It had six bedrooms, two very spacious living rooms, and a huge annex at the back that was essentially a second house. We couldn't work out why it was so cheap. We went for the viewing and the family eventually told us that their elderly mother had passed away there peacefully in the annex, and they just needed to get away from the feeling of her. That probably should have been a first red flag. We weren't put off though, and we bought the house. From the beginning, it was unsettling. My parents didn't see it at first, but I was incredibly uncomfortable there. It was extremely unnerving and cold. Not to mention, it was isolated behind rows of trees and a very long driveway, so far away from anyone else. It started on the first night. My room was at the end of the corridor, and if you came out of my room, on the right was a bathroom and a locked door that led to the annex, the place where the elderly mother had died. My parents slept a long way down the corridor, in the last bedrooms, so I was quite isolated and directly opposite my room were the stairs. This first night, it was freakishly cold. I pulled my blankets up to my head, but after my dad passed away, I had suffered from insomnia for years, so the cold and the anxieties of moving to a new house all added together to create zero sleep. So I ended up laying awake for hours, just sort of staring around the room. My bedroom door was one of those old and mismatched wooden country house doors. It didn't quite reach the carpets, and after a few hours, I could hear the creaking of floorboards directly outside my room, and shadows that seemed even darker than the darkness of the hallway walking past my door. I presumed that one of my parents had gotten up to use the bathroom, at first, but this went on, back and forth back and forth for several minutes, and it was fast. It was a very brisk walk. Not to mention, next to my door was the locked door to the annex. Anybody walking at that speed would have hit the door, but nothing. It freaked me out and had me dreading the next night. This kept happening every night for a few weeks, and I remember vividly one night I actually left my bedroom door open. Around the same time, as always, I heard the creaking. I turned around, and unmistakably, there was a figure, blacker than black, walking forward and backwards in front of the door, just visible in the darkness of the hallway. I couldn't take my eyes off it the entire time it was there. It's safe to say I never slept with the door open again after that night. But this is where things start to get properly creepy. I'd been terrified of this shadow for weeks now. There was a really horrible feeling that I had around it, like it was after me. And one night, as I was going downstairs for dinner, I had the same cold feeling. And for just a second, I froze in place in the dark hallway and looked to my right toward the annex door. And there, sure as anything, and without my sleepy eyes to blame it on, I saw the same black shadow walking directly at me at high speed. I ran downstairs as quickly as I could and I told my parents everything. They mostly laughed it off and didn't believe me and tried to reassure me that ghosts aren't real 
and there was no chance of anything about this old lady still being in the house. Now, a bit of backstory. This old lady was terrified of the previous owner's family dog, so much so that they had installed a pulley system in the house so she could pull a cord from her bedroom that would trigger an old bell to ring in the kitchen if she wanted anything. The whole system was still there when we moved in. And this night, the night after I told my parents, I was woken at around 2.30 in the morning by this bell in the kitchen ringing loudly and repetitively, like it was being pulled firmly and constantly over and over. I ran out into the corridor, and my parents were there too, equally as confused and concerned as I was. We all looked at each other with ever-increasingly worried expressions and ran downstairs into the kitchen to see what was going on. As soon as we entered the kitchen, it stopped. We ventured up into the annex to see what could have caused this, but nothing, no sign of anyone. And my gosh, I hated it there. It was even colder and more lifeless than the main part of the house, and I just felt like I needed to leave as soon as I could. My parents didn't quite believe that this was a ghost yet, but they were clearly less skeptical than before. From here, any activity became much more obvious. All of us, my parents included, started to hear knocking from the annex door next to my bedroom. Noises from downstairs that sounded like someone was down there moving. Sometimes my fish tank light would flick on and off with an audible click and wake me up and I would often even wake up to my wardrobe doors being wide open with no breeze in sight. One night, I was sat reading alone in my room, and one of these wardrobe doors opened by itself, wide and with relative force. I got up, cautiously, and closed it, and then I ran downstairs to see my parents. When I came up around 15 minutes later, every single covered door, around a dozen of them, were open as wide as they could go. Lots more went on, too. Taps turning themselves on became a particularly regular occurrence. And one night, I awoke to the sound of my cupboard door opening again, and saw droplets of water running from the bathroom next to the annex door, all the way to a few feet from my bed, with no droplets out again. I was terrified. It was around six months after all this had started that we eventually moved out. My grandma had begun to grow unwell and couldn't care for herself anymore, and she moved in with us. From the beginning, she hated that house. My grandma was so incredibly sweet and calm, and I've never seen her distressed like she was there. On one night in particular, when I was sat downstairs in the kitchen with her, she took my hand, pointed directly toward the annex, and said, Don't you go in there. I don't like it in there. It's safe to say this scared the crap out of me. On the last night we all spent together in the house, I was awoken by my mum screaming. Clear as day, she said she felt two hands firmly grab her ankles over the bed sheets and pull her down the bed, just a few inches. And right there and then, she asked to leave. We went to stay in our old house for a while, but because of size, my stepdad, the biggest skeptic among us, stayed in Lilac Cottage for a few more months. He's still quiet to this day about that house. He hates talking about it. But even he admits that there was something incredibly wrong there. And without much warning, he put the house up for sale, selling it so desperately that he lost almost a quarter of the price he paid for it. And he's never told us why. I've promised myself that one day I'll reach out to the current owners of that house and see if they have also experienced anything. But I haven't. At least not yet. My boyfriend and I are camping at the Fort Pickens campground in Pensacola, Florida. Last night was a full moon, and around 9.30 or 10, we went for a walk down to the beach with our husky to look at the ocean and check out the moonlight. We sat there for maybe an hour and just talked about life in general. But toward the end of the conversation, we started talking about how the ocean can play tricks on you, 
and how strange the energy can be sometimes. We were swapping stories about how we've seen people who we thought might not really be people before. And I understand that when you talk about things like that, it puts you in a very specific headspace. All night, I tried to justify what happened to us as a trick of our minds and us hyping ourselves up. But we both saw the same thing at the same time, and there's absolutely no way that it wasn't real. We started walking back to camp, and it was maybe a quarter mile from the beach down the little boardwalk thing to the main road. Once you get to the main road, you see the entrance to the campsite, and there's a small parking lot there, a stop sign, a picnic table, and a building that looks abandoned and out of business. This building is one story tall and doesn't have any signs out front, and I don't believe the doors and windows are shuttered, but they're definitely not accessible. I wouldn't even be able to press my face against the window and try to peek in, because it's kind of boarded up around it. I was sitting on this picnic table while Shane was standing and telling me a creepy story about something he saw in the ocean when he was 11 years old. We were there for maybe 10 minutes and we were talking about his story. I was trying to debunk it and figure it out with him. When all of a sudden a girl comes walking out of the campsite area towards us and stops at the building. We both thought nothing of it because we had already seen two people walking that night and we knew people were active because it was a full moon and wanted to make the most of the campsite. But this girl walks up to the abandoned building and it looks like she's trying to peer in the windows or open the doors on the right side of the building. I almost even remember her standing on her tiptoes. She obviously doesn't get in and then she decides to walk all the way across the length of the building right in front of us to the left side. This is when I started to get uncomfortable because she doesn't look at us or address us, even though we're both loudly standing there talking. And the way that she was walking, all I could see was her side or back profile in a long brown ponytail. I know it doesn't really make sense, but it's just like, how can somebody walk from right to left in front of you and you don't see the side of their face? All I saw was her hair. It's not like she had her head turned either. It just doesn't make sense. So she rounds the corner on the left side of the building and doesn't come back. At this point, I'm actually invested and I'm kind of grilling the location she went to the whole time. I don't take my eyes off of it. I don't really know how to explain this, but it didn't seem like she walked back behind the building. It seemed like she was right there, just waiting for us to do or say something. There's a little edge, like a ledge on the side of the building that looked maybe three or four inches wide, kind of like a gutter hanging off. And I swear on my life, it's like she went behind this little four inch ledge and flipped herself sideways and was just frozen watching us. Shane has this spotlight for hunting that he uses as a flashlight, and he shined it on the little ledge area of the building that she went behind. We kept seeing something low to the ground on the side of this ledge, and it made us think that she was just standing there doing something. So Shane shines his light in that direction and yelled, Yo, what's up? Are you good? After this, he kept his spotlight pinned where we thought she would pop out, and after a delay of four or five seconds, we literally saw her spring out of the shadow and leer forward facing right. She had her back hunched over so she wasn't standing as tall as she normally would be. I can't explain how scary it was to be sitting there watching this whole thing take place. And once we shine the flashlight, have this person's face pop out from the side of this building. It would have been less scary if she had never come out and we had circled the whole building and nobody was there. Her movement was incredibly unnatural. It was as if no human being would respond with their body language that way after having a flashlight shining on them. It was like she couldn't figure out what to do and showed herself only because we made her and then couldn't get all the parts right in the meantime. Almost like she was scared of getting caught for doing something wrong 
not scared of us. The way she popped out, her face was turned toward us, and she had her arms kind of sprawled out, almost like a praying mantis. I know this sounds ridiculous, but there's literally no other way to explain this. The best part about this whole thing, though, is something that neither of us figured out until we talked about it later. We never saw a face. It was just smooth skin or clay-colored, rounded, with no eyes or facial expressions. I want to say that I personally almost saw divots or pits where the eyes should have been, but there was nothing substantial there. We were still trying to figure out this encounter, so we weren't super quick to get scared at this point. We honestly thought that it was our minds playing tricks on us, but I think since both of us saw it, we knew that was probably unlikely. This is where the story starts to differentiate a little bit. After she pulls her body back behind the ledge, Shane turns off his flashlight when I asked him to because I felt like we were being rude. At this point, she's back behind the ledge and the light is off, and I see her extended body about three feet off the ground. It's like she's crouching and reaching at the same time. Like she was going to take an over-exaggerated step and almost tiptoe off like a cartoon character or something. She leaned forward one step to the right and then pulled herself back behind the ledge. She stands up straight and then starts walking back to the right side of the building in front of us. Shane has his flashlight on her the whole time. And now she just says, Oh, I just wanted to change without having to go all the way back. But it's like, all the way back to where? She literally just came from the campground. She could have changed right there if she was heading to the beach or something. Was she going to swim at 10.30 at night? It just didn't make any sense why she needed to change in that specific spot. The strange part is I specifically heard her talk about changing, but Shane heard her say something about having to pee. I'm not sure if one or both of us just misheard her or if Shane just assumed that's what she was doing, because that's what I thought at first too. But as she walked from the left of the building across to the right and back down the trail toward the campground, she kind of scurried away quickly, as if she was embarrassed. And the crazy thing is that I didn't see her face the entire time she did this. It was like when she walked across the first time. All I saw was her long brown ponytail. After she slowly walked down the road back toward the campsite, Shane and I were talking about how messed up that whole interaction was, and how we needed to get back to our own site. He told me that this person had a short, blonde, bob-style haircut. He couldn't believe me when I said that no, she had a long brown ponytail, because he hadn't seen that anywhere on this person. There's no way that either of us could have mistaken these two specific haircuts and colors for the other. It's almost like she was showing each of us what she wanted to. As we walk back to our campsite, we walk past a handful of good dark trees that I, as a female, would definitely have peed behind or changed behind if I needed to. This building was so far out of the way, and I would never think to go to the distant right side of it by myself late at night in order to change clothes. It just didn't make sense, the choices that she made. And trust me, we've spent enough time in the city that if we were in New York or New Orleans or Denver or wherever, and we saw somebody doing stuff like this, we probably would have just chalked it up to the person being high and just laughed it off. But this is a random, quiet family campground where everyone's super happy and peaceful. Of course we tried to justify that maybe it was just some drunk chick being sloppy and not knowing what's going on. But even that doesn't hold any weight in comparison to those body movements and that smooth face that we saw staring back at us. Nothing about this person's body movements were natural. Not when she came slinking up. Not when she didn't notice us sitting there. Not when she looked in the window. Not when she walked across the building or dipped behind the ledge or peered out or crouched down or replied to us and definitely not when she scurried off. This is one of those situations that left me with tears in my eyes. I was absolutely shaken, but I was incredulous at the same time. I couldn't believe that it really happened to me. 
It's like I almost couldn't even be scared because it had already happened and I just had to sit there and process that we really saw what we did. We talk about NPCs sometimes and joke about people making us uncomfortable and maybe not being real. And we really believe that sometimes we cross paths with angels, but this was something else entirely. This was something that seemed like a lower form or something less intelligent than us that was just pretending to be human. I feel like I should add this as a side note, but I'm Native American and I'm super familiar with all kinds of witches or bad medicine or shapeshifters. And in a lot of our stories, these are humans who are incredibly intelligent and powerful and have this human urge based on jealousy or anger or evil to target individuals and appear as another living form. I'm telling you right now that nothing about this encounter felt like that. This didn't seem like something smarter than us. It didn't seem like something with an emotional intention. It didn't seem quick or cunning like it wanted something from us. It was the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It seemed like it was mimicking or mocking human movements. I have no idea what its intentions were, or why it was here of all places, or why it presented itself to us that night. But I guess I just have to move forward with the knowledge that this definitely happened, and I don't have any answers. My grandmother, or Tutu as we say in Hawaii, was the center of our entire family. She has always been the center of my life, and there's not a single day that goes by that I don't think of her, even 17 years after her death. She was of pure Hawaiian descent, and growing up with her as a child was supernatural in the biggest sense. I have many stories to share, all of them entirely true, and I will tell them to the best of my ability. All of them are deeply rooted in Hawaiian culture and spiritual beliefs, so please read this with an open mind, if you are not Kanaka Maoli. I have contemplated whether it was right to share this, but I find that this is my opportunity to share her with the world. She has had many experiences in her lifetime which I have been gathering from my family members, but these are stories that I have had the honor to experience. I'll do my best to keep them short. Story number one, a fireball visits our home. In the year 1991, when I was just five years old, an akualele, or fireball, visited our home. Being so young at the time, I can only remember bits and pieces, but they have been validated by other family members who were there that night. My tutu and I were sitting in the living room watching television. This also served as her bedroom. There were beds all over the house, as from time to time, relatives would come to stay or sleep for the night. One of those dial switch TVs with only seven channels was our television. My older cousin was in his bedroom, which was near the living room. All of a sudden, I heard my cousin yelling for my grandma. He runs into the living room. Toot, what is that? He points out the window, which was just behind the TV. I sat up and went to the window and peeked in between the jalouses. What I saw, I could never forget. A ball of fire was moving above the mango trees in our backyard. It was literally gliding over the trees and toward the windows. I remember how bright it was. It had a long black tail trailing behind it with sparks of red flickering around it. It was big, and it was loud. I have never seen something like this before. I thought it had come from the sky. As it got closer, I felt the hands of my grandma wrap around my chest as she pulled me away from the window. Her voice was filled with raspiness, and she shouts, Akualele. She yells to my cousin, Grab the salt. Go now. My cousin runs to the kitchen and grabs a big bag of Hawaiian salt and begins throwing it out of the bag. 
I remember feeling the big rocks hitting the back of my legs. I slid behind my grandma as the fireball began ducking back and forth between the two windows, as if it was trying to get a look at us. The next thing I remember is her cursing at the thing in Hawaiian. She shouts louder and louder and louder, until the thing stops and explodes right in front of my eyes. It was just one loud pop, and then it was gone. Years later, as my cousin and I were recalling the story, he explains to me that the Akualele was sent to us from another Hawaiian family who lived farther down the road. The grandmother of their family was jealous of my grandmother as we had recently obtained more land to expand our coffee farm. What I didn't remember was that I fell deathly ill for the next two days and my grandmother only left my side once to go talk to the family so they could come to an agreement. After giving offerings and sharing each other's breath, she returned home to find her granddaughter alive and well, as if I had never been sick at all. Story number two, the Aumakua that saved my uncle. This happened in the year 1995, when I was just nine years old. The best thing about where I lived which was in Captain Cook, South Kona, was that many of my family lived on the same road. I had a girl cousin who lived a five minute walk from our home, past my uncle and auntie's house and through a grove of banana trees and thick elephant grass. Yeah, ouch. I would spend the night there a lot. She was like my best friend. One night I arrived there as the sun was going down. She was outside on her front porch, crying. Her sister was draped over her body and they were consoling each other over something. I ran up to her and asked what was wrong. She says, it's my dad, he's sick. I went up the stairs and was about to enter the living room when my aunt peeked her head out of the bedroom door, warning me to stay outside. I began to cry, as any child my age would do in an unknown situation like that. I asked what was wrong, but could already hear the moans and wails coming out of my uncle's lips. His father was a Filipino man, and he was sitting on his usual rocking chair, this time holding a bowl in his two hands, hovering over it, examining it. I went to him to examine it myself. As I passed the walkway into the living room, I peeked into my uncle's room. My auntie was wringing out a towel over his head. The bed sheets were covered in his sweat. He wasn't moving, and he was barely breathing. His father was holding a bowl of water. In the bottom of the bowl was a thin layer of raw white rice. He points to the two flecks of rice floating at the top of the water. Oh no, no good. No can help my boy, he says in his constant broken English. He looks up to finally notice that I was there. He grabs my arm tightly, as if to show me that I need to listen now with the utmost importance. Go to your tutu. Bring her now. My boy going make. I ran back to our house, and I remember the feeling of my lungs just ripping out of my chest. I ran into the living room and called out to my grandma. Tutu, come, it's Uncle Dicky, which was short for Richard. I ran back outside as my grandmother got up. She took a machete and chopped down a bundle of tea leaves. My grandmother starts up the work truck and we take off toward my cousin's house. My grandmother goes into the living room. My Filipino uncle stays silent. I remember sitting outside with my cousins trying to console them in their grief. We sat on the side of the porch, our legs dangling between the railings. I could hear my uncle muttering in tongues as my grandmother prayed for Almakua to come. Almakua stands for spiritual guardian, which are usually manifested into animals. Every person of Hawaiian descent knows which Almakua relates to their bloodline. And I'm sure many have a story to tell of when they have come to provide aid. Yes, it's true, and it would become true to me now. As we were wiping the tears from our eyes, just a moment to breathe back the sobs, I heard a screech. 
In front of her house was the unpaved road. There was just one street light over the telephone wires running down the side of the road. I looked toward the direction of the screech and could see a small shadow flying toward the telephone wires. I tapped on my cousin's shoulder and begged her to look. It was a Hawaiian owl, a pueo. It perched up on the wire and just looked at us. All three of us were caught in a trance and a feeling of calm swept over me. That's when another one came and perched right beside the first one. Well, that's odd. They spend their lives in solitude. Maybe they were a pair. Just as soon as the second one came, there came another and then another, two sets of two. What a sight to see, I thought. In the midst of what was happening at the moment, we found happiness. My cousin begins to giggle a little as she gets up to tell her mom what was happening. Just as soon as she gets up to turn around, she lets out a small sigh. We look up to see that her head had bumped into her father's chest. He holds his daughter in his arms as she begins to scream. Baby, what is it? What are you all staring at? We stared at him, our eyes as big as a mempachi fish. As we turned around to look back at the telephone wire, the owls were gone. My uncle says to us, don't worry, I saw them too. But how? Just a half an hour ago, we thought he was doomed for death. He tells his family, I saw them in my dream. Up there on the telephone wire, yeah? I look deep into the eyes of one, and that's when I woke up. What is it? Why are you all staring at me? Story number three. My grandmother's funeral. I apologize in advance for bringing out two great stories just to hit you with the inevitable fact that my grandmother's life came to an end. It was the biggest tragedy in my life, and for some reason I can't come to grips with it. Maybe it's because she's still with me. She was the caretaker and kahuna figure of my family, and that didn't end in her death if that makes you feel any better. Or maybe it confuses you. Well. It was the year 1999 in the month of March when my tutu had passed. My grandfather had died just two months earlier. She died of a broken heart, no reason to live anymore. Her funeral service was held at our local church in Kealakekua. I spent the whole time next to her open coffin, just waiting for her to move, to say something. Please wake up, tutu. I still need you, I say. The church was packed to the ceiling. So many relatives, so many friends. She meant everything to everyone. The only one I noticed that wasn't there was my uncle, my father's brother. It was just the two of them with a string of Hanai or adopted brothers and sisters who would carry out the coffin at the end of the ceremony. We were trapped in eternity during the service, but I begged it not to stop. The casket was finally closed and all the Hawaiian aunts and uncles wept, as it was custom to cry loud enough for the heavens to hear. The men in the family all took their places at the coffin and lifted my grandmother off the frame, all with one spot left vacant. They walked down the small stairs and through the short walkway to the hearse. My father was at the back. My mother, sister, brother, and I were right behind at the front of the line. As soon as his foot left the sacred area of the chapel, I saw my uncles buckle as they dropped the coffin to the ground. They began looking at each other, finding a time to laugh, saying, come on, brah, no get weak on me now. They stooped back down to pick the coffin up. I literally watched five of the strongest men in my entire family struggling to pick my grandmother up. Cries and whispers start floating around the chapel as they attempt over and over to raise her coffin off the ground. It would not move. They could not move her. My father explained that the coffin was heavier than blue rock. My father and my uncle lean down at the front of the coffin and peek open the door that was to be forever closed. I could hear my father talking to his mother. Ma, it's time to go. What are you waiting for? As they continued pleading with my dead grandmother, 
I heard the rumbling of an engine racing up the driveway of the church. It was my uncle, late as usual, even to his own mother's funeral. Real Hawaiian time, as we would say. He puts on his white gloves and kneels in front of the pastor, apologizing for his tardiness. Why he was late, I don't know. But as he took his place at the coffin, across from my father, they lifted the coffin once again. My grandmother's coffin floated off the ground, light as a feather, they said. They walked another 15 steps or so to the hearse. They said it was like my grandmother floated to the car. Even in her death, she was still as strong as ever, refusing to leave this world without her two boys by her side to lead her to the next. Story number four. Grandmother and grandfather hear my father's plea for help. Yes, there is a story number four. How, you may ask? As I said before, her guardianship does not end in her death. How comforting, yeah? This took place two years after my grandparents had passed. This one involves my father and mother, and every time he tells the story, the facts never change. My parents had gone to Hilo for the weekend, on the other side of the island. We have family in Keokaha that they would visit from time to time. Now, geez, that's another chapter right there. But anyway. My father and mother decide to spend the night at Hilo Seaside Hotel, right down the road. My father himself, being half Hawaiian and half Filipino, always had a sixth sense. And sometimes it was a nightmare, as it started that way that night. It was around 2.30 in the morning, and they were sleeping in room number 102, queen-size bed. The room was small, and the door to the room was real close to the bed. If you open the door and walk to the right, it leads you down a flight of stairs, across a small garden area, through a swinging gate, and into the parking lot. My father was being visited once again, by a choking ghost. This has happened to him on many occasions in his life, but as he tells me to this day, it was one of his last encounters. As the clock reads 2.36 a.m., he is woken up by a feeling of fear in the pit of his stomach. He could see a shadow forming at the foot of the door. The shadow leaks under the crack of the door and up the door onto the ceiling. He began rubbing his eyes to adjust to the darkness, the tint of yellow light coming through the sliding glass door on the other side of the bed. My mother was sound asleep. He thought for a second of waking her. As he looked closer and closer at the shadow, it began to take the shape of a womanly form. Only now the shape was that of a gecko crawling on the wall, the arms and legs bent out and away from the center of the body. He was disgusted as this thing begins crawling on the ceiling, making its way above the bed. As soon as it is hovering over my father, it drops from the ceiling and lands on his chest. This womanly creature had a face, he said, a horrible face with a slithering tongue. It wraps its legs around my father's stomach and the hands grasp his arms, holding him down on the bed. He was frozen in fear as he attempted to wake my mother from her sleep. My mother is of Caucasian descent, so she was usually not as affected by these things as my father was. The womanly creature stares directly into his eyes. He says it was just grinning at him as he began to feel his throat tighten and his esophagus lock up. He was gasping for breath as he tried his best to get this thing off. The creature began shrieking as he was slipping in and out of consciousness. He said he felt as if he was taking his last breath when all of a sudden the door swings open there was another shadow standing inside the frame of the door. As it walked into the room, the yellow light hit the face, the face of my grandmother. He hears his mother shout, Aole mamake, you cannot have my son. She begins cursing at the thing. Even though the thing was still on my father's chest, he was bewildered at the fact that his dead mother was standing in front of him as if her flesh were still real. There was a bright light coming from behind her. As my grandmother continued to curse and curse at the thing in Hawaiian, it finally let off and scampered off, dissipating into the sliding glass door. My father could not take his eyes off his mother, but she doesn't say a word to him. 
just stares at him for a few seconds, smiling. She turns around and walks out of the room and out the door of their hotel room. This is when my mother wakes up. Even if you were to put my parents into separate rooms, they would still recall the same story. My mother joins my father at the door, asking him what's going on. My dad was staring down the corridor where the stairs were. That's when my mother's eyes focused on my grandmother, who was still walking. She walked down the steps and past the garden. She looked as alive as ever. No more limping, no more pain as she walked. She walks out the swinging gate into the parking lot. That's when they realized that she was walking to a parked car at the corner, facing out toward the front street of the hotel. The brake lights were glowing red, but he could make out the blue bumper of his father's 62 Mazda. In the reflection of the rear view mirror, he could see his father's face. He was right there, sitting in the driver's seat of the car. They watched as my grandmother approached the car, saying to him, Okay, Papa, we go now. Our boy is okay. She gets into the passenger seat. They remember watching the glowing of the brake lights as the car disappeared into the darkness. So, there you have it. I hope this gave you an ounce of insight into the wonderful woman that my grandmother is. And for you, Kanaka Maoli, an insight into the wonderful people that all of our Tutuhine and Tutukane are. And if you still have the fortune of having them here in this world right now, don't take another second for granted. Because with them, they take our past, our tradition, and our inherent right to be proud of who we are. Please take this chance to ask them as much as you can, jot it down, and share it with the rest of the world before it's gone. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling rotten ruin the cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as backup a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory, anyway. One of the boys' groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. The other, just a mile beyond them. The girls were close, too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon, on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon and the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away, though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road 
and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek, up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot, well out of sight of the group, on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a 10 foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting along with my fire set and some other gear up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids' groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame. I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one, so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time. But mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. 
I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there? through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks, and none of them went missing, and then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back, only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys' group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath, because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? That's nothing, I said. I, I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so... I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it, I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag. A possibles bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail, we call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, 
and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it is important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know, because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So, side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter. And I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot. So I walked in the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine, maybe 30 or 40 feet away too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. And the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar, and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered, we were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer, and we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold like really cold, and it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do, 
so I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp, but Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out. Like, it's out cold. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, you know, the first one you rolled into the circle, and I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek, like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie, but she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh, and he's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream, until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off. And that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point, and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me, and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. 
Half of the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie? It's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. I have absolutely no memory of this experience, but my mom does, and she told me the story. I was a little over two years old and had just started to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until Judgment Day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman, who always talks way too loudly, was literally whispering by the end of it. And she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely, and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, who we'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to the town from there. My mom said the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean house, ugly house, don't like, scary house, mama, don't like. My mom says this behavior was extremely out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, causing a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement, gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed that the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level. Either way, the landlord was adamant that that room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, 100%. I know all of this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it, and both of my parents have told me that it did give them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix boss. She was hanging laundry and I was just rolling around with the dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, Boss started going absolutely ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, 
then turning and running back to the pond, barking frantically the whole time. That's when my mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. Thanks, pupper. Love you. Although my mom was confused as to how I'd gotten so far so fast, and how I had ended up in the center of the pond, since it was way over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she just underestimated me, and brought in the baby gates and playpens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen to hear us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said that no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us. Victor's still sleeping. Every baby gate is shut and locked but I am not in my room. A frenzied search revealed that I wasn't in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning caused my mom to rush outside to see what he was trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother and wait for her to catch up a little before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from the neighbors. He led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said that she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. She rushed over to me, and, after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking at a very young age, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look that only small children can give, that the children had brought me there. Shitting her pants a little at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her, through the kitchen, get me from upstairs, walk right back past her on the way down the stairs and out with me, all the way over here, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they were now. I looked at her dead serious, and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs, I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there, staring at her, with a serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering, and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road, 
all in under 15 minutes. I was only two and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers. As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. I've thought about hypnosis, but haven't decided if I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever those things were, I really don't think they were children. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy this story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name. But I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there but there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, 
but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me, unless he's called over, and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention, and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there, and my wife starts jogging at me, and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him, and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about eight to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 hunted documentary and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. I grew up in Southern Pennsylvania, not far from Gettysburg. When I was eight years old, my parents decided to build a house on vacant property, surrounded by fields, and it was beautiful. I lived with both of my parents and my two older brothers, who were 15 and 17 at the time. Though I grew up in the area, we only stayed in this house for four years. 
My first night there was not what I expected it to be. I was laying in my bed and had just closed my eyes. Then I heard a voice that sounded like a soft whisper, about six inches from my face, say, Help! Help! Over and over, just repeating the same word until I finally fell asleep. I tried my best to forget about it, because I thought there was no way the house could be haunted. It was brand new. Certainly I was just tired. About a month goes by, and I'm sitting on my bed, doing what I used to love doing most, which was read. I glanced up and looked at my doorway, because I had seen something out of the corner of my eye. At that moment, I had officially seen a full-body apparition of what appeared to be a soldier from the 1800s, but he didn't see me. He was just walking by my room, very slowly. I still remember every detail of his appearance 20 years later. He was covered in blood and looked like he'd been shot or stabbed. This lasted for about five seconds. Still being creeped out, my curiosity got the best of me, and I walked out of the room and searched all over the house, but I found nothing unusual. About a week or two goes by, and I'm in my bed, trying to fall asleep yet again, only to be disturbed before I even had the chance to close my eyes. This voice was very deep and masculine. I couldn't understand a word it was saying, because it was speaking in a different language. It sounded annoyed and angry. It happened every night at the exact same time for two weeks, before it suddenly and inexplicably stopped. After that, I had a night terror. I am absolutely terrified of spiders. I had woken up in the middle of the night, and I could see what looked like a tarantula crawling on me in bed. I swear it was there. I definitely saw it. I was panicking. My dad came in the room to check on me and found that everything was okay. No spider. Before I could fall asleep, though, I heard what sounded like two men laughing right next to my bed. At this point, I was getting used to all the messed up things that were happening. One summer, I stayed up late every night so I could watch Hannah Montana at midnight. One night, when the clock struck midnight, I heard my back door downstairs open. Then I would hear a woman say my name, as if she was calling for me or looking for me. I'd hear the door shut, followed by footsteps, and then there would be silence. This happened every night for almost two months. It never failed. It didn't even bother me at this point. I knew it wasn't my mother because she worked 12 hour night shifts at the hospital almost every night. There were no other females around, but one night it too stopped altogether. I was up at midnight and nobody had called my name. I went to sleep and everything felt peaceful for once. I woke up to the sound of someone knocking on my bedroom door. I looked at the clock on my cable box. It was 3 a.m. I assumed that it was one of my brothers and I told them to go away, but then the doorknob started turning but it wouldn't open because the door was locked. I have always slept with my bedroom door open. Always. And I definitely wasn't the one who locked it. The knocking and doorknob rattling went on for what felt like forever. And then it stopped. A few minutes later, I hear what sounds like scratching at the door. I think to myself, what the heck? Is it my cat? But then the knocking, scratching, and turning of the handle start happening at the exact same time. No way in hell my cat could do all three at once, let alone the knocking and turning of the doorknob. It would happen for about 30 seconds, and then it would stop. It happened at least five times. Sometimes the knocking would be so hard it sounded like pounding, and my whole door was shaking. Whatever was on the other side of that door really wanted to come in. It got so bad that it woke my dad up. He heard all of the commotion, and as soon as he opened his bedroom door, it all stopped, instantly. He called out to me, but I was too afraid to say anything. He went back into his room and closed the door, but 
The same scenario repeated itself three more times. My dad made me sleep in his room. We never spoke about it. Ever. Things seemed to be fine, for a while. Then, whatever was in my house struck again. My brother had gotten up to go to the bathroom. He turned the hallway light on, noticed that my bedroom door was closed as it was across the hall from the bathroom. He comes out of the bathroom and the hallway light is off and my bedroom door was wide open. He looked inside my room and saw me still sleeping. Everyone else in the house was sleeping. He woke my dad and brother and told them what had happened. They searched the house for a possible intruder, but found nothing. More months go by and we are all awoken by our smoke detector going off in the middle of the night. We all go downstairs in a panic, just to find out that the stove was on, full blast, big flames on top of the stove, in the middle of the night. What the hell? One day it was just my father and I. My mom was at work as usual. My oldest brother was at work and my other brother was at baseball practice. I'm downstairs, but I hear what sounds like somebody running upstairs. Forgetting that both of my brothers aren't home, I go up the stairs and see somebody run into my brother's room and slam the door. It was loud. I thought for sure it was my brother, and I wanted to go in there and see what he was up to and why he would be running around like that. I opened the door and nobody was there. I watched the door close right in front of me. I felt sick to my stomach just standing there, realizing that the only other person that was home was my father, and he was in the shower. I continued to see weird things all the time. One day, in the middle of the day, I saw my German Shepherd run upstairs full blast as if she was chasing something, but I never saw what she was chasing. Whatever it was went under the bed, and she was viciously growling at it. At first I thought it was my cat, until I saw him sitting on top of the bed. It appeared that he had been sleeping until we burst in and woke him up. One night, my cousin was spending the night. We were walking through the living room when she saw the reflection of another person on the glass of our big bookcase. Another time we were in my backyard, and she told me that she saw somebody looking at us through the window. I guess this happened on a few occasions, but it wasn't anybody we knew. My brothers almost never had friends over, so that was not a possibility. I remember one day I was walking down the basement stairs. When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw what looked like another apparition, except the apparition looked exactly like my older brother. But it also didn't look human. It was almost white and blue, and his eyes were pure black, like something trying to be him. When he saw me, his eyes got really big and he looked terrified and ran away and went into the crawl space. I ran upstairs to find out that my brother wasn't even home. I never went back down there after that. A few months later, I was with the same brother and we were in the living room watching George Lopez late at night. I'm into the show, but he muted the TV. He looked at me and said, did you hear that? I told him no, I hadn't heard anything. We sat still for a minute, and then I did hear it. Together, we both heard footsteps coming up the basement stairs. My brother grabbed a baseball bat, and we went to the basement to investigate, but to no avail. The rest of our family was sleeping upstairs. The next night, my mom was up late at night sitting at the dining room table, doing whatever it was she was doing. Around 3 a.m., the shelf in the dining room blew off the wall and put a hole in the wall that was adjacent to it. We looked at the nails in the wall that had held the shelf in place, and they were still perfectly straight. We moved out of that house when I was 12. I still experience paranormal things, but nothing that comes close to what I dealt with in that house. I believe there were a lot of spirits there and I'd love to know about what happened there previously to cause so much activity. We were a regular church-going family, so I'm sure if there was anything demonic there, that probably pissed it off even more. But I don't know. What do you think it could have been? Ghosts? Demons? Poltergeists? All of the above? 
What's your story? This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so... I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking it wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces, and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were gonna go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall. And I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. 
We tell the guys and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come, Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point, she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day. And I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, and nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time, and no physical person could have put that dirty old ant infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. 
Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10-minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the board settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them, and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated, the same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, Oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. And that digital camera my twin was playing around with? 
There was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later. My second episode of Sleep Paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil, like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but... I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, 
but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. Thirteen and three. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. The reason that I'm writing this now and not before is because I was only reminded of this the other day. I was driving to the store with my son, and he wanted me to listen to a song. I don't even remember the words. I just remember that the tune brought me back to a place. A place that I had tucked away in my memory in hopes of forgetting. Now, I can't get that old lady's mouth out of my head. This happened in 1987. I'm sure about the date because of the Whittier earthquake. It just so happens that at that very moment, I was painting a wall in the dining room a different color. That's when it hit. I ended up streaking paint across the wall as I ran over to hold our overly large fish tank from falling off of this stupidly flimsy stand we had it on. This took place in Hacienda Heights, California. My boyfriend at the time wasn't really welcome at my mother's house because she couldn't shake this bad feeling about him. So, being young and dumb, I moved out of her house and into a place that I found down the street with him. I wish I had listened to her. It was a small one-bedroom bungalow. At first, we were getting along just fine, but it seemed like things changed as the months passed and we started fighting more and more. I thought it was odd that I, Susie Homemaker, didn't even want to make that house a home. It was just a weird vibe and it got darker the longer we stayed. As you walk in the partial glass front door, on the left, there were two white window pane doors on the built-in bookcases on both sides of a fireplace, then the dining room, and in the back was the kitchen. The bedroom was on the right. We couldn't afford a bed frame, so our full-size mattress was on the floor under the window, and that was the only thing there besides the clock. There was an uneasiness in that bedroom that I couldn't put my finger on. I felt very depressed in there. Oh, little things happened throughout the house from the moment we moved in, but we just laughed it off. Until it was no longer funny. It seemed like when we were at odds with each other, it intensified in a dark way. Oftentimes, my boyfriend would just leave and I was alone. Sometimes for days. And I thought that he did it on purpose because he knew that I was scared to be there alone. At first, I was fine, not scared of anything. Until one of those nights. I was sleeping and I was jolted up by an extremely loud bang that left my ears ringing. I jumped up and at first I looked out the front window, thinking that it was something outside. But the streets were still. I checked the house, but there was nothing out of place. The next night it happened again, louder than before. Only this time I glanced at the clock before checking the house. It was 5 o'clock a.m. on the dot, and my room was freezing. I tried to get back to sleep, but I heard muffled wails of a woman. I literally had to lift my head from the pillow to listen, but nobody was around. The next day, my boyfriend came home, and with a few words and some hand-picked flowers, all was stupidly forgiven. I told him what had happened, but he shrugged it off, telling me that it could have been a backfire or the pipes, and I bought it. One early evening after dinner, we were going to watch TV on the couch in the living room, 
and I excused myself to go to the bathroom. I kept hearing him yelling out things to me, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. I opened the door and looked at him. He turned absolutely pale, and he was crawling backwards on the couch with wide eyes. Then he leaped up and ran into the kitchen, looking around and checking the back door. He came out, saying that the door was locked from the inside. After he calmed down and I could understand him, he told me that he was talking to me in the kitchen. He asked me why I was putting a granny house dress on and was asking for snacks, and he was getting a bit upset that I didn't answer him. I had no answers. There had been a few times where we both saw what looked like a teenaged boy sitting on the front stoop, sometimes holding his head in his hands, but when we approached him, it was like he was never there. I pointed out faces in the glass panes of the bookcase that looked like they were talking to us while we were watching TV. They were just reflections, but they were reflections of something that wasn't in the room. Their features were outlined by the flickering light from the TV. But after a while, the faces became more defined. In the beginning, my boyfriend thought I was making it all up until he saw it for himself. We heard banging on the bathroom door, like somebody was banging with their fist, even when we weren't in there, and an older guy's voice saying, ah, come on, sending us running outside a couple of times, then feeling stupid sitting outside, so we went in and stayed spooked for the rest of the day. I called the landlord to ask him if something had happened there or if he could make it stop. But before I could even open my mouth, he was asking if I was calling to complain about something he had no control over. In the background, I heard his wife say, is that the young couple? They want to move, do they? Well, there goes another one. It sounded like this had happened to them a lot before, and that really got my blood boiling. Why would they rent this place to us without even a heads up? Realizing that they would be of no immediate help, I just hung up on him. I couldn't move, I had no money, and my mother for sure wouldn't let me move back in as long as I was with my boyfriend. We lived there for at least four months when our relationship started to spin out of control. He was being forceful and demanding and drinking a lot more. One night he asked me to pick him up, so I did. And somehow, I ended up with a broken arm because I didn't want him to drive my car drunk. I had to beg him to shift gears so that I could drive to the ER because he was tired. And after the hospital, I was exhausted and I just wanted to sleep. So I went to the bedroom while he opted to lay on the couch and watch TV. The next thing I know, he's grabbing his stuff, saying that he's not staying there anymore and walking out leaving me there alone with a broken arm. Wow. I remember that it was a warm night, but it was raining. So I laid on the couch with only the screen door closed so that I could hear the rain. The lights went out, which freaked me out even more. So I put candles on the coffee table and one on the bookcase and sat back down on the couch. I was too afraid to sleep in the bedroom. I sat there and saw those faces, and one was an old lady. She was frowning, and her mouth was moving like she was trying to over-enunciate to tell me something or yell at me. Her face got bigger, like she was coming closer to the glass, and then back. She kept waving her finger at me. Her gray hair was straight and put back with a headband. Her mouth was just going on, opening and closing, and the candlelight glistened on her bottom teeth. Her teeth looked a little, I don't know, long and old, if that makes any sense. Then there was a middle-aged man who didn't look directly at me. He looked aggravated, but not at me, more like at everything and everyone. And then a crying teenager. His face was so full of despair I could make out the words, please, and no, no, no. And then he put his hand on his face. Looking at him brought tears to my eyes, and my heart felt so very heavy. It dawned on me that this was the kid on our doorstep. 
I must have sat there for hours with the blankets up to my nose until the lights came back on and I finally fell asleep. The next morning, I walked down to the corner store and I called my mother, who was happy to find out that I was ready to come home. Before I handed the keys over, my mother had some words with the landlord. He told her that he had the place blessed before I moved in and that he was really hoping that it had worked. He also told my mom that he bought the place already haunted. All he knew from digging was that it was two bungalows together, but one burnt down. But the one that I was renting was the one where an old lady lived, whose grown son had come upon hard times due to his alcoholism. He lost his wife and couldn't keep a job, so he and his teenage son moved into her place with her. His son was so unstable that he found a gun in the house and ended up shooting himself in the bedroom. His grandmother had died from a heart attack not long after. He didn't know what happened to the man. Talk about a roundabout. I don't know why that tune, or maybe the light reflecting off the rain on my windshield, made me think about that old lady's mouth. But it did. Now I understand a little more as to why I hate reflective things in my home. I was talking to an old friend about maybe going on an impromptu ghost hunt this month, and during the conversation, we reminisced about some of the creepy stuff that we had experienced over the years. We remembered a particular event that stuck out with us, and it's one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. The story begins with my friend, who we'll call T, and myself searching a hidden attic-like space in his house for a supposed stash of money allegedly left there by a previous tenant. Truth be told, I think that was just a story his mom told us to get us off the Xbox for a while. It was the heyday of Halo, and she was probably just sick of us sitting in front of his TV. But whether or not the story she told us was true, we wound up in this small and low-ceilinged attic space, which could only be accessed by a tiny door hidden in the wooden panels in the wall. We'd known about the door for a while, but had never bothered to go in, mostly because the door seemed like it had been sealed somehow, and we couldn't be bothered with actually using our brains and finding something to pry it open. But the prospect of finding free money in a dusty old room was too much, so we called a few friends to come help search the place. And after a few pries with a putty knife and a flathead screwdriver, we cracked the door open and began to explore. At first, it didn't seem like much was in there. Some old clothes and papers scattered about, and a desk in the corner. But through the gloom and dust, we could see something against the far wall, which turned out to be a very old cot of some kind. It was either busted in half or was meant to fold in half, but either way it was folded over on itself, and we could see something covered in cloth and sandwiched between the two halves. Of course, we wouldn't be good treasure hunters if we didn't look at the covered thing, so we start making our way over to the folded cot. I take a few steps forward, and my foot goes right through the floor like it's made of wet paper. Luckily, though T was right behind me, he had very quick reflexes. His hand shot out and grabbed the back of my shirt to keep me from falling forward, and probably all the way through the floor. We took a second to laugh at the situation and realized that we should probably stick to the sides of the room as the center was most likely the weakest and probably the most likely to collapse under our weight. So we tiptoe all the way around the wall of the room until we get to the cot where we start unfolding it to get to the covered thing. This is where things got strange. As soon as we touched the cot, the room got very cold which was odd because we were in an attic in mid-July. At the time, we thought nothing of it. We were certain we had found the stash. We were moments away from being rich. So we unfold the cot, which took all of our combined strength from how rusted and decrepit the thing was. Honestly, I was surprised it didn't just crumble to dust at the first touch. Finally, we got it unfolded, 
and found that it was, in fact, a decently sized wall mirror that had been wrapped in a sheet or a thin blanket. As soon as we uncovered the mirror, the tiny door that we had come through slowly swung shut. Again, we didn't think anything about it. Must have been a gust of air or something. We were a little disheartened by the lack of money, but T's mom had sent us in there with her camera to take pictures of anything interesting so she could see what was inside, since she wouldn't be going in herself. So we snap a couple of pictures of the mirror, the cot, and the random debris lying around. Now here it's important to note that the mirror's reflective surface was absolutely caked with dust. You could barely tell that the mirror was a mirror, the dust was so thick. Yet the base of the mirror, which looked and felt like it was made of some sort of ceramic, was practically pristine. When I say the base, I mean the part of the mirror in which the reflective surface was set, not the actual bottom of the mirror. I found that to be very odd, as the whole mirror had been covered by the sheet. So why would any of it be dusty at all, let alone just a specific part like that? So we snap the pictures and are about to call it quits, when we hear the dogs barking downstairs. That usually meant that somebody was at the door. So we carefully make our way along the walls and out of the room to head downstairs. It turned out to be our friend, who we'll call B, who had come to help us search for the supposed stash. After we told her about the attic room, she wanted to see it for herself. So naturally, we took her up and showed her the tiny door. Before we even set foot into the room, we told her about the crappy floor and to only walk along the walls. Of course, she either didn't take us seriously or she just didn't understand what we had said because she takes a couple of steps toward the cot and falls almost all the way through the floor, practically right through the small hole that I had created earlier. So she's sitting there with her upper body still in the attic and her legs dangling down through the ceiling of the kitchen. It was at this moment that I heard one of the most hilarious sentences I've ever heard. Through the now large hole in the floor, we could hear T's mom on the phone with someone when she said in a very flat and nonchalant tone, I have to go now, there are children falling through my ceiling. So we get V out of the floor and have a good laugh about the situation. And once we're sure she was okay, we all agreed it was probably best to just leave the room alone before we caused any more damage. We get out and all the way downstairs when T pipes up that he'd forgotten the camera and a flashlight in there. So I agreed to go back in with him to grab them. We thought it wouldn't take but a second as he remembered setting them both down on the floor close to the hole when we were helping V get out. But when we got there, we were a little confused. We couldn't see the camera or the flashlight anywhere. We looked all over the floor, thinking maybe we'd kicked them around on our way out or when we were helping B, but they weren't there. We were about to go check if he had maybe set them outside the door or something when we were shutting it behind us, when T stopped dead in his tracks and whispered my name. I looked over, and in an instant, I knew what had made him stop. The mirror was covered up with the sheet again, only this time the outline of the camera and flashlight could be seen under the cover. We stood there and stared at it for a good minute or two before T got brave enough and started making his way along the wall to get over to the cot. I followed on very shaky legs and I watched as he pulled the cover off the mirror to reveal that his camera and flashlight were indeed hidden under the sheet along with the words help me scrawled in the dust beside them. It was like something out of a horror movie. And honestly, if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't believe it. The nope factor must have been too much for T, because he snatched up his stuff and made a beeline for the door, with me close behind. We slammed the door shut behind us and never went back in. T's mom thought we were making the whole thing up, until we went back and looked through the camera. We had pictures of the cod and the mirror, both before and after messing with them. One of the folded cot with the covered mirror still hidden, one of the open cot with the covered mirror revealed, and one of the uncovered mirror, which showed no writing in the dust. But there was one final picture, which convinced his mom that we were telling the truth, and that she should never open that door again. 
The last picture was taken seemingly from atop the cot and clearly showed the giant hole where B had fallen through, which meant that after T had put the camera down so that we could get B out of the hole, someone else had picked it up from beside the hole after we left, carried it and a flashlight over to the mirror and snapped a picture after setting it down. That had to have happened very quickly because we were only out of the room for three minutes at most. T realized he'd forgotten his camera almost as soon as we'd gotten downstairs. The only ones that were there were T, his mom, myself, and B. His dad and older brother were at work, and even if they had come home, they would have had to pass us on the stairs to get up to the attic. There's just no way that I can logically explain the writing on the mirror, and to this day, I still think about what was in that attic with us. So let me start by saying that my brother and I are extremely experienced desert campers, and we have lived near deserts pretty much our whole lives. I have never in my 20 years of life ever for one second believed in anything paranormal or anything to do with evil spirits. Unlike my brother who has always sensed presences and been able to see mostly what we call jinn, also known as demons. Last night though, things changed for me and it marks the last time that we'll be camping alone in the desert. We've always had the same place we like to go whenever we want to camp with minimal effort. Our day started as normal as ever, but as we got closer and closer to our destination, I saw my brother's mood completely shift. When I asked what was wrong, he just shrugged me off and told me to just keep driving. When we arrived, I felt completely fine, but my brother was still unusually quiet. It was around 1 p.m. at that point, and we were planning on leaving at about 12 to 1 in the morning. Because of the heat, we made the terrible decision to set up under a few trees and a source of water, which in the Middle Eastern culture where we live is where the jinns live at night. Not that I believed in that at the time, of course. However, we still set up our camp and continued on as normal. Now my brother always says that when he feels a presence, or several in this case, he gets extremely unlucky. First he almost dropped a box of coals on his foot. Then he spilled an entire bottle of coke on his phone. Then he dropped it into the sand and proceeded to smash his elbow on the edge of the chair he was sitting on. His elbow is now very swollen. And last, but certainly not least, when he was looking through one of our boxes, he felt something cold and sharp right against his arm. He realized it was an unsheathed knife, which we packed with its case the previous night before. And later he said that it felt like something had pushed his hand into it, right where his veins are. All of these events consecutively occurred within a matter of a few hours, which made us both uneasy and I, for the life of me, could not figure out why he was suddenly so unlucky. As I was starting to question his clumsiness, a random couple appeared out of nowhere, informing us that they were stuck in the sand and needed help. We drive a land cruiser and they had a Nissan Altima, so we didn't expect to encounter as many issues as we did. We first dug them out without any issues, but as we pushed them out of the sand, it got stuck again. If you know anything about dune bashing or desert camping, then you understand the physics behind how wheels get stuck in sand. And the way this Nissan was stuck was incredibly unusual. It was literally stuck somewhere with plenty of space available for grip. And later, my brother said that as we were digging them out of the sand, that's when he really started to feel like an evil presence was around us. But he didn't want to say anything and ruin the trip and freak me out. We ended up having to tow them out of the sand, which again was much harder than it should have been. First, our tow strap broke off of their bumper. The tow strap cost $200 and was fine, but their bumper was slightly damaged. 
Then we almost got stuck ourselves in a 20 minute job that took more like 90, which again was extremely unusual. And with hindsight, just the beginning of all the crap to come. When we came back to our camp, we noticed how everything around us had gotten unusually quiet. The area we were in has hundreds of birds around, and as far as we have seen, three cats who sometimes pay us a visit. But there wasn't a single noise at all, other than our fire, which was dying out unusually quickly. It had gotten dark so fast that we had to scramble to build a fire to cook our dinner, before we were asked to help the couple. And I had noticed the silence, but it didn't bother me. My brother suddenly grabbed my hand as we were sitting down to eat, and said with clear fear in his voice that we should get going as quickly as possible, that he didn't feel safe. To ease both of our minds, we prayed. We are both Christian, so of course we thought it would help. But I think it accelerated everything that happened, and just made whatever was there angry. We quickly finished our dinner, and me being the skeptic, I was completely fine staying there. But I wanted to humor my brother. But that's when I started getting the nagging feeling that it was time to pack up and leave. It hit me like a wave, and I was quite taken aback by the feeling. So I voiced it to my brother, and he agreed that we should pack up right away and leave. We started packing up at a normal pace, like we were just tired and wanted to go. And that's when we heard a sound very close to us, on the opposite side of the pond, which wasn't that big, that I could only describe as the sound of death itself. It seemed to go on for several minutes, and when I say that we looked at each other in absolute fear, I genuinely mean it. I was about to have a heart attack right then and there. At that point, after being frozen for a few minutes, and quite reasonably so, after hearing that bellowing screech so close to us, we turned on the car, drove it back so we could see better with the headlamps, and just started throwing everything into the car without much care, but with a whole lot of urgency. After the screaming, everything hit the fan. First, it was the sound of twigs snapping and footsteps all around us. Then it was the shadows behind the trees. I tried everything to get those shadows to change shape walking around the trees and moving lights, but nothing. It looked like there were people just staring at us the whole time. You could really feel it too. We genuinely felt like we were not alone and that we weren't with friendly entities either. We also noticed that all three cats were huddled right behind our car, away from the trees. So they were not the ones snapping the twigs. At that moment, I was really hoping they were going to move so I could get us out of there safely, and thankfully, when we slowly started to reverse, they took a hint. But they looked absolutely terrified, and were just staring at the trees, too. It felt like whatever was there was getting closer. I've never felt anything like it. It was a gut feeling. It was just one of those natural instincts you can't ignore. Thankfully, we were able to pack up quickly, our tent was very close to the trees, though, so that was a nerve-wracking experience. And while we were packing, it was still very silent. It's very normal for the birds around that area to continue making sounds until 2 or 3 in the morning. And at this point, it was about 8 p.m., so highly unusual. I personally think I was most terrified as I was driving back onto the main dirt path to leave the desert. I know cars very well. I know how they drive in the sand, and I know our car especially well, because we've had it for so long. I could instantly tell that the steering was off, and completely fighting against me. This fixed itself the second we were on the highway. The sounds of twigs snapping was still all around us, and it was loud enough to be heard over the sound of the car. On the path was what seemed like every bird in the area just standing there and staring at us until we got close enough to force them to walk, not even fly, away. At one point, my brother just grabbed my shoulder and told me very sternly to just keep looking in front of me and under no circumstances to look through his window. 
It was the tone of voice that told me to listen to him for the love of God. We were in a part of the desert where we had to pretty much drive through the whole of the accessible areas to get onto the highway again, and there wasn't a single person around us. The only thing we saw was a very clearly abandoned Toyota, positioned behind a small dune and hidden by the trees, but was far enough from our campsite to easily rule out as the source of the original screech. The worst thing I saw as we were closing to the exit was that we saw in the middle of the path, staring directly at us, a deer. A deer. I have only seen one deer in 16 years of living here, and that was in someone's garden as a pet. It's safe to say that I was in complete shock. The deer was just not moving at all until I got close enough that we could practically smell the thing before it slowly walked off the path while looking right at us. We quickly moved past the deer and again my brother, with a grasp of my shoulder and a stern voice, said to keep my eyes right on the road. I asked him later as we got onto the highway what it was that he kept seeing and he very reluctantly told me that he kept seeing large figures around us any time we went through a bend and they were all either pointing right at us or ahead of us. I'm glad he didn't tell me at the time because I probably would have crapped myself. We still hadn't encountered anyone, but we still very clearly heard sounds all around us. And again, not the usual bird or cat, but big, unrelenting sounds. When I saw the exit, I was as happy as I have ever been but that quickly faded when once again we saw another deer standing right in the middle of the road, slowly walking away and looking right at us. But this time it didn't really look like a deer. It was more like a kangaroo mixed with a deer and its eyes were milky. It looked rotten and horrible. I didn't much care. I just stepped on the gas and fortunately it got out of the way in time. When you exit the desert, you can either turn right onto a long stretch of highway, or you can go left and go through a small town, then take the back streets to a parallel highway. As I was about to turn right, my brother once again, with that same tone of voice, said to go to the town. Later, he said once again that he saw a line of figures pointing ahead of us, so if we would have gone the other way, we probably wouldn't have made it home in one piece. Thankfully, as we made it farther and farther away and closer to our home, the gut feeling of being watched was going away. And of course, having never experienced something like this before, I was distraught and wanted to talk about it. My brother told me as we were going home that because we were alone, the djinn wanted to mess with us, that they wanted to scare us and most likely cause us harm and that the way they get you into such rural places is to force you to stop and then do whatever they want, which makes sense as to why there were so many animals blocking our path. He also said that they cause bad luck and he could feel them the second we entered the desert, which explains his clumsiness all day and the car that got stuck in such an unusual manner. Because he's my younger brother by three years, any time he had ever told me about this sort of thing before, I always just dismissed it as him scaring himself. I can excuse the sounds we heard and the shadows we saw last night. I can excuse the gut feeling as just being scared, but I cannot excuse the two deer we saw staring right at us, and I cannot excuse the car just randomly fighting against me as I was driving. The deer completely freaked me out as did the tone of my brother's voice. It's safe to say we're not going camping there again. And it's also safe to say that I will never dismiss my brother when it comes to this kind of thing again. I'm so thankful to God that he was there and that we made it home safely. So, I've never been the kind of person to believe in ghosts. I'm a non-religious guy. 
but I've seen some odd things in my 26 years. Nothing to convince me 100% that the paranormal is legit. However, I have one interesting experience that tends to get interest every time I tell it, and honestly, has made me question my stance on the paranormal ever since. About six years ago, I was a 20-year-old student living in London. My latest flat contract had run out, and I needed a place to live ASAP. I had very little money and felt guilty needing my parents to be a guarantor, so as any broke Londoner would do, I googled the cheapest place possible, somewhere I could move into that day or the next. That's how last minute this was. I was fortunate, or in actual fact, misfortunate, to find a place available to move in that day. Contract signed, I had a place to live. I moved into this detached house with all my stuff the following day. It was a dirty house, but the flat occupants were all 20 to 30 year olds, four of them, and very friendly. The area was quiet, and I felt reasonably comfortable. The house was always damp and cold. It was autumn, so it's not surprising, but it was always an unpleasant atmosphere. The garden was overgrown and creepy. The windows that faced it were scratched, cracked, and looked very dirty. The hallway lights didn't work, so the entire interior of the living room and hallways connecting to the rooms were pitch black at night. The bathroom was just something else. On my first night after speaking to one of my new flatmates, I was told that they have all experienced weird noises, especially scratching on the blackened window in the bathroom. I laughed this off as utter nonsense. Probably just a tree brushing it when it gets windy outside, I thought. So after a couple of weeks, I finally started noticing weird occurrences in the building. My room's window faced the driveway, and I liked to keep my curtains closed, just because it was west-facing and I didn't like the sunlight pouring in and blinding me every morning. So I would close the curtains in the morning, head to class, come home, and find the curtains opened more than halfway. This wasn't a one-time occurrence. This happened every day. In fact, I could come home from class, close them again, go out to work or see friends, and come home to open curtains. Yet when I was in the room for hours on end, they never moved. Bit weird, but whatever. My windows were closed and locked, and so was the bedroom door when I wasn't there, and I was the only one with the key, I hope. Above me was an attic. Nobody lived up there. It was a locked storage room. But at night, I could hear what sounded like feet stomping, two people walking around, kids running, and sometimes whispers. Bit freaky, but I thought maybe someone in the house had access to this room and was using it at night, for who knows what. But no one was up there. The room was locked. I would sometimes go up at night and go to the door and try to get a sense of who the hell was in there, but no luck. I never saw anything, but I could always hear these footsteps. One of my flatmates was a very religious man. I could hear him praying at least five times a day, and he was always very friendly and open to talk about his faith and to listen to me stress out about the awful state of the house. But he himself didn't hear or notice anything weird other than the unhygienic state of the place. He decided at one point to head home to Algeria for a few months with his room locked. After six to seven weeks of living there, one of the other occupants moved out and a room was available there. I told a friend of mine that was as desperate as I had been weeks prior and he moved in within a few days. Things were great. We worked and went to the same uni, so it was cool hanging out with a friend. I told him the stories. Due to his religious beliefs, he wasn't a believer in ghosts. And like me, he wasn't phased by the stories. But he began to notice oddities too. The same stomping noises upstairs. The scratching windows. My curtains opening on their own. He felt like he was being watched all the time. 
he noticed the shed in the garden had a broken panel and could easily imagine someone being inside, sometimes watching us in the kitchen when we made food. Routine pest control opened the shed during a visit one day and found half a dozen dead rats and a pile of hollowed out bees in there. Creepy, but no monsters, right? My friend and I were eating dinner after work in the kitchen one night. I was facing him and the door to the hallway, while Stee was facing myself and the sliding glass door that gave access to the overgrown jungle garden behind. I remember him turning pale, jumping to his feet, and asking me in a very frightened tone, Can you come into my room? I laugh and asked why. He said, Seriously, can you please just come to my fucking room? It's not a joke. Then he bolted to his room like he was running away from something. I finished my sandwich with the last bite, didn't even think to turn around to see what he was so spooked about. Got to his room, and he locked the door, sat on its bed, and turned on his PlayStation. After a few minutes, he calmed down, and as he started playing, he told me that he saw something in the garden. A woman in a white dress. She walked across the garden, half a meter from the glass, almost floated past, he said, and then she vanished. He kept repeating, we have to leave, we have to leave, and that the noises were one thing, but that when you see something, everything changes. My room scarred him and everyone else the most. Another flatmate told us they thought they'd seen me in my room peering at them on the driveway through a 20 centimeter gap in my curtains one night. They said they saw the shape of a person's head. The only thing was, I wasn't there that night, or on any of those occasions mentioned, and I certainly don't peer at people through my window. After that, things got worse. Two nights after the kitchen incident, I'm woken up at around three or four in the morning. My friend is banging on my door in the pitch blackness of the hallway. I open it, and he comes in shaking with fear saying his bed was vibrating and moving, and that he can't stay here any longer. The next day, he speaks to a friend, has a place to stay, so he packs up most of his stuff, and he's gone. Within a few days, another person left, a little creeped out, but mostly annoyed with the poor state of the house. At this point, the remaining occupants and I are all looking for alternative living arrangements. Remember the religious guy that went back to Algeria? Well, he's been gone for months now and hasn't returned. The landlord makes a visit once a day, and he has a spare key, so he decides to inspect the room to make sure all is okay. So he opens it up and we go in. His room was amazing. It was warm, cozy, not damp or cold. It was honestly like a different house altogether. It was really nice, and I really don't know how to explain that. Finally, I had decided to move in with my partner, who had avoided this house the entire time I'd lived there, maybe visiting once or twice. She hated it, hated being there, and always felt uncomfortable. On my last night, I again heard weird noises, but this time in the hall. I was aware that I was home alone that night, as the only other flatmate left was on holiday. It was, as it always was, very dark when I opened the door. Nobody was there. I walked into the living room, and the window at the back that faced the side of the house was making weird scratching noises. I needed to use the bathroom, and as a necessity, I had to carry a flashlight to do the job during these hours. I walked into the bathroom, did my business, and as I'm zipping up my pants, my flashlight briefly shines over the window. For some reason, I looked, almost as if I was expecting to see something. I didn't. I walked out of the room, and I don't know why, but I decided to look at that window once more without the light. I saw the shape of a large man. I went back to my room and locked the door. All night, I heard feet stomping upstairs in the attic. I couldn't sleep, so I moved all my things into a pile in the middle of the room, sat on the bed, and waited for sunrise. I got a taxi first thing in the morning, and finally got the hell out of there. And whether I believe in anything paranormal still or not, 
You couldn't pay me to go back. This happened in mine and my husband's first house several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery, for the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy, but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving night lights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm. Not hard, but firm. And he whispered, What the hell? While looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m., and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did, and he handed me another, smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room, and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly, and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first, I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, 
our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time, I was wary of the room, though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate, probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go, now, back to his mom's. Then we, somehow, just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room, and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, whoa, what's wrong? but I just turn his head to the upstairs, and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning, rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room, because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside He's got a handful of stuff, and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling because he, my not-scared-of-anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're gonna stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place, it's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there, and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, 
handed over the keys, and haven't really looked back, other than to talk about Remember When, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house. Not even a little bit. My story is about the house I lived in until I was five. My dad lived there after the divorce, and I visited often. It had been a family house on my dad's side of one kind or another since the late 1940s. It's also a house that's haunted. The whole family has ghost stories, most people more than one, and most of them involve the staircase that goes to the second floor. It's the first thing you see when you walk into the house. The staircase has been replaced six times, and I'm fairly sure that that's not normal in any house. Family legend says that the house, which was built in 1920, was the site of a murder side in the early 1940s. Supposedly, the owners right before my grandparents told them that the owners before them were a young man and his new wife who were hoping to start a new family. The story goes that the husband came home from work early one afternoon and went upstairs looking for his wife. One of the bedrooms has a door that opens directly to the top of the stairs, which was also my bedroom as a kid in the 70s. As he comes up the stairs, he's treated to an ever-expanding view of his wife and the neighbor guy having a good time in the guest bed. Instead of yelling or anything, he quietly goes downstairs into the back room, grabs his hunting rifle, and then goes back upstairs where he kills the wife and the neighbor. Then he calmly gets a length of rope from the garage and hangs himself from the second floor banister in the stairwell. The house sat empty for a while. The next family, the one selling the house to my grandparents, got the house for dirt cheap. They redid the stairwell, staircase number two, and supposedly lived there 18 months before deciding to sell. My grandparents didn't really think much of it, mostly because they were pregnant, had three kids, the house was cheap, and they were poor. They went on to have nine total kids, and every single one of my aunts and uncles has stories about ghosts in that house. I have over 40 cousins, and they all have stories about ghosts and unexplained events in the home. Most of the stories involve seeing a hanged man, or a dark shape in the stairwell, a young nervous woman on the second floor, or an older woman that tends to sleeping children. Some experiences involve strange occurrences, like furniture and items that move or break when no one else is in the room. Some of the stories are scary, some are nice, but everyone has at least one, and usually they have several. After graduating high school, I was in and out of college and in and out of jobs. For a short period of time, I lived in this house during a summer when I was between jobs. My grandfather and my dad technically lived there, but stayed with other family members and girlfriends and were almost never home. A friend of mine was with me on the night that some weird things happened. She didn't officially live there, but she was basically living with me. I had told her about all the ghost stories and paranormal stuff, and we decided to dig out my grandmother's old Ouija board, the same one that I have now, and try to contact the spirits. We get everything out, put our fingers on the planchette, and nothing happens. The planchette doesn't want to move. So we set the mood, get out the incense, light the candles, and nothing happens. By now, I'm bored. It's 3 a.m., it's summer in New York, and it's kind of stuffy and hot inside. So I decide that I want to go to the back porch where it's cooler. My friend agrees, and we get up, leave the board on the bed, and as we're grabbing shoes, we hear something fall off the bed. It's the planchette. We both jump up and then laugh because it was obviously on the edge and just fell, right? 
except we were both pretty sure the planchette hadn't been anywhere near the edge and had in fact been in the very middle of the bed. We try and nervously shrug it off and then we're like, ooh, maybe it wants to talk to us. Being silly, we decide to ask one more question before we go out. This time the planchette wants to move and starts circling as soon as our fingers touch it. Before we finish the question, what is your name? It goes to no. We laugh. Okay, all right, you don't want to tell us your name. How old were you when you died? Planchette slips quickly across the board to no. Fine, all right, all right, what message do you have for us? Again, it goes straight to no. Now I'm figuring by this point it's my friend pushing it because this is not any weak tentative moving around the board. It's forceful and she is known for kind of messing around. So I basically grab the planchette and half jokingly, half seriously, throw it next to her on the bed. I was a little bit miffed at her for pushing it around and not giving it a chance. Besides, if you're going to be so obviously pushing the planchette, you should at least make the answers interesting. I say, I'm done, that was fun, but let's go to the back porch and smoke. As soon as I stand up, we hear the sound of a door slamming downstairs so hard that the windows rattled from the force of it. There are only three doors downstairs. The ones to the front door and back room had been closed and locked for hours, and the bathroom door was a piece of crap that could barely close, let alone slam. My dad and my grandfather were out of state visiting relatives, so I knew it wasn't them coming home. Neither of us wanted to go check on what had made the noise, but we left the room and we went to see that the stairwell was oddly dark. It was like all the shadows had just collected there. Like that part of the room was way darker than the rest. It was just so pitch black in that stairwell that I couldn't see beyond the first step of stairs. The rest of the landing is lit normally by some moonlight coming in the lone window on the second floor landing. But it just seemed as if that bit of light stopped at a wall as soon as it reached the stairs. The dark cloud in the stairwell seemed to move and shift, a strange inky blackness that looked thick. At this point in time, the stairs are a wrought iron spiral staircase that my dad had put in. This was the fourth time the stairs had been replaced. They weren't very safe to climb down even when you could see. So I inch to the center of the room and pull the light switch so we can see what we're doing and not break our necks on the staircase. And of course, the light pole comes off in my hand. No light. I look to my friend thinking, okay, the roiling pitch black shadows in this stairwell must be my imagination. She can probably see just fine, so I would just follow her down. But no, she's staring at the stairwell with wide eyes full of terror. She turns to me and says, why the hell is it so dark? At this point, I realize that she can see it too. So I push her back into the room and slam the door shut behind us. I had one of those push button locks, so I quickly locked it. I turned back into the room and my friend is stock still staring at the floor by the bed. The Ouija board and the planchette are sitting perfectly centered on the floor the planchette on no. And that would normally be fine, but we were sure that we had left the Ouija board in the middle of the bed with the planchette a good few feet away from it. I have never done a room cleansing and protection and closed a Ouija board so fast in all my life. We went on the rest of the night chain smoking, huddled in a corner, twitching and just trying to tell each other happy stories. Morning comes and of course everything is fine and normal and we laugh at ourselves because it was probably just the nerves and staying up too late. By the time the coffee was done brewing, we had all but convinced ourselves that everything that had happened was due to overactive imaginations. We go to the backyard to check the vegetable garden and hang out on the porch drinking coffee. We find some crushed tomato plants next to the tree by the porch and then 
we find some cigarette butts in a spot behind the tree where you can see my bedroom window, but can't be seen in the dark. I guess it's a good thing we didn't go out at the witching hour. Coincidence? Overactive imaginations? Still freaks me out to this day. In a weird way, it was like the house was protecting us. Like it knew that we shouldn't go outside. I've looked for years, trying to find any shred of truth to the murder side story. I was able to find that the house was built in 1920. And although I can't find any paper evidence of specifically a murder side, a search of the county coroner's records do show gun murders and hanging sides in that town in the 1940s. In town, the story was common knowledge. Everybody in the family knew it. The neighbors knew it. Was it true? I don't know. I would think that there would be more records of something as sensational as that, especially in the early 1940s. However, while researching the history of the house, I did find another true tale that's even older, from a regional newspaper dated March 16th of 1896, which is coincidentally the same day I found the story. It read, killed a woman and himself. Thomas P. was enraged because Minnie M. scorned him. Thomas P. killed Minnie M. this morning at the farm half a mile north of here and then killed himself. Both were in the employ of Mrs. M. He was infatuated with her, but she gave him no encouragement. He threatened a few days ago that he would kill her. The farm mentioned in the article is where my house was built and the street is named for the family that owned the farm. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just gonna start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything. And I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names, and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently, everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. 
The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day, I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me, inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial, since he was my neighbor but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November, 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police, who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it. Twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference, and during that time someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done, that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, 
Seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there, going outside and screaming nonsense, things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I call the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them so maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. I have a ghost in my life and I have named him Toby. The name from the Paranormal Activity franchise. It's to make light of a creepy situation. Oddly enough, I would say that 98% of my encounters with my ghost, I was never alone. There was usually another person with me when he would make an appearance. This all started with a single photo that I took. I should give more context. So before I moved out for school, I lived on an acreage with my dad and brother, and this area has small abandoned buildings everywhere that can be easily explored. So between the ages of 17 and 18, I had some friends over, two guys and three girls including myself, and we would go exploring and get our spook on. We had some scary moments, but I am also chalking it up to overactive imaginations and purposefully scaring each other. This time was no different than the others, we thought. We went to this little church near my dad's house and we did some exploring. We managed our way in and looked around. The girls and I spooked ourselves and hightailed it back to the truck. 
and the guys were laughing at us. I decided to take a picture of them. I was periodically taking photos throughout the night. The next day we all woke up and I was looking through my photos and noticed that I had captured something else in one particular photo. It really creeped me out, but it eventually was just forgotten. Not long after, I started having nightmares, and these nightmares are recurring and can last anywhere between one night to a whole year. I am 24 years old now, and I still get them. Initially, I didn't put two and two together, until a friend of mine noticed my ghost and nightmares started happening at the same time. My nightmares are also important to my spooky happenings, or at least I feel like they are. Now for the meat of the story. A few months after graduating high school, I moved eight hours away from home with my best friend and then boyfriend for college. At the time, I have been getting this particular nightmare of a horse being dismembered alive, and I was stuck in place and couldn't do anything to help. It was disrupting my sleep, and I would say that I was having this nightmare anywhere between one to three times a week for a year. A year and a half later, after moving to this new city, things happened and my best friend and I were looking for somewhere else to live. We'd asked a friend that we'd become very close with to move in with us. We found a little three-bedroom townhouse on the west side of the city. We also had the best friend's brother and my cousin staying in the basement temporarily. It was a cramped house, but we made it work. The townhouse is when Toby made his first appearance. The layout of this place was simple. You walk in, there are stairs going up to your right, and straight ahead, you can see the kitchen and living room. They were separated by a wall. I believe this was a Friday or a Saturday night in the winter time in Canada, because I remember fondly that I was home alone and the others were out being busy. I was in the living room studying with no TV on, and I heard this very distinct man sneeze come from the kitchen. I just froze because it was so unexpected and so close. I remember going through the entire house to see if I was truly alone. Once I realized that I was indeed by myself, I called my best friend and told her to come home because I was scared. They ended up laughing at me because they just assumed that I had an active imagination, but oh boy, were they going to find out that they were wrong. Around this time, I was nightmare free for maybe a few months, and after Toby's first appearance, they started up again, but it was a different one. I had a recurring dream of me watching this man being eaten alive by a bear, and again I was frozen in place and I couldn't help. So a month or so after the sneeze, my friend and roommate and I were watching TV. We were the only ones home at the time, and our stairway had photos and paintings and frames. Every single one of them came crashing down at the same time. The stairway has no windows in it, and it was cold outside, so no wind could have knocked them down. We went to investigate and every single one of them was on the ground. We were pretty scared at that point, but we hung them back up. Over a period of time, we would learn that we couldn't keep anything on the walls. After some time, we had to move out due to the landlord selling the place, and we moved to this condo. It was a beautiful place. I started getting more and worse nightmares, and they were alternating between four dreams. Two events happened in this condo, and I also forgot to mention that I had two cats this entire time. They began to interact with Toby in this place. For the first occurrence, all of us were sitting on the couch in the living room, and the couch is parallel with the stairs going up. It was nighttime, and both cats got fuzzy-tailed and stared intently upstairs, growling. Everyone who lived at this place was in the living room. It creeped us out, but we just made a joke out of it and tried to keep it light. For the second occurrence, I was having a brand new nightmare. In my dream, I was actively being decapitated, and in real life, my neck was getting hot. 
I couldn't breathe, and I felt like I was falling out of consciousness. But I woke up screaming, crying, and holding my neck. Then I thought I saw something by the door. My then-boyfriend woke up to my screaming and said he thought he saw something in the room, but that it was so dark it could have been nothing. I hadn't mentioned that I also saw something until after he said something, and this is when I started to fear Toby. We lived there for about a year and a half, roughly, before the other girls moved in with their boyfriends, and I moved into a big house that my then-boyfriend's family owned. The mother and sister said that they felt uneasy in that house when they visited, but I figured it couldn't be worse than my nightmares. So, I had two people move in with me, and they experienced things as well. The nightmares were becoming less severe, and I was down to just one nightmare, maybe one to two a week, and it was a small kitten being tortured. It made me really sad in real life, and I would wake up unhappy. This house has two sub-basements, and the first sub-basement was a second living room. The second one had a bedroom with no windows, a bathroom, and a laundry. Our stuff was going missing and then turning up in random places. The front door would just open. My brother came down to visit me, and my other two roommates were working. We were watching a spooky movie in the living room sub-basement, and my one cat was sitting on the arm of the couch that we were sitting on. She quickly turned her head toward the stairs, going down, got up all fuzzied up, and stared intently at the darkness. Her eyes followed something that we couldn't see to the stairs, going up. She laid back down, but wouldn't look away from the stairs. My brother looked at me and said that that was damn creepy, and I agreed. A couple of months later, I was doing laundry, and my roommate's bedroom door starts to shake quite violently as he was headed to his room. We both just stood there, looking at the door, perplexed, and suddenly it just stopped. He didn't want to enter his room alone, so I went in with him for peace of mind. Everything was normal in the room, so I left to finish the laundry. It was rather creepy. I moved again. I know, I move a lot. And I lived with my best friend and her boyfriend in June 2018. This is when all Toby occurrences and nightmares completely stopped. Like, as soon as I moved in. It was wonderful. I took the silence for granted, though. A week before Christmas, I experienced my first form of sleep paralysis. And I say form because it wasn't the classic type of sleep paralysis. This scared me so badly, to the point that I could not sleep at all the rest of the night and was noticeably off for the day. My sleep paralysis, I had no idea that I was asleep. Like, honestly, I had no idea that I was asleep. I thought everything happening in my dream was real. I could move, or it felt like moving. In this dream, I was on YouTube, and randomly a deep web YouTube took over. This horribly graphic video was flooding my screen, and I felt the panic of trying to get rid of it, to force it to shut down. But the videos just wouldn't go away. I was in full panic mode, and I couldn't stop it. And then I woke up. I was really bothered because I had zero idea that I was asleep. I felt like I could feel the laptop in my hands, and I still felt the panic. After that radio silence since March of 2019, my male cat, who was six, died suddenly with no previous medical conditions. My friends believe it was Toby. I moved in with my current boyfriend, and I hadn't had any nightmares since Christmas of last year, and no Toby, until last weekend. He plucked the boyfriend's acoustic guitar loudly and distinctly. And I also had a new nightmare last night. So far, these are all of my occurrences, but this is definitely an ongoing situation. I just want to live my life in peace. Update. So, this morning, my boyfriend wakes me up at 5.30 a.m. He leaves at 6 a.m. And I wake up at 7 a.m. I had a new nightmare in that hour of being alone. 
I woke up to this feeling of just gloom since I hate these types of nightmares. My cat sits with me as I put on my makeup on the couch and I hear stuff falling and quiet thumps downstairs. I found the blanket cupboard was open and all of the blankets were on the ground. I can only imagine what Toby will do next. This is by far the spookiest experience my family and I have ever had regarding the paranormal. I'm currently living in Australia, and this all started when I moved into my current house around three years ago. In my culture, we believe that whenever a family moves into a new home, a priest should come to perform various prayers to bless the house. However, when my mom bought the house, we immediately went on holiday for three months, so we were unable to perform the rituals. Everything started when we first came back to our house. Just some background. My mom raised me on her own, so it was just the two of us staying in the house at the time. I was still in high school, and my mom worked in the city, so we both took the train every morning. My mom always left home earlier than I did, so it was my job to lock up every morning. My mom worked late almost every day, so I would get home first and be home alone for at least five hours every day. One morning as I left home, I began to feel paranoid that I had not locked the door. So I went back to check it. The door was locked. Later that day when I came home from school, I walked up my driveway to find that the door was standing wide open. I freaked out, but because I was brave enough, I went inside. Our kitchen is pretty close to the entrance, so I grabbed a knife and searched the entire house. There was no one there. I decided not to tell my mom because she was already really stressed with work, and I didn't want her to freak out. Over the next few days, other strange things started happening. For one, our garage door would randomly start opening whenever we were home. My mom was kind of scared, but then we thought maybe our neighbor's garage remote functioned at the same frequency or something, and it was activating our door too, so we dismissed it. It had been about two months since we were living in our new house, and everything seemed to be normal again. Until one day, when I was awoken in the middle of the night by my mom. She looked super scared and asked me if I had come to her room to wake her up. I said no, I was half asleep and I had no idea what she was rambling on about. She didn't believe me and made me swear that I hadn't. I always play scare pranks on my family so I can kind of see why. I swore I didn't and I asked her what was going on. My mom is a super light sleeper and so while she was sleeping, she heard somebody prop her door open. She looked up and saw the figure of a boy and thought it was me. So, she asked it what was wrong and blinked, and there was nothing there, but her door was still open. She called my name a few times, and there was no response, hence why she came into my room. I have to admit, given the stuff happening with the doors, I was kind of scared, but I convinced my mom that she was imagining things, and she went back to sleep. Ever since that night, up to this very day, my mom still sleeps with her door open and the living room light on, and I don't blame her, especially after what happened next. Two weeks after this incident occurred, my mom's best friend and her son and daughter, they were both around my age, came over from our homeland, Malaysia, to visit us. I was really excited, as I've always been close to them. One thing you should know about my aunt, she's had many experiences growing up with the paranormal, so she's super scared of ghosts. For this reason, her kids and I always used to play pranks on her. One day, the four of us were playing poker on the dining table while my mom was taking a nap in the living room. Suddenly, my mom rushes out of the living room, her eyes wide open, and she looked really scared. She asked who had woken her up from her nap. The four of us were completely dumbfounded as we'd been playing cards the entire time. 
She then told us that she felt someone tap her shoulder while she was asleep. When she opened her eyes, there were two feet on the floor, but when she blinked, the feet were gone and nobody was there. My mom was full on freaking out now, especially after what had happened the other night. Then my aunt, given how afraid she is of ghosts, started to freak out too. I didn't want her holiday to be ruined, so I managed to convince them that my mom was probably in the middle of a dream when she woke up and she was probably just hallucinating. I know it sounds stupid, but hey, it worked. But then the next day, something else happened. My mom had gone to the shops to get groceries. The kids and I were playing video games in the living room while their mom was having a shower. Suddenly we heard the bathroom door burst open and out runs my aunt wrapped in her towel. She screamed at us, telling us to stop trying to scare her and that it wasn't funny. The three of us were super confused and her daughter asked her what had happened. She told us that she knew that we were the ones knocking on the bathroom door, even after she told us to stop three times. I know it probably seems like she was overreacting, but I cannot emphasize how afraid of ghosts she is. I exchanged a concerned look with her kids and then told her that it genuinely was not us and that we'd been playing video games the entire time. Soon my mom got home and we told her what happened. Let's just say that my aunt started sleeping with her room lights on for the rest of the trip. Soon my aunt and her kids had gone home and it was back to me and my mom again. We were back to our regular routine. My mom was finally at peace and she hadn't seen anything for a while, apart from the same thing with the garage door every once in a while. The same, however, could not be said for me. It seemed that it had come to be my turn to be tormented. As I mentioned before with my mom at work, I would be home alone for a few hours every day. I began to start hearing things. The strange thing is, it would never occur while I was in the living room. Whenever I went to use the toilet or went to sit in my room, I would start hearing things coming from the living room and kitchen. It started out small just the sound of some panting, like if you'd just run a long distance. But the minute that I entered the living room, nothing. There would be no sound at all. It soon started to get worse. I would hear footsteps pacing around outside my room, and spoons and pots falling in the kitchen. But every time that I stepped out into the living room, the noises would stop, and everything would be just as I had left it. There was even a time when I thought I heard a kid laughing right outside the door when I was using the toilet. I decided not to tell my mom yet because she seemed to be getting over her experiences and I didn't want to scare her again. But one day I felt that I needed to tell her and we decided that that day it was time we contacted our priest to perform the prayers for our house. It was the day that my best friend and his parents came over for dinner. It all started as an innocent dinner. My best friend and his family were Malaysian too, and we were having a great time talking about home while having a signature Malaysian meal. My friend's dad was telling us a story when all of a sudden his face just froze and his eyes widened. He honestly looked like he was having a stroke. His face contorted into a frown and he just stared down at the table. My mom and I shared a worrying look but my friend and his mom just continued eating like nothing was happening. Suddenly his dad seemed to return to us, and he continues telling the story as if nothing just happened. He could see though that my mom and I looked worried. Suddenly his wife tapped him on the shoulder and said, just tell them. He frowned at his wife and just kept eating. There was an awkward silence for a few minutes and then he finally decided to address the elephant in the room. He apologized for scaring us and assured us that there was no need to worry. He then went on to tell us about his life. Since he was a child, he'd been very religious, and from a young age, he felt a very close connection to God. He regularly meditated and was very spiritual. He was so spiritual that when he came into his mid-twenties, he had awoken a gift. He was able to see dead people, I kid you not. When he said this, I immediately looked at my friend, waiting for him to start laughing at some prank. 
but my friend's face was dead serious, and he continued looking at his dad as he told the story. He told us that he could see them everywhere, when he was walking his dog on the street, when he was sitting in the park, in people's houses, and even sometimes sitting on people who had been possessed. He said the spirits were drawn to him because they knew he could see them, and they would stalk him, begging him to help them reach the afterlife. He said there was simply nothing he could do, because these people had died before their time, and that they would simply have to wait on Earth until it was their time. Back home, he was regularly contacted by people having paranormal experiences to perform a cleansing to drive evil spirits away. He told us about some of those experiences, but I don't feel like it's my place to share them here. He then asked us something that gave me chills. Have you guys performed the prayers for your house yet? My mom refused to answer the question until he told her why he had asked it. He said that he didn't want to worry us and that if we hadn't, we probably should. My mom continued to ask him why until he finally conceded, and this is what he said. Remember when I had that moment just now while I was talking? I had a visit. I won't tell you what it was, but it was the same spirit I saw standing at the front door when we came here. That's when my mom told him everything that had been happening. It's during this time that I decided to tell my mom about the things that I'd been hearing in the house. My friend's dad then told us that he didn't think it was a malicious spirit, but to be safe it was time for us to conduct the prayers for the house. Before he left, he asked my mom if he could see our altar in the prayer room. My mom took him, and we all followed him. As he stood in front of the altar, his body suddenly shook, as if he had just had a huge hiccup or something. He then put his hands together and bowed his head. Before leaving, he said, I can see why the two of you have not been hurt. You are both protected. And that concluded their visit. A week later, we arranged for a priest from our local temple to cleanse and bless our home. I promise you that since that day, nothing strange has ever happened in our house. Even the garage door has stopped opening on its own. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I've learned my lesson. I will never move into a new house without performing the rituals that my culture demands. This story is definitely not the only paranormal experience that I've had, but it certainly was a unique one. I have a guardian ghost, or at least I think so. As long as I can remember, there have been weird things happening in my house. As a child, my parents purely blamed it on my imagination, but it continued and got even more visible during my teenage years. While a lot of the things that happened belong to another story, I'll concentrate on the very nice dude that seems to live there with us. He made his first appearance when my step-siblings and I were about five years old. I remember vividly playing hide-and-seek with them, walking into my room and seeing a ball rolling across the floor from behind the sofa. But nobody was hiding in that room. When I mentioned this to them years later, they confirmed that they also had had this feeling of another person playing with us. I've always heard footsteps in our house, up the stairs at night, behind me while walking up or down them. It was quite common. Then it started to become the whole house. When I was about 13, I used to spend about two hours home alone every day after school until my parents got home. Usually, I would spend this time in my room. What would happen every day is that I would hear somebody unlock the front door and walk into my living room. And every day, I would go downstairs, thinking that one of my parents must have come home. But nobody would ever be there. It got me so paranoid that I started locking the door to my room when I was home alone, thinking somebody must be in the house with me. Then I started to hear breathing at night, in my room, like right next to my head when I was lying in bed. The first time it happened, I got so scared that I stuffed my blanket above my head. 
The next morning, I told my mom about it, who said that I must have just heard my stepdad snoring in their room. That would mean that I had heard that through multiple closed doors between our rooms. Sure, Jan. Anyway, the breathing started to get more and more common. Not every night, but quite often. Then there was the first incident that now, looking back, makes me think that this paranormal roommate had tried to protect me all along. When I was 14, I had a friend. As it turned out, she was a very toxic and backstabbing person, but I hadn't realized that yet. She was over at my house after school, and we were upstairs playing Sing Star on my PlayStation 2. My mom came up to inform us that she would go to the store to get some groceries, and that we would be alone there for about a half an hour. This was okay with us. We waited until we heard her lock the front door, and then we closed the door to the room we were in and started to sing to all of our favorite 2000 hits. That was until my friend suddenly stopped and started staring at the door. I paused the game and asked her what was wrong, and that's when she just turned pale and told me that somebody had just knocked on the door very loudly. I hadn't heard anything, so I told her that she must have just heard something else. We continued our game, and about a minute later, the same thing happened. My friend stands there, just frozen, completely panicked, telling me that she needs to leave the room immediately because something is trying to get inside. Great logic, by the way. But I, who still hasn't heard anything, slowly opened the door. Nothing was there. My friend wanted to go downstairs, which we then did. But when we got to the middle of the staircase, she starts screaming. Of course, both of us start running, me being scared because she's screaming like bloody hell. Our first instinct was to open the back door and run outside, where we waited for my mom to come home, as my friend refused to set foot in the house again. When she calmed down a bit, she told me that when walking down the stairs, somebody started talking right next to her, right into her ear. Needless to say, she never visited again, which was good knowing now all the things she did later on. Anyway, I was very paranoid still that somebody might be in our house. Right under my window was our back door, which I didn't trust one bit when it came to protecting us from an attempted break-in. Every now and then, when I was lying on my bed at night, I would get afraid of any noises coming from that direction, because oftentimes it sounded like somebody was trying to open it. But any time I got scared by it, this breathing would start again, and eventually it didn't feel scary anymore. It started to feel like somebody was trying to comfort me, trying to tell me that everything was okay, and that I wasn't alone. Which, looking back on it now, is not so comforting, because I was alone, but I digress. After what happened with my friend, I was glad to change schools. At my new school, I avoided topics like ghosts and stuff. I wanted to use the opportunity of making new friends without being the girl with the haunted house. Also, a part of me was thinking straight enough to acknowledge that the breathing only occurred when I was feeling scared, and might just be some kind of mental mechanism to calm myself down. That was until I had a sleepover with two of my friends at age 17. For reference, my room was kind of long. On the one side it had my bed, and on the other it had a sofa. There were like three meters between them. So Sarah slept on the sofa, while Ella slept in my bed next to me. Next to my bed was a rocking chair that my grandpa had once gotten from a garage sale. Keep in mind that I hadn't told them anything that had happened to me in the last couple of years. Since it was the first time having them stay over, I wanted to be a good host and asked them how they slept. Ella didn't say anything, but Sarah said, Okay, I know this is gonna sound super weird, but I couldn't sleep for most of the night. It was like somebody was just breathing into my face, but when I looked, nobody was there. I was shocked, because this confirmed everything that I thought I had just imagined. 
Around this time, the thing with hearing the steps got worse. So much worse that my mom started asking me if I was jumping around my room in the middle of the night. My stepdad asked on several occasions what in the world I was doing in the kitchen at 3 a.m. because he kept hearing somebody walk around downstairs. I hadn't been doing either of those things. About two years had passed since the sleepover with my friends when Ella and I were talking to a friend of ours who had just gotten his first apartment. He told us to come over later on, and I jokingly asked him if he had any furniture yet or if we would have to sit on the floor. He then proudly told us that he even had a very cool rocking chair. That's when Ella told us that she hates rocking chairs because she had a really creepy experience regarding one. Our friend wanted to know what happened, so she started telling her story. Well, I spent the night somewhere and there was a rocking chair in the room. When I woke up in the middle of the night, there was this tall stranger sitting on it, just watching me sleep. I was confused and said, that's so creepy, where did that happen? She said, it was at your place. And no, it wasn't my stepdad. Ella knows my stepdad and he isn't that tall. And also he wouldn't just be sitting in our room in the middle of the night. I wanted to get more information about it, but she refused to ever talk about it again afterwards. That's why she had been so quiet that next morning. The following years continued as usual. I even started communicating with this ghost. Whenever I got scared and heard the breathing, it always made me feel calm. So I started thanking him for letting me know that everything was okay. And whenever I thanked him, the breathing stopped. I once saw the guy that Ella mentioned too. I was walking down the hall past an open door and there he was just standing, a tall man with some kind of hat. I could only see the silhouette and I left as fast as I could because it was still kind of creepy. Later on, after finally believing the stories that I had told them, my parents became more aware of everything. Even after I moved out, my stepdad continued to tell me that there was some ghost guy living with them. Like, yeah, I know, I've been telling you for years. On the rare occasions that I am at my parents' house, he rarely makes his presence known to me. Sometimes I can see a shadow passing by an open door or something small, but my mom still sees him. She just decided to ignore him. We're still not really sure what this could be, I can rule out any deceased relatives as there aren't many and nobody has ever died in the house. My parents built the house, so we were the first to live there. I thought that maybe he was just attached to me and that when I moved he might follow, but he never did. I also don't think he's attached to the rocking chair because it started before I ever placed that in my room. I guess he just thought it was comfortable? I don't know. Still. I hope someday I find out where he came from and why he's in our house. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife, specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, large knives attached to each side of his pack bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. 
When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet as he was behind me. So I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. And at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later, though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, 
we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall, 
was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose, an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it, and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. My family never really had money. My mom was a cleaning lady for the majority of my life and occasionally cut hair on the side in our basement. My dad was the get rich quick type who never wanted someone like a boss to answer to and his ego unfortunately got in the way of making a living. At times he did make some big money, but it was always in lump sums, which he spent as quickly as he got. In 1998, he invented and patented this newly engineered golf club and partnered with a few investors and money was coming in frequently. He was even doing interviews on the local news about it. It caught some major buzz locally and then nationally within a couple of years. Finally, he was bringing an income into the household. We always rented. I lived in three houses I know of by the time I was eight years old. Around my 10th birthday in 2001, my mom and dad told us they were looking for houses in a nicer area to buy. About a week later, my mom brought my brother, two sisters and I to see a house not far from the house that my parents rented. We pulled up and it was huge. Well, huge for us. We walked into the front room and it was wallpapered with, well, the only thing I could use for reference would be Snozberry's wallpaper from the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory movie. The carpet was mint green and had two white French doors going into the dining room. The previous owner's son, who was a middle-aged graying man, didn't exactly greet us with a smile. He almost looked frustrated, like we were late, but we weren't. My siblings and I looked at each other as if my mom was crazy for wanting this weird-ass house. Then we saw it. He showed us into the kitchen. The kitchen was huge, with high ceilings. It was half of the first floor, and all knotty pine. The walls, the cupboards, the walk-in pantry, shelves that rounded the entire kitchen. That was the selling point. It was beautiful, and something you don't see much of in humble old colonial homes. Two small bedrooms upstairs with barely a hallway, both knotty pine as well, a little overkill, and also creepy for a bedroom that isn't in a cottage, but hey. My parents opted to make the whole semi-finished basement into their master bedroom. My mom was dead set on buying it and persuaded my dad. We still talk about how all of us felt this pull into this house. We moved in a couple of months later at the end of summer. My job that afternoon was to attempt to put mine and my brother's bed frames together with the headboard. I didn't know what I was doing, so I started stacking all the nuts and bolts to see how high I could get them before my dad finally came in to do it for me. My mom promised my sisters, who were directly across the hall from me and my brothers, that if they got the smaller room, they could paint it. So my brother and I got the bigger room, with one built-in dresser and a little small door that went into a huge attic, which was another room in itself. I haven't dared to go into the attic 
or even wanted to open the door, though. The door looked like it was meant for children, though, almost like an entrance to a treehouse or a door for a Keebler elf's hut, like on those cookies. I didn't like that, and I definitely didn't like that I had to sleep next to it. As I'm sitting there stacking nuts and bolts, I hear a woman clearly say, no. I look into my sister's room thinking that it's one of them, or my mom, but it wasn't. I would have heard somebody coming up the stairs and hit the hallway. So I turn around in my sister's doorway and I feel the air get thick. Like I could almost feel the body heat from someone standing too close. I can only explain the feeling as almost like that feeling when you can't focus because someone keeps fidgeting and moving around. I ran down the stairs and out the back door where my mom was smoking a cigarette, talking to our new neighbors. To them, I just looked like some kid running around the new house, but I was terrified. Fast forward to winter and we're all settled in. My godparents came over to give me a gift a couple of weeks before Christmas. I opened it and it was a lime green comforter that had football helmets of every NFL team. Cool, if I ever cared about football at all. It was big and warm, so it quickly became my favorite thing in the world. They left late and we were told since it's Saturday we can watch TV in our rooms until whenever. So I brought my new comforter to bed and turned on a nick at night, quickly falling asleep. I wake up and the TV is still on. Mind you, mine and my brother's twin beds are right next to each other and both are against a wall with a gap in the middle to get out. I look over at my brother and his back was to me. Then I go to look at the TV which is directly in front of us on the built-in dresser, and I adjust my eyes. I see a woman sitting on the edge of my brother's bed, dark long hair, what looks like a dark purple cardigan, and a dark floral skirt. The only light source was from the TV, and it was illuminating her features. I couldn't put into words or reference how she looked until recently when I watched the movie The Knowing, which is a horrible Nicolas Cage movie. But in the movie, you couldn't quite see all of the alien's face, just a silhouette of the light and darkness. That's the best way I could describe it. I see a ring that appears to be catching light on her finger. I have no clue if it was on her finger or if she was holding it. She just sat there on the edge of my brother's bed, head down and admiring this ring that was catching the light off of my television screen. She didn't seem to notice me. I tried to sink into my mattress and slip my head under my new comforter, and I just laid there, in shock. I waited until I heard my mom start the coffee pot to run to the kitchen and tell her what had happened. I even drew her a picture. She believed me. My dad, not so much. Almost the exact same experience happened again two years later, with my sister, when we switched rooms because two teenage girls obviously need a bigger space. There was nothing paranormal that we noticed happening in between those experiences. It happened and we would never bring it up. My dad's new and improved golf club had one little problem. There was a defect. The head was flying off left and right on numerous orders. My dad was back to being broke. You'd think a mortgage, a wife, and four kids would give him a little pep in his step to get a steady job, at least in the interim, but nope. Back to the drawing boards, and back to us kids helping clean banks with my mom on the weekends for extra money. The fighting started, the divorce happened, dad moved out, and mom stayed in the house with us. By this time, I'm 14, my first year of high school, and finally I could go out with my friends, even the ones who had cars. My mom started drinking heavily on the weekends around this time and would frequently call whatever friend I was with that had a cell phone and spout out her Taco Bell order because she knew we would end up there at some point before I came home. My sisters worked doubles together at an Italian restaurant every weekend, so my mom would always be home by herself having a pity party and getting drunk. My mom calls my friend and I tell her not to answer. I told her that I would just get the regular Supreme Burrito with no beans that she always orders. 
I get home and she's in the living room, and she starts telling me about a man she was talking to. He looked like a young Elvis, she said, and he sat in the chair across from where she laid on the love seat. She was drunk. I didn't pay it any attention. She was just rambling about a dream, I was sure. The next day, the friend who my mom had called came over and told me that she wanted to play the voicemail that my mom had left her when she called the day before. My mom had said, Hey, I just wanted to see what you guys were up to, and if you go to Taco Bell, could you get me the regular thing I ask for? Then the phone stays connected. She never hangs up. At first, you hear nothing. Then a conversation between her and a man. At points, she interrupts him, wondering who he is. You can't really tell what he's saying, only bits and pieces. But my mom's voice is clear. Then he told her at the end, as clear as day, Please, lay on your side just in case you get ill. I got instant chills. My friend was visibly disturbed, even after already hearing it, and I felt sick. We played it for everyone, and they all had the same reaction. My mom remembers none of it. She doesn't remember telling me about the man, and she doesn't remember the incident. We forgot about it, and we never talked about it anymore. My dad got sick of living with his own mother, and the house was in his name, so he legally kicked my mom out, and at this point my older sister moved in with her fiancé, and my other sister moved with mom to a house that they rented a few minutes away. My brother and I stayed behind because my mom got a job as a caregiver for that winter in Florida. As soon as my dad moved back in, things took a turn. He did not believe in ghosts. He was a huge skeptic until around 2007. He sat up in bed late at night and was smoking a cigarette. He had a big, solid oak sleigh bed, and it had a huge headboard. He started hearing knocks and felt the vibration on the headboard because his back was resting on it as he sat up. He stood up, and it stopped. He sat down and relaxed his back, back up against the headboard. Something started knocking, then pounding hard on the headboard. He stood up and came to the basement stairs and called us down there so that we could witness this, trying to make us believe in something that we already knew was there. A couple of days later, Christmas lights flew across the room like somebody had yanked them. A couple of days after that, loud sounds of what sounded like scraping metal across concrete came from the attic. A week later, my brother's sleeping and gets punched in the face. A couple of days after that, my dad's girlfriend sees a hand appear over him in bed. That upcoming weekend, the kitchen chair moved into the hallway while we were all in the living room watching movies. Coffee teaspoons and hairbrushes would disappear and reappear. Sounds of people going up the stairs. Friends who knew nothing about any of this would see what looked like someone walking back and forth from the upstairs bedroom. It got bad. We were all terrified. My dad was screaming into the void. He couldn't protect us or beat the ass of whoever was doing all of this. By this time, my dad was working, probably just to get out of the house, which meant he had to take plenty of business trips. While coming home from Virginia, Bate had it that at the airport, he met Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson from the sci-fi show Ghost Hunters. They were coming to investigate a haunted prison for the show. My dad just started watching their show because of all the things happening in our house and only went over to them with the sole intention of getting help for what we were going through. They set him up with contacts to a paranormal group that they knew well for our area. They came, they saw, and they told us that it was definitely paranormal activity. The psychic said that there was a man who liked to hang out in the basement and the living room, a greaser type, with slick back hair and cigarettes rolled in his sleeve, kind of like a young Elvis. Also, he loved my dad's new car. A woman who was reserved and quiet who liked the attic and the naughty pine bedroom was there too. An impatient and angry old woman who paces around everywhere and likes the living room was also there. The team set up cameras, tripods, and microphones around the whole house before shutting off the lights. The only things eventful that happened the night of was a camera and a tripod were thrown to the ground in the attic 
and everyone heard that metal against concrete scraping sound. It was so loud it sounded like it was in the middle of the room. They left, and when they came back a few days later, they had evidence. A woman's voice was caught saying no before the camera and tripod flew forward in the attic. The investigators, while bending down to go through the attic door to set up the tripod, said that one of the cameras in the naughty pine room caught a woman saying, crawl out, you have to crawl out. There were growls, there were snarky remarks said in the basement, and a man's voice saying, where is she? The investigators did the whole spiel, you're dead, it's time to go to the other side. It was a lot to take in. My dad, who was raised Catholic, asked if they could set up a home blessing, which we got that afternoon and we all had to take part in. It did definitely settle down after that. There are a lot more things that went on in that house, but I'm writing a novel over here. This house somehow sticks with all of us in my family. My friends still talk about the house. I dream about it all the time. It sounds funny, but there's a definite trauma that lingers when you spend your adolescent years living in a place like that. I think it's so strange, like it still has a hold on all of us. Everyone's pins, passwords, and top secret codes are the numbers of that address, still, and we haven't lived there since 2010. The weird pull that we all have to this house, telling each other when we happen to drive by it, the way we weirdly miss it, it's just strange. I grew up in southern Idaho, and I moved to Eugene, Oregon around age 20. We moved into our newly built home in the countryside at the start of the millennium, literally months after my grandma on my mom's side, who I call Nana. I was about eight or nine at the time, and I lived there until I was 17 when my dad kicked me out of the house. After that, I went and lived with my grandparents about five miles away, whose house was also haunted. They too had built their own home. To put things into perspective for some things that happened, our house was set five miles from any town in the middle of fields, with only a few houses about a half mile away. One of those houses was my cousin's. My uncle had built his family's house there, and my dad was really close to him, part of why we built there. It too had some weird things that happened that my cousins and I experienced. The first thing that was odd happened when we were moving our stuff from my dad's parents, the grandparents that I later lived with, into our new home. We lived in their basement, but it was a one-story house. I'm obsessed with Star Wars and had little ships that I played with as a kid. My favorite one was a TIE fighter. I was playing with it one day while the movers and my parents packed and moved things. At one point, I set it on a chair in my parents' room while I was alone downstairs. I ran out of the room, turned the corner, ran up the stairs, realized that I had left it on the chair, and immediately ran back. When I got there, it was gone. I had only been gone about ten seconds, if that, and no one had gone by me at any point. It was a small, narrow basement, so I would have had to have passed anybody who went to move it. I looked everywhere, and even emptied the entire room, but I never found it. The setting of our house was a two-story, three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath with an unfinished basement. My room sat directly above the garage, my parents' room above the living room, and the house was surrounded by one-and-a-half acres of lawn and about three acres of woods on one side, with fields on the other. My cousin's house sat between the fields and the forest, with a path leading between our houses. Growing up in our new home, we had some weird things happen every now and then that we all experienced at one point or another. Lights would turn on by themselves. We had security cameras and caught that several times. All of us would often hear the garage door open, a car drive in, and the garage door close. 
Then we would hear the door to the house open and close, often when somebody was gone. Sometimes only one of us would hear that. Other times, two of us in different rooms would hear it. My parents were very rarely home, so it was always pretty much impossible that somebody was in the garage. I like to joke that I was an only child raised by five cats. My dad would often hear loud music with a strong bass line when home alone. He would come out of the room thinking it was me playing music, and sometimes the stereo would be playing music, and other times it wouldn't, but every time he was home alone. When I was around 12 or 13, I used to spend the night in our guest bedroom that we had set up as an exercise room for fun and watch movies all night. That ended one night when I woke up sometime in the night to the TV turning off and on rapidly, even though it didn't have a remote. I immediately ran to my parents' bedroom and I barely slept that night. Later that year, I went to a summer camp at a martial arts studio with just a few friends. We played hide and seek, but got freaked out after two different TVs started rapidly turning on and off on their own even while we held the remote to both of them, with the batteries taken out. Since our basement was unfinished, we stored things down there. My dad is a slight bit of a hoarder, and had kept a lot of his art from art school downstairs. I admittedly went through boxes downstairs often, still looking for that Star Wars ship for years, but I never did find it. One time, my mom and I went to visit her dad in California. When we came back, my dad scolded me for taking all of his art out downstairs. I told him that I hadn't touched his art at all and actually didn't know that he had art down there, which was true at the time, as it was really buried under a lot of stuff. He said he'd gone down one night to find a lot of his paintings, drawings, and even a sculpture laying on top of boxes around one of the unfinished rooms, as though somebody had been looking at them. Even creepier was that while one sculpture was laying on boxes, Another, mind you, these were heavy plaster sculptures, was smashed in two on the floor. The downstairs always had a weird vibe, and after that, if you stood at the top of the stairs, it felt like you were being watched from the bottom. We had a few weird things that would happen outside our house, too. Since we had a massive lawn, we had a big sprinkler system that could run off the canal for the farms, or off of our well water. One summer, our pump was sabotaged at the standpipe by the canal. At the time, we thought it was a farm's kids playing a prank, and we just switched over to well water. A few nights later, though, we went outside for some reason, and we heard splashing water, almost like a geyser, coming from out of the dark. My dad went to investigate and found the test tap for our well full open, which was hard to do. We got it shut off, but for some reason our well pump seemed to be still running, so we needed to shut it off via a valve box in the ground. When we opened it, it was completely filled with dirt, and we had to dig it out. We asked around, but never figured out what happened. My cousin's house, like I said, was about a half a mile away, and I would often play with them. They said that they would hear screaming from their basement on occasion, and often heard footsteps coming up from the basement when no one was down there. On a couple of occasions, I would be at their house and see what looked exactly like a red laser pointer on the wall, as though someone far away was pointing it through the window, but then it would go up the stairs which was far above the window. Later, they moved out of the state, and it sat empty for a number of years. I would still wander around their house on occasion, and several times I saw this laser pointer. Mind you, like I said, we were out in the middle of fields and forest, with the next closest house at least a mile away. At night, lights in their house would be on randomly, and then off the next day or night. Growing up, we'd often visit my grandpa in Eugene, Oregon. He built his house as well, but it was a massive house that looked and smelled old. We'd stay on the second story in the bedrooms my mom, her sister, and brothers used to live in. I stayed in a small bedroom that had a walk-in closet with its own locking door. Weird, too, because it was locked on the bedroom side, and even had a latch for a padlock in addition. On occasion, I would wake up to find the door open, and then go back to sleep, and then it would be closed in the morning. 
Often I had nightmares in that room and would run to sleep in my parents' room. That stopped though because I would then have very vivid night terrors about their closet and wake up screaming. After that, I just put up with the weird walk-in closet in the other bedroom. I'm pretty sure my grandpa's house was haunted because my grandma was an avid antique collector for the entire time she was alive. A lot of stuff gave off weird vibes. My dad says that he often felt a cat jump into the bed, even after the cat died in that house. Lots of people have heard footsteps and felt cold spots throughout the house and sometimes you can hear whispering somewhere in the house, but never pinpoint where. The weirdest thing that ever happened to me, though, was right before my dad kicked me out of the house. Keep in mind, I get really dehydrated super easily, and I can easily drink at least a gallon of water a day. It's always been that way, too. I don't know why. One night, I had a dream that was actually very pleasant. At one point, though, I became extremely thirsty in the dream. I kept looking for something to drink, but I couldn't find anything. Then this really kind, beautiful lady showed up and offered me some Skittles. I know that sounds really dumb, but I really liked Skittles at the time. I started eating them, thinking that it somehow might quench my thirst. But I was still just so thirsty. Seeing this, the lady seemed concerned, so she kept giving me Skittles, and I would take them and eat them while just standing there smiling she would give me more. This went on for a bit, but then I realized my hand was hitting something in real life, which started to wake me up. I woke up with my hand hitting the wall because it was reaching off to the side of the bed for the Skittles and hitting the wall instead. When I realized this, I looked up involuntarily, and standing there smiling down at me with a white glow was the same lady. I just sat there for a moment, shocked, and then I bolted out of the room, ran downstairs, and drank some orange juice, and when I came back, she was gone. Over the years, I have felt bad for running out of the room, since it seems like she genuinely wanted to help, and she didn't seem malevolent at all. She looked to be maybe in her late 30s or 40s. I never saw her again, either. There were lots of little things, like stuff moving around and hearing it move at night. I would think it was my cats, but then I would find all of them asleep downstairs. Lights we thought we'd turned off when we left the house would be on once again when we returned, and doors would be opened that we thought we had closed. One cat that I truly considered mine and was close to had some strange occurrences around my parents. He would constantly try to get into my parents' bedroom, where one of our cats took up permanent residence the entirety of her life. All of our doors were round knobs, and my parents would lock their door at night. My dad has OCD and checks all of the doors and windows every night, so there's no way that a door isn't locked after he checks it. He'd often come back multiple times, too, and find them unlocked again even when my mom and I were both out of town. Anyway, my dad would often wake up in the middle of the night to see the door open, and my cat standing there as though he'd opened the locked, round knob door handle. It happened more than once, too. I never figured that out. My cat would also turn on faucets and flush toilets randomly. He was really smart. My cat died earlier this year, at the old age of about 20. On the night he died, I was asleep and felt a cat jump into my bed. I'm now living in Southern California, no pets, just a girlfriend that lives with me, and immediately come and cuddle up familiarly next to me. I even felt the warmth and was very happy. After a bit, it faded away and I came to my senses. I called my dad and said, he didn't die, did he? My dad said he had died just a few hours earlier. It hasn't just been houses that I've had stuff happen in either. On two separate occasions in two different apartments in two different states, I've been asleep and had an experience that I can only describe as attempted demonic possession. I grew up in an overly religious family, Mormons to be specific, but was never welcomed there. And I was often bullied for being the weird kid for, of all things, liking Star Wars and video games. Welcome to Farmtown USA, I guess. Around age 14, though, I stopped going to church, really, and became a staunch atheist. 
Around age 19 after college, I was still living in southern Idaho in my own apartment. One night, I woke up sweating, unable to get my body to move, but with my limbs shaking and flailing rapidly, almost inhumanly. It was extremely dark, and I couldn't open my eyes, but a slight slit before they'd close really tightly again. While all of this was happening, all hope and happiness seemed to drain, and I felt like I just wanted to die. Even being an atheist, I started to pray like when I was a kid. Within moments of starting to pray, everything went back to normal, and I was able to open my eyes. I let out a gasp like I hadn't breathed for minutes, and was sweating profusely. I got up and watched funny Netflix shows for the rest of the night. I experienced the same thing, but even more forcefully again years later. But this time in Eugene, Oregon. Once again I started praying, and again it receded after a few minutes. It's been five years since then, and it was shortly after that that my current girlfriend moved in with me. The last one I remember was at a work friend's house when I was 18. We'd gone over to fix her computer and was removing some viruses when I noticed that she was just standing at the door to her garage, staring intently at the door at the back of her garage. I asked her what she was looking at, and she told me that sometimes she gets weirded out by the door at the back of the garage. I went to look, and the moment I saw it, I felt like my spine had a current of electricity running down it. Having grown up with weird stuff in my house, I decided to investigate. The closer I got, the more intense the feeling. Standing in the frame of the door, it felt surreal. Almost like I was standing in some sort of otherworldly portal. Then, the moment I stepped onto the other side of the door frame, everything returned to normal and felt boring. I looked back through at my friend watching me, feeling kind of bored like nothing had really happened. The moment I stepped back through, though, the feeling of electricity flowing through me returned until I left the garage. These are all the experiences I can remember. I don't know if all of these houses are haunted, or my family's haunted, or I'm haunted, but what I do know, or at least what I think is interesting, is that everybody in my family built their own homes, yet they were all haunted. Maybe one of those things, or several of those things, followed me. I don't know, but these are my experiences. First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now, and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13-year-old's perspective, and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who is a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, 
any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn, so instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing. But that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing like 14 year olds do when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around, and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled. And that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl. We realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us they could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, 
which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us, so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with, and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside, thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us, and that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate, and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us, though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night. We went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree. I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridal path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, 
We'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile, and I knew what it was immediately. Death. Literal rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in a search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're going to find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day, reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods. Anyway, Brian is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is, unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. My name is Jordan. I was a young kid of seven years old when this all started. I have an older sister by one year. I'll call her Jess. We were both being raised by my mother. She began a relationship with her boyfriend that we'll name Derek. We moved into a house in West Bountiful, Utah. The house sat near a horse farm, which sat north from the house, away from the road about 50 yards from the back door. The house had two wagon wheels buried into the ground halfway for decoration, sitting near the street. We had an elderly lady as a neighbor who lived to the east of us. The next house east was my friend Brian's house. The house was kind of old, but still in good shape. 
walking into the front door, led you into the living room. The stairs to the right led upstairs, where the bathroom was first on the left, followed by my sister's room to the right, then my mom's room on the left, and my room on the right at the very end of the hall. Past the living room was a kitchen that, to the left, led to the driveway, and to the right led downstairs to another living room. This was adapted into a place where I had my Nintendo 64 set up on a tiny TV. While going down the stairs, there was a crawl space to the right, next to the furnace. Since I was seven, I can't recall how long we lived in this house before things started becoming strange. But to my mom and sister's recollections, the first oddities we noticed was that deep into the night, the toilet would flush randomly. I never noticed this, since my room was farthest from the bathroom, but my sister and mom were both convinced that I was being mischievous and doing it. I do remember them asking me if I really needed to pee last night, but I said that I didn't know what they were talking about as I hadn't left my room. Weeks later, the toilet flushing became a common occurrence at night. I heard it happen as I was walking to the bathroom one night, so I turned around and went back to bed, obviously nervous. The next day, Derek said it had to be pressure in the sewer, causing our toilets to flush. I took his word strongly since I thought he knew all things about plumbing. But the toilet flushing started to become boring, I assume, for after a pause in the activity, the faucets in both the bathroom and the kitchen were both suddenly blasting water out of them. The knobs opened up completely. Derek sprang awake to the sound of rushing faucets and quickly shut them off. After he turned off the kitchen faucet and was walking back upstairs, the toilet flushed as he passed by the bathroom. I slept through this entire ordeal, but my mom said that it pissed him off so much he actually kicked the bathroom door. The faucets joined the toilet in becoming a common plaything at night, and all of us felt pretty uneasy about it. I'm not sure in which order the next parts of the story should go, but all of this happened in the span of about a year, six months into living in that house. My friend Brian came over, and we were playing Smash Bros on my Nintendo 64 in the basement. After several matches, he needed to use the bathroom, so he got up and ran up the stairs. I kept playing. He came running down the stairs. I thought he was excited to keep playing, but he stood there next to me, breathing heavily. His eyes were as wide as dinner plates. He stumbled over his words and asked if there was something wrong with my bathroom. Before I could say anything, he starts frantically explaining that the toilet flushed right before he got to the door, and that as he was done and was leaving, the faucet turned on full power right behind him. I told him that that's happened many times before, but only at night. Brian wanted to go back home after that. He didn't even look back as he walked down the street. I was sad. I was sure that Brian wouldn't want to hang out anymore after the house had scared him. This was, from what I recall, the first time that somebody from outside the house experienced its oddities. I told my mom about it, and she said that it was strange it had happened in the daytime. There were other times that my sister and I would stay weekends with our dad, every other weekend usually. On one of these weekends, my mother and Derek were in bed. She can't recall what time at night it was, but out of her sleep, she could hear the soft sobbing of a woman. She laid there half asleep, wondering if she had left the TV on in the living room. But the sound wasn't coming from downstairs. It seemed to be coming from the room they were sleeping in. The sobbing became more pained and louder. Derek bolted awake, thinking that my mom was hurt. But then they both just sat there in silence as the sobbing turned into a cry of unimaginable pain, as if the woman was either being tortured or in pain of losing a child. Derek quickly got dressed, saying that the neighbor lady next door might be hurt and might need help. He ran out the front door and over to the neighbor's house, but by the time he got to her door, there was no screaming or crying. He slowly walked toward the house, 
and the crying got louder. There was no mistake that it was coming from our house. Derek checked every square inch of the house when he got back, but there was no one in it except for him and my mother. As soon as it had appeared, it stopped. My mom says that that was one of the hardest nights sleep in her entire life. One that I was present for happened about a month after the night of the crying woman. It is, of course, the dead of night, and we're all sleeping in our rooms. Suddenly, my mom and Derek were awoken by a blinding light, as bright as a lighthouse. My mother and Derek sprang up and tried to find the light switch in the house, but as they flipped it on, the light stayed. Derek thought it was a semi-truck shining its brights through their window, but as he opened the window, he realized that their window faced the horse farm. They had no window facing the streets at all. As soon as he spun back around from looking outside, the light died out. I remember the commotion afterward. Derek was running all over the house in a panic. He checked the fuse box, grabbed his tools, and tore apart their light fixture at 3 a.m., trying to find any logical explanation and shouting in frustration the entire time. My mother would stay up late most nights. She loved her horror movies and crime shows, so she'd watch them while we were asleep. It wasn't far from midnight when my mom heard the voices of children giggling. The only light on in the house was the TV. She assumed that my sister and I were trying to scare her, so she pointed at the stairs and said, Both of you, go to bed now. The giggling continued for a little longer, before my mom stood up and marched up the stairs. But no one was there. The giggling, though, was getting louder. She finished climbing the stairs and opened my sister's door, only to find her fast asleep in her bed. She checked into my room and found me the same way. After she went down the stairs again, the giggling finally stopped. My mom claims that afterward, she sat there and thought of the woman crying for a while before this occurrence, and thought that these children giggling had some morbid connection. My mom caught the elderly neighbor one morning in her driveway, and asked if she knew anything about our house. The lady said she lived on that street for half of her life, and never heard or saw anything bad happen inside of the home. Just families, moving in and out over the years. We never looked further into this theory. The time passes, and we now refer to our ghostly friends as the kids and the lady. The kids loved to play around in mine and my sister's rooms. They'd open and close our closets, slam my sister's hope chest to startle us, and still loved to play with the toilet at night. Of course, now being eight years old, I had a constant, uneasy feeling in that house. My mother would assure me that our ghosts were a happy family that needed a place to stay, but this didn't settle my fears at all. I had grown accustomed to having multiple light sources in my room, a lava lamp, two plasma balls, and a fiber optic light. All of them were on the headboard of my bed, and I needed these on at all times to feel comfortable enough to sleep. When they were on, I never had anything bad happen in that room. My mom and Derek understood that I needed them on, and never touched them while I slept. But, from time to time, I would wake up and find that some, if not all of my lights, had been switched off. Not just the power strip they were plugged into, but the little manual clicky knobs on the wires themselves had been turned off. I'd usually wake up late into the night to pitch darkness, and scramble out of fear to get all of my lights back up and working. One night, after turning them all back on, I noticed the closet door, which had been closed when I went to sleep. It was wide open, but that was all. The next part is rather hard for me. Even as I tell this story now, I have goosebumps all over. I had a very gruesome dream that I could only describe as a horror that no young boy could ever dream of on his own. I was sitting in a room in the house in dress clothes, and I was crying. Loud bangs to the door of the room, and a hellish scream echoed through the empty room, and I huddled into a corner and screamed. 
The room went dark with a shadow as the door opened. I couldn't see what was in the doorway, but I kept screaming for whatever it was to stay away. Silence fell. For what seemed like an hour, I sat there in the corner, staring at the blackness of the door. Suddenly, people came walking through the shadows. They were all of my family, from my mom and dad to my sister and even a couple of cousins. I didn't leave the corner to greet them. They all just stood there, staring at me with pale faces and glazed eyes. My sister smiled eerily at me and would take stiff steps toward me. I would scream, and she would step back and giggle. My dad walked up to me, towering over me. As he knelt down to my level, his eyes went from glazed and dull to being a void of darkness with small glints of light for pupils. I cowered in fear, turning my head from him. He then grabbed the top of my head and forced me to stare him in the face. Then he said, you have to say your goodbyes or they're going to be lonely in heaven. Jess screamed in a shrieking voice as my dad grabbed me by my ankle and held me upside down. I was equal height to his face now and I could see all of the faces of my relatives at that moment. They all had the same eyes as my dad but had gaping and bleeding mouths almost like their jaws had been nearly torn off. They all chanted the word heaven over and over as they carried me into a living room where a bed was set up. In the bed was a corpse. It was my sister. Still held by the ankle, they held me above her corpse. I remember every detail of her face. Her skin was olive green and white. It was cracking in places, and her eyes were cold and cloudy and lifeless. I stared at her face in shock and disbelief. One of her eyes moved and stared back at me before she suddenly sprang from the bed and wrapped her arms around me, pulling me into the bed. She screamed and shrieked as she wrapped her rotting fingers around my neck and began to choke me. I screamed with my last breath for somebody to come to my rescue, but at the last moment I saw my sister placing her thumbs over my eyes and pressing in. I felt the pain of my eyes popping, and all I could do was scream. I was suddenly woken by my mother. I was apparently shouting in my sleep and flailing uncontrollably for several minutes before she got me to open my eyes. Not to my surprise, my lights were all off. I could barely see my mom's face as she held my head in her arms. I was in complete shock. I was shaking violently, unable to speak darting my gaze over every inch of the room, looking for the demons that nearly had me. I struggled to grab my mom's arm and stuttered, asking where Jess was. At that moment, Jess, who had been awoken by the noise I was making, flipped on the light as she walked in. Upon seeing her, I broke into a nervous breakdown. I tried to crawl away from her, still choking on absolute terror and unable to scream. I grunted and wheezed at her, tears pouring down my face like a waterfall. My mom told Jess to go back to bed. Jess left the room, and my mom asked me if I wanted to stay the night in her bed. I couldn't answer. I was still in shock. She picked me up out of the bed and took me into her room and put me in the spot next to her. She threw blankets over me and said to try to get some sleep. I laid there, shaking like a leaf the dream playing on repeat through my head as I trembled. Not even being near my mom made me feel safe at that point. I remember being like that for hours afterward. The exhaustion finally caught up to me, and I fell asleep once again. My mother says that when she looked at me the next morning, she noticed that I had slept through the remainder of the night, with my eyes open. I woke up a couple of hours later in a haze, my entire body felt heavy and weak. I made my way downstairs to where my mom and sister were. They asked me what I dreamt about. It all flooded into my head again, and I started crying hysterically. It would be several years later when I finally told them what the dream had been about. My mother called my school and let me stay home that day. She asked if I was hungry, but food was the last thing on my mind. 
She led me to my room and said I should have a nap since it's daytime and things will be more peaceful. I laid in my bed under the covers and wept. A chill ran through my spine and I stopped crying. Listening carefully, I could hear the whisper of a child. Shh, don't worry, it'll be okay. I laid there frozen. I slowly pulled the blanket from over my eyes, only to witness my closet door slowly closing itself. I stared at it quietly for some time before hopping out of bed and running down to the living room. I didn't tell my mom about the closet or the whisper. I knew she would just blame them on the dream I'd had. So I kept that one a secret for a couple of years. My mother believes me now, though, now that I've told her everything while we were sharing our experiences. Weeks later, my Aunt Dana stayed with us for a week. It was a weekend where we were going to my dad's house. My mom and aunt were alone in the house while Derek was at work. My mom was watching General Hospital and my aunt was using the shower. My aunt came running down the stairs out of nowhere, pale as a ghost. She asked my mom if she had walked into the bathroom a moment ago. My mom said no, of course not. My aunt described looking through the foggy shower door and seeing a woman with blonde hair in the bathroom staring at the mirror. My mother has brown hair. She then turned and walked out without making a sound or speaking a word. My aunt stared back up at the bathroom and said, There's something very wrong with this house. She's not the only one who's ever said those words. I got my friend Brian to stay the night at my house with the promise of late night gaming. He remembers the incident from before and asked how it was living in a haunted house. I said it's not all that bad, jokingly, of course. I didn't tell Brian about any of my personal stories in fear that he might end our friendship over it. The night hit about 11 p.m. and we switched from games to cartoons. We both fell asleep with the glow of my tiny TV upon us. Everything was fine until I was shaken awake by Brian. He was hysterical. He grabbed me and pulled me close and said, I hear them. They giggle at me when I'm sleeping. There's something wrong with this house. I want to go home. Please let me go home. His scream woke up my mom, and she ran down the stairs to find Brian hyperventilating. She grabbed all of his belongings and walked him out of the house after he calmed down and down the street to his own house. She came back and said that Brian's dad didn't want his son to come over anymore just to get scared to death. I don't really blame him. He still came over sometimes, but he never stayed the night again, and he especially avoided the basement from that time on. There were a couple more parts to the story, but they played out in similar fashion to most of the other activity. My mom's relationship with Derek came to an end, and we were packing up stuff to move to a different city. After all of our belongings were removed, we walked slowly through parts of the house, talking about our stories of creepy happenings. My sister and I, feeling a bit brave due to us leaving and never coming back, had a surge of courage to ask the kids if they liked playing with us. It was dead silent in the house. My sister and I giggled to each other and said they probably hated playing with us because we were annoying. My mom says she felt something a bit different, almost like there were a couple of people who were sad to see us go. Derek also felt the same vibe. But after two years in the house in West Bountiful, we left. My mom and I still bring up the stories from time to time. We both get goosebumps from the blinding light story, and she's blown away by how terrible my dream was. I recently revisited that dream a month ago, not to my choosing, of course. Played out the exact same as that night when I was eight years old. Only this time I woke up calmly and shook it off. It was after that dream that I decided to write about what I can only describe as a ghost story. It may appear as fiction to many, but to us, it was a living reality. It saddens me that we didn't do more research into the house to see if there was ever a problem or a tragedy there. I don't live far from there currently, but there's a good chance that the house and many others were demolished in a housing project. Either way, I feel it's best left as it is.
a creepy story. I'm 26 now, and I have a love of horror movies and creepy places. Maybe my exposure to these terrifying events flipped a couple of adrenaline switches in my head. I still don't have a definite answer as to whether ghosts really do exist, but I can't deny what we went through in the West Bountiful House. Back in 2013, when I was 28, I was traveling through Jujuy, a remote northwestern province of Argentina for school. We traveled through a few remote villages along the Andes Basin, which consisted of crazy dramatic rock formations. The first village was called Purmamarca. The place we stayed at did not have electricity. It only had cold running water and no Wi-Fi. I must admit it was pretty awesome living off the grid and actually conversing with friends and telling stories by the fire. Now, fast forward two days. We arrive at the village of Tilkara, a couple hours north. The hostel we stayed at was quite a bit more modern, yet still pretty rustic. Tilkara was yet another beautiful dust bowl of a village, surrounded by colorful dramatic mountains and alien geography. When I say alien geography, I literally felt like we were on another planet while driving through it. This place did have TV, Wi-Fi, and warm water. We did a lot of exploring that day, hung out with llamas, visited ruins, things like that. That night, we had a traditional Argentine asado with our group around the fire in the common area outside. My roommates, two girls from Illinois and one girl from Germany, all turned in early for the night at around 11. I stayed out for about an hour afterward, hanging out with my teachers and talking. They were drinking Fernet, a nasty, minty Argentine drink that I had tried previously and will never touch again. The following day was going to be a long one, since we were hiking up a mountain, so I did not partake in libations. I started getting tired, so I decided to turn in as well. My roommates were all laying down watching TV, and as soon as I got in, I got ready for bed. Shortly after, we all decided to call it a night. I fell right asleep. Later, I randomly woke up because I had to pee and I checked my phone. It was 5.37 a.m. As I set my phone back on the nightstand, I suddenly felt something staring at me from behind. The pull of the gaze was so strong I could feel it through the blanket. It was almost like a magnetic energy. I could feel anger and negativity emanating from it. I felt frozen in place for a few seconds. I managed to turn and peek over the blanket to see a dark figure standing at the right corner of the end of my bed. The figure was about six feet tall, with really broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any distinguishable features like eyes, etc. Its body was black, but seemed to consist of static. The static was like that of a TV channel, where the signal is out. Black and dark gray instead of black and white. And it moved a lot slower. It just stood there, not budging at all. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, frozen, too scared to move. Suddenly, I felt the same pull from my left side. I turned, and I saw a similar figure, but slightly shorter, standing at the foot of the German girl's bed. The one and only small window in our room was above our bed, casting light straight ahead, so I know it was not a trick of the light. Multiple times I have thought maybe I was dreaming, but I couldn't have felt more awake. If I was dreaming, it was the most realistic lucid dream I have ever had. I laid there staring at both figures, casting my gaze from left to right, until I did what any normal person would try to do to protect themselves from scary things at night. I pulled the covers over my head. I'm not sure why I was not more proactive 
considering the fact that there were two strange beings in the room, but I didn't budge. I waited for what seemed like another eternity. The entire time I had to pee like a racehorse, eventually the presence of whatever beings were in the room gradually faded, and the embarrassment of possibly peeing the bed forced me to peek up from the covers to see if the figures were still there. They were gone. I waited for a few seconds to see if they were somewhere else in the room, but when I didn't see anything, I got up, raced to the bathroom, and turned on the light. I peed while peeking my head out the door to make sure nothing was there, and afterward, I ran to the bed, hid under the covers, and fell asleep with the light still on. The next day, I woke up and still considered that maybe the entire thing was just a weird, bad dream. The two girls in the bed across from me asked why the light was left on in the bathroom, and I proceeded to tell them what had happened. The German girl was taking a shower at the time. Their response was to laugh at me and jokingly ask me what kind of drugs I was on and how much I had to drink. Granted, I was not much of a drinker. I hadn't had anything to drink that night, but I could see how they came to that conclusion considering that I was hanging out a little later with people who were drinking. After the German girl got out of the shower, the other two girls, who were still laughing at me, told her about how I had seen a ghost last night. Her face instantly drained of color. She looked over at me and said, You saw them too? I asked her what she had seen, and where, and she said that she saw two guys in our room, and pointed out the exact locations where I had seen them. I asked her what she did, and she said that she saw them, and then tried to just go back to sleep because she was so scared. The general consensus of the girls in our room was that the two men in our group creepily came into our room last night, but I didn't believe that. The body shapes and sizes were not consistent to either of them, and I just couldn't see them doing that in general but who knows? I told my teachers and the hostel owner of my experiences. The teachers also laughed, but the hostel owner brushed it off and said that it was quite normal and that people saw things there all the time. Just another night in Tilkara. Apparently, that region is quite popular for UFOs and is also on an indigenous burial ground. So, they may have been aliens or angry native spirits or something else. It wasn't so much that I could see these beings, but I could feel them. Their presence was one of the strongest things I've ever felt in my life. I felt them before I saw them. If I was ever skeptical of otherworldly beings before, this experience completely changed my mind. Whatever they were, I have zero doubt that they were something from beyond. Beyond where? I have no idea. What's really weird is that when I returned to the United States, I found myself often waking up at 5.37 a.m., multiple times a week. I had never had this happen before that. To this day, it still happens. This happened about two years ago, nearing the end of September. My aunt and her friend decided to fly up to New York from Panama to enjoy a mini vacation with my parents and I. Although many strange and paranormal experiences have happened to me ever since I was little, this event stayed with me and affected me more than the other experiences. A lot of things have happened to my family members, especially my aunt and her friend but that's for later. So it was around 10.30 at night. Keep in mind that my old neighborhood was a very calm and quiet place. Since I live near the countryside, not much action happens in the neighborhoods. The neighbors were either elderly or young couples with smaller children, none that really caused trouble around the neighborhood. There were only about 20 to 25 houses in the entire neighborhood that I lived in. The three of us decided to stay up late and watch scary movies, 
while my parents slept upstairs in their room. My aunt's friend was sitting near the slide doors leading to the backyard, while my aunt and I were sitting in the bigger couch near the front door. I was sitting on the left side where the door faced, and my aunt sat on the right side of me, which meant I was closest to the front door. We spent about 10 minutes debating on which movie we should watch. After those 10 minutes, we finally chose to watch Odd Thomas, which wasn't really a scary movie, but it was about a guy who could see spirits and demons. We were only two minutes into the movie when I had the sudden urge to look at the door. I glanced back at my aunt and her friend, only to see them staring at the door as well. I looked back at the door for about five seconds, and then a loud bang came, then another one following after, and then a third. All three bangs came from the front door. It was like five people had just body slammed into the door three times. I thought it was going to fly off its frame. My first instinct was to run to the kitchen and grab a knife. But as I was about to do that, my aunt grabbed my shirt and told me to stay down. As I looked to my right, I saw my aunt's friend with her knees to her chest, rocking herself back and forth, while my aunt just kept her gaze toward the door. While all three of us kept our attention on the door, next to it there were two small rectangular windows on either side. The right window had a small curtain, and the left was being covered with a small decorative tree. The small curtain had a gap in between because it was glued onto the windows from the top area to the bottom, leaving the middle part loose. At the moment of the bangs, it caused the middle area of the curtain to puff up slowly and then quickly press against the window, leaving it wrinkled. After that, we were all silent. All of us were terrified. My aunt denied being scared, but at that moment, I could see nothing but fear in her face. I wanted to run upstairs to get my parents, but I was too afraid to go up the stairs because it was right in front of the door. All I could do was text and call them, but they were too deep in their sleep to hear the phones ring. My aunt told the two of us to calm down and dismissed it as wind. We all knew that it couldn't have been, but in order to stay calm, she made up that excuse. It was totally cliche. The next morning, I told my mother about the previous events. She brushed it off, saying that it must have been a bear or a deer. Another cliche thing to say. We both went outside to inspect and found my mom's decorations near the front of the door thrown off to the side. There were no scratch marks or bumps on the door. Everything seemed normal, except her decorations laying to the side. When the three of us looked at the door, the night of the event, there wasn't anything that could have caught our attention. The woods were 40 meters away from the house, and we would have heard the trees moving with the wind if it was that but we heard nothing. It was so strange how we all felt this sudden urge to look at the door at that time. It was like we all collectively knew that something was about to happen. The bangs were extremely loud and caused me to jump up from the couch. It couldn't have been kids playing a prank on us because I had been living there for about three years and nothing like that had ever happened. Plus I knew the neighbors well enough to know that they would never do such a thing. There were exactly three bangs, one after the other, and one could have honestly caused the door to fly out of place, but thank God it didn't. What about the curtain? The only explanation that we could come up with was that the impact of the bangs created the wind, causing the curtain to react that way. But why did it inflate slowly, as if the bangs were rapid, and then suddenly cause it to go against the window so fast after they were over? My aunt thinks that the wind must have been knocked off its course, and that's why we didn't hear the trees moving. And it created huge columns of wind that must have caused the doors to move so much. The gust of wind must have gotten inside the house from the cracks of the door, leading to the curtain being puffed up. Personally, it doesn't make sense, and it sounds like total BS to me. She also mentioned that she saw a shadow outside, 
but she doesn't have an explanation for that. I didn't see the shadow, though. My mother came up with an excuse as well. She said it must have been a deer or a bear. But why would a deer or a bear bang their head or body into a door? Like I said previously, there were no scratch marks to prove that it was an animal. No animal could have caused those three loud bangs. We've had deer sightings in that neighborhood before, but none have ever exhibited that kind of strange behavior. If anything, they run away from you back into the woods. Bears are out of the question. Not once has there ever been a sighting of them around where I am. I should also mention that we had the lights from outside on. So why would an animal come that close to a house, especially a door, that's clearly being illuminated by a light? Like I said before, the animals in this area are pretty skittish and are generally out of the question. As I mentioned, my aunt, along with my mother, have had many unexplained experiences, and they do believe in the paranormal. I think the only reason they tried to make up an excuse for this situation was to prevent me from becoming paranoid and afraid. It's pretty late for that now, though, since I've had my fair share of experiences as well. My aunt's friend has seen some things, too. My aunt told me that when her friend was younger, she suffered really badly from night terrors. She said that she saw things, demonic identities as she described them. She would wake up screaming and crying. It was traumatizing for her. Her family had always been religious and they prayed for her every night and slowly those things haunting her went away as she grew up. That really creeped me out and led me to believe that she might have brought or attracted that thing to my house. Or maybe it could have been something else. Whatever it was, I hope it never happens to me again. And if you know what it was, let me know. This story happened many years ago, around the months of June and July. My family and I often go up and vacation at a cabin in Yungaburra, Cairns, Australia during the winter. We do this as we miss the cold days that we would get from our hometown of Toowoomba during the winter, as Cairns is tropical, so it's summer 24-7. Yungaburra is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that if you blink, you'll miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical with about 150 or more years of heritage. As usual with rich heritage and small towns, local folk legends from over the years accumulated. One of these legends ended up coming true. We rented this cabin that was on the brink of bushlands and it was next door to an old farmhouse that has quite a bit of land including some of the bushland the cabin backed onto. To get to the cabin, you had to walk up a somewhat steep dirt road that also leads to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium-sized pond that ran along it. This dirt road came off one of the main streets of Yungaburra. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungaburra. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He, on the other hand, did not have anywhere to drive the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. It got to about 11.30 and I decided that I'd better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15 minute walk, so after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized that not driving was a dumb idea, as it was about 5 Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper on and that was it. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder and I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway and God did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was very wrong. After I turned my flashlight on, fog started to roll in. At first it was only light fog, 
but it continued and developed into heavy fog. And then it surpassed heavy fog. And then I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, well, here we fucking go. Something's about to happen. Get it over and done with. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew that there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom and the last thing I wanted was to fall into it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance, a small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard, Son? Is that you? Come here out of the fog, follow the lamp. It was my mum. I couldn't yet see her, so instead I followed the light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up the steps and I heard the door open, so I knew that I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction that I had seen it last. I was calling out for my mom to turn it back on, and there was no reply. I finally ran into a wooden guardrail, literally, and some steps. I walked up the steps, and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I wasn't home. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swaying open in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There are three things you do in this type of situation. The three Fs, if you will. Flight, fight, or freeze. And I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mom's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then that I realized I would rather be out in the fog than standing on the doorstep of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs. I heard the voice now yelling, My son, where are you going? I started to sprint, but as I was running, I smashed my foot and leg against some sort of stone and fell flat onto the ground. It took a chunk out of my knee and I had cuts all along my hands. I still have some scars from it. I turned around and realized that I had not tripped over a stone. Well, not any stone. I had tripped over a tombstone. At this point I screamed, got up and started to run even more. I was screaming for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped. I thought that I got far enough away from the house. Until... Little amber lights, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and ran for it. Yet again, I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the metal at the end was just my life. Before I knew it, slam, I ran straight into a wall with my head being the contact point. I blacked out and from what I can remember, I was woken up by my dad who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently, when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night, and any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me some time to rest. This also gave me time to ring up my friend so he could come over, and perhaps give me some insight into what I had experienced and what my dad saw. He and I sat out on the patio. I could see the farmhouse only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend, according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first ones built, late 19th century, during the 1910s or something. A well-known mother, Anne was her name, had let her son play with some of his mates down on the main stretch of town one day. It started to get late, and as it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then, heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go looking for him. As she walked down, she could hear his footsteps, and she told him to follow the lamp. 
When she made her way back to the house, she was not accompanied by her son. It wasn't until the next morning that they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He had hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently that of her sons. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late, cold, dark nights, mistaking them for her own lost son. The young Abura fog is one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. I've gotten used to generic things, stuff moving, stuff missing, shadows, all that sort of thing. So I wanted to share something truly unique that happened to me. I studied at a university in Malaysia. I was away from my family, thousands of miles away. This started very early on when I moved there. Our campus was away from the city. As international students, we would be stretched thin for money to get to the main city. So most of my time was spent in my hostel room. One night, around seven or eight, two friends and I were coming in a borrowed car when the car suddenly stopped. We got out to see what was wrong. As soon as we got out, the car started on its own. We thought it must be some kind of mechanical issue. We didn't know anything, so we sat back in. The car stopped again. My friend kept turning the ignition, but it wouldn't budge. We decided to get out and push it. Like I said, we didn't know anything and the car felt like it was a cement block. The friend driving got out to help, and as soon as he stepped out, the car started again, with the hazard lights flashing and the lights on full beam. We started freaking out. None of us wanted to sit in it now. We waited until a few cars passed, flagged one down, and asked the people to help us. Somehow, we got to campus and just went to our rooms that night. I couldn't sleep. I kept feeling like somebody was in the room with me, moving with me, looking at me. I kept looking up suddenly to catch someone, but there wasn't anyone there. In the morning, I asked the others, but they didn't experience anything. So I shrugged it off and come nightfall, I started to feel uneasy again. I played music in my room, but it didn't go anywhere. I showered, I prayed, I tried to sleep, but still, the feeling doesn't go. My bed was up against a wall, and I slept facing the wall. The whole night, I could feel someone standing behind me, looking at me, willing to turn. This keeps going on for a few days, to the point that I play a TV show in the background, and I would wake up after five or six episodes had passed. No matter what I did, the presence didn't go. And then, something happened. One night, I'm struggling to sleep, when I feel something or someone pulling my sheet away. I scramble to hold it, but my body is paralyzed. I can only blink my eyes. I lie there as the whole sheet is pulled off of me, trying to recite something, but then being unable to. That's when the whispering started, like multiple people whispering in slow, angry whispers. I couldn't make out anything. I even wet the bed and then lay there paralyzed for I don't know how long. My phone's alarm went off and I could finally move. This became regular. Then I would have episodes of paralysis and hear these whispers. My grades declined and I was exhausted. One evening, I just picked up my stuff and went to sleep in my friend's room, who was almost always high. He looked at me as I came in and said, Who are the other guys? There was no one. I called him a bloody stoner, rolled up, and went to sleep. The next morning, I wake up for class and he's getting ready too. And he brings it up again. He says, Your new friends are weird. They just sat there all night beside you, staring at you, didn't even respond to me. I just looked at him and it did not look like he was joking. 
At this point, he was sober too. I quietly take my classes and call my dad afterwards. He tells me to take one of those small ayatul kursis, some lines from the Quran, and stick it outside my door. So I do that. And that's when the shit hits the fan. I don't want to change my room because it's a long process. I'm angry now because this is my space being invaded. I have the ayatul kursi and I've lost my patience. That night, I sleep soundly until there's a knock on my door. I'm still not sure if everything that happened was real or if I was in a trance. I got up and opened the door and there's a man standing there. I'm not sure if he was old or not. He was very tall with his entire body covered in tattoos. He had no eyes. I'm not sure what they were. He just points to the paper stuck above my door and makes this guttural sound that rocks my literal bones. He keeps pointing at it with this weird scream coming from him. I don't know if anyone else heard it. If it was a dream or what really happened, I just know that I removed the paper and he came in. I remember waking up the next morning in my bed, angry at myself. I started finding these small things in my room, dead birds, old bones of small animals, broken combs, sometimes burnt paper. I would just throw it out because now it was a fight with them. Then one night, I decided to stop sleeping facing the bed. This is my room, my space, and I'm not letting them bully me anymore. So loudly I say in my native tongue, Something that means, do whatever you can, I'm not going anywhere else. I pray and I go to sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night with all of my room lights on, and I see something that I will never forget. It's the same man offering a Muslim prayer in my room, in the wrong direction. He's doing all the same motions. I can hear the sounds, but he's facing the wrong way. I don't know how long I lay there, barely able to breathe and unable to scream, until the man, sitting there, turned around and stretched his arms toward me. But they weren't arms. They were these long, black, snake-like looking things, like they could strangle me in a few seconds. In my heart, all this time I was reciting something. I could feel my tears on my pillow, and I lost all memory after that. I woke up in the morning with scratch marks all over my body, like a bunch of cats had been let loose on me. My bed sheet smelt like old blood. That was it for me. I couldn't go on like this anymore. So I contacted my cousin, who put me through to somebody I could talk to. That night, I decided to go sleep in a mosque. It's common in Malaysia for guys to wear a, I think he called it a dhoti, but I'm not sure, over shorts if you're praying. I prayed, I used mine as a sheet, and I went to sleep in the mosque's courtyard. It's hard to believe the next part, but I'll leave that up to you. I woke up in the same exact place that our car had gone bust that first night. I woke up to these strangers, shaking me awake, asking me if I was okay. Someone suggested calling the police. Some turned out to be my seniors and I got a ride back to the hostel with them. After that, I started sleeping with different friends until the scholar was put through to me. He came and spent a few hours in my room, and after asking around a bit, we learned that the student before me who lived there used to practice black magic in the room. He even used to write with his own blood on the walls, and administration just painted a new coat on top of it. I don't know what happened to that room or who got it. I was shifted to another one, quietly, on the condition that I would never speak about it. And that was it. No more sleep paralysis or whispers or visits or scratches or waking up in new places or the smell of blood. I still have dreams about it. And to this day, I don't look into mirrors for too long.
I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal. My alarm went off at five. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55, and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning, and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about 7, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had street lights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no street lights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far-off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about ten feet behind her, when we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to ten yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. 
The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time, and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, It's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane, and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, some she tells us about, others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. 
To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances. And since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the son was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down, and that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong, and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me, and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside, and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said, or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. In this tale, Reddit user expert maybe 5106 tells an eclectic mix of tales that happened at their haunted house. Here are the stories. My house has been haunted all my life. It started in the apartment I lived in as a kid, but it followed me to where I'm currently living. In the past 10 years, I've experienced more paranormal activity than most people have in their lives. It started with an attachment I had from using a Ouija board at 11 years old. Since I have so many paranormal experiences to share, I'm going to limit this story to the things that have taken place in my current home, with a focus on the most significant things to take place here over the years. To preface this, I'd like to say that I'm a 21-year-old female, but when I moved into my current home, I was 13. I was living with both of my parents, four cats, and a dog. Now it's just myself, my dad, my girlfriend, three cats, and a dog living here. The history of the house isn't overly important. We bought it from a family, the woman that lived in the house had been moved to a hospice where she'd passed away, and her kids were selling her condo. Her name was Helen. That is as much significant history as there is to my current home. Outside of that, it seems that the entities in our home aren't necessarily attached to the location as much as they are attached to us. A little background on the spirits in my house. I know Helen is here. She has been heard by multiple people. She has a distinct old lady perfume smell and a calming feel that comes along with her. 
we also have an unknown number of spirits or entities in the basement. I have a hard time explaining them, because I don't know if there are multiple male human spirits, or one inhuman spirit making it seem like more than one. But whatever it is, it feels dark and masculine, if that makes sense. Helen mainly stays upstairs, and whatever is dark typically stays in the basement. The main floor is typically more poltergeist-type activity. That being said, on to some specific experiences. I'm going to start with the most asked about thing that has ever happened to me. Anyone who knows me or hears about this asks me about it. So, one day I was probably around 14. I was in my bed late at night, responding to Snapchat streaks, but being a teen laying in bed, makeup probably off, I didn't feel like sending pictures of my face or really putting any effort in. But I also didn't want to just send a black screen. So I was taking pictures of my bedroom door because our hall light was on. After snapping and sending a few photos, my camera started to struggle to focus. It wouldn't take the picture because it just kept trying to focus. Finally, the picture took and a dark black figure was peering in at me in the photo. It was out of focus, of course, but I freaked out. I looked up and saw nothing, so I snapped another photo, and that one came out clear, and there was no figure. At that time, I'd say that was the beginning of things taking a turn for the worst. A few days passed, and I had gotten three scratches down my back in the shower. My aunt had heard about what I was experiencing, and had a friend who was a Wiccan priest or something come over. I will say, I wasn't necessarily open-minded to Wicca. It seemed like BS to me at first, but this man had told me that there are ways that we can open portals between our worlds and others. Sometimes intentionally, but not always. He told me that candles give off a pure white light, but when set in front of a mirror, that light doubles and turns impure or dark. It's hard to explain, but as I understood it, a candle alone equals good, and a candle in front of a mirror equals bad. He said if you have a candle in front of a mirror and look into that, it can open a portal to darker dimensions. Again, as he was first telling me this, I was thinking that it was BS. But then I remembered just days before I had seen the figure in my bedroom, I had taken a photo sitting in front of my bedroom mirror with a candle darn near in my lap. He told me to throw a sheet over the mirror without looking into it and get rid of it or remove it, whatever I had to do. My dad did so, and the second the sheet covered the mirror, the power went out only in my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. That was when I started to take this Wicca stuff more seriously. A little while passed and things seemed a little bit less dark or aggressive, but something was definitely still there. That's when the event occurred that caused us to call a priest to come bless our home and myself. I had been home alone one day and had an experience that is hard for me to explain. Other people will simply say that I was possessed for a few hours but for me, it's more confusing than that. I have a lapse in time, in memory, where people are telling me that I did things that I don't remember doing. I remember being on FaceTime with my best friend. I had walked into my upstairs bathroom, which is weirdly a hot spot for activity in the house, the same room that I got scratched in. After walking into the bathroom, I don't remember anything else until hours later so what I'm telling you from here until I snapped out of it was told to me by witnesses. My best friend said that while on FaceTime, the lights began to flicker in the bathroom, and I just stopped talking, and it was like I was staring up ahead past my phone. My friend asked me what was wrong, and I responded with, I can't leave. There's someone blocking the door. Right away, she knew something wasn't right, and told me to just go out, but I guess I ended up hanging up the phone. 
We had another friend who lived like two blocks away from me. So my best friend called her and told her that she needed to go check on me. When she got to my house, she looked for me everywhere. Upstairs, main floor, basement, every room. But I was nowhere to be found. Just as she was coming down the stairs to leave, she saw me standing in the middle of the main floor. If you walked into my house, you couldn't have missed me. So she asked me where I'd come from and that she'd been looking for me. She said I responded so calmly and eerily that it wasn't even like it was me talking. I told her I had been in the bathroom and she said, no, you weren't. I just looked in there. Once she said that, she said that I completely changed and she could tell that it like enraged me or something. I told her that she needed to leave and apparently I even said, you aren't welcome here. Being a 14 year old girl talking to one of her best friends, that definitely wasn't like me. She tried to argue over leaving, but apparently the more she did, the more aggressive I got about telling her to get out. So out of fear, she left and she and my friends just kept trying to call and text me to snap me out of it. Three hours passed and no one knows what I was up to. But I posted a picture on my Snapchat story of myself in the mirror that was covered, you know, the portal mirror, with the caption saying something about it being time to stop being scared or stop running or something super creepy. The next thing I remember is sitting on the couch, and the best way I can describe it is this. It felt like waking up from a nap, except that I didn't remember falling asleep or even going to sit on the couch. After that, we did a little bit more research and we talked with the Wiccan priest. I ended up finding out that I had an attachment that I created, like I said, with that Ouija board at 11. And then I just strengthened it with the mirror portal. I was blessed and so was the house. And for a long time, things were better. My house though is still extremely haunted and I could share a lot more about it. Little things here and there, like hearing a deep guttural growl coming from the basement stairs, my dog not being willing to go in the basement, hearing voices being touched, objects moving, stuff like that. But this story is about the craziest stuff that's happened to me. My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother. And he found this house. And what's crazy is that my name is Ashley and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community. So of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys. So there were four kids all together. We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated high middle-class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99 and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. 
my dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it, but of course my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place, picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me. But every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry. So we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman, probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. And I went into his room. Jerry was still asleep and there was no woman in there. So I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there. So we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks and you might hear bumps in the night just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise, almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18 month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four. Because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work, and so was my dad. Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school, so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this. You get home from a stressful day at school and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove, like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. My dad, of course, got home with the cops and the cops came in and did an investigation. 
all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it, that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I gonna do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon, he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other, just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard, and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, so did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. It wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m. and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door. So when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again, thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it. But nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything, and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time, but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. Probably about another hour went by, with nothing, no knocking or anything. But just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so is the kitchen and the fire and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school. So I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could like speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something, or as she would say, departed. When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed. The fire. The bed breaking. The knocking. The giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after, and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more, 
So I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed, and a few hours later, the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs, and we decided to go over everything with him, from the fire to the glass to the bed breaking to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face, and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch, and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled, and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, dad, let me just relax while all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. Anyway, we looked up the address on a background search for properties and we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliché, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids, and then set the house on fire and shot himself. Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway... That was the haunted house on Ashland Street. I have never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado that has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom, bathroom, a sort of living room area with a couch and TV, and a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt, uncle, and grandparents every summer from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now. The basement became more or less the guest room, so that's where I would stay whenever I would visit, so that I could have a little space of my own. That and the fact that their cat rarely ever went down to the basement and I am severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time that I was 17 or 18, and my younger cousin, I'll call her Megan, was around 16 or 15. The night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something, and then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So, my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours, drawing and just hanging out, when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat coming from the bathroom. 
I knew it wasn't her, since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time, and her mouth hadn't opened at all. And she also knew it wasn't me, since I was in the middle of speaking. And of course, neither of us are old men. We both paused and then confirmed that we had both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to, there's a man hiding in the bathroom, since they had had some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows. I wanted to go upstairs and get one of her older siblings to check it out, but Megan insisted on checking it out ourselves. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet which had the door closed. She opened the door and we saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force, only to discover that it was just some blankets spilling over the lower shelves that we had forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough come from what sounded like the entrance to the basement. We slowly crept out of the bathroom, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word, both started packing up all of our stuff, like our sketchbooks and my laptop. And rather than leave the basement, we just went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor length mirror in the room which we used to bar the door. We did all of this in complete silence, some weird primal understanding going on between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced that there was a living person in the basement with us since the sounds were so clear and the feeling of there being someone else down there was so strong. Megan settled onto the bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking, since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up to come down to our rescue, but there was no reply. Megan even texted her mom, but still, nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain that somebody was down there with us. While we knew that there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. For some reason neither of us really understood, we were so terrified of making any sort of noise that we made sure to walk on our tiptoes and take steps at the exact same time to minimize the amount of sound we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax still being kind of terrorized by the sounds of someone shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that also acted as a window for the basement bedroom and begin running around. The rocks at the bottom were moving and bouncing off the window, and then it went silent. About 10 minutes later, it sounded like another animal had fallen in and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much that entire hour. The entire time that all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended or right as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster hill. Just plain fear, anxiety, and the subtle feeling that something is just not right. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement, and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven. The sun started to rise, and we heard my uncle get up to take the dogs out. 
Neither Megan nor I had slept at all, and we suddenly felt exhausted as the adrenaline that had been fueling us the entire night seemed to die out. The sounds hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now, hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little bit safer leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then, on the count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point the basement was fully illuminated with the sunlight and the lights that we had left on when vacating the living room. We booked it up the stairs and came to a screeching halt in the kitchen where her dad was making coffee. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement, still not fully convinced that it wasn't a normal person. He checked and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with and the entire basement was empty. Megan made some ramen for breakfast since we were starving and just wanted something comfortable. And after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs, eating and trying to come to terms with what I had just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first, but when I told the same story and Megan almost started crying from not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then, later that year, she experienced it for herself. The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense, and there was just this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there, and that whatever it was, was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorized that it was Theodore, the name they had given the resident ghost that stays down there, but I don't think so. Nothing like that has happened to anyone else ever again, and it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what was down there with us, or who. I don't know why they were there or what they wanted, really. But there was something with us that night, and it scared me in a way that I have never, ever felt since. I am a 23-year-old female, and my husband is a 23-year-old male, and recently we moved in with some roommates. They are James, male 26, Danielle, female 25, and their young daughter Sarah. We went from living in a decent-sized city to living in the middle of nowhere, about an hour away. For context, we live in the south of the U.S., so it's rural, woodsy nowhere. We're really good friends with our roommates, and husband and I knew beforehand that they had both experienced some paranormal goings-on before we made the decision to move in. To be honest, I think husband and I forgot all about the paranormal stuff just before we moved. Everything was great when we were settling. We all got along really well, and it was so amazing to be in a place where we had our own space and were on equal ground with our roomies. Then one night, about a month later, husband, James, and I are all lounging in the living room area. Sarah was asleep in her room, as it was late. We're talking about the paranormal. Around 11.30 p.m., James has to go pick up Danielle from work. She works the late shift, about a half an hour away from us. As James is getting ready to leave, he mentions skinwalkers. Now, husband and I don't use this word. For those of you who don't know, speaking aloud the word skinwalker or wendigo is sometimes believed to attract these deadly creatures to you. Husband and I had strange and horrifying experiences at the last place we lived after one of us made the mistake of saying it aloud. So we don't say it anymore. Our code word for it is flush pedestrian, if you're curious. As soon as James said it, I gasped. He laughed it off. But right before he left, 
he noticed something through the blinds on the back door of the house. He mentioned that he thought there was somebody in the backyard. In truth, we don't really have a backyard. The back of the house is right up against the edge of the woods, but we just call it the backyard. Husband and I, thinking that he's messing with us, laugh it off. Quickly, though, we can see from James's face that he is not. We rush to look through the blinds, and sure as heck, there's something in the trees. It was incredibly hard to see, but it was a very, very tall and thin figure, darting quickly between the trees. It kept itself completely shrouded in the black shadows, and we couldn't make out any other features. James rushes outside, thinking that it's somebody on the property. Husband and I follow, not wanting him to be alone. I stay on the porch while husband rushes down the steps to follow James as he goes behind the house. The second he leaves my eyesight, James immediately turns around and shakes his head at husband. He tells us that as soon as he got to the edge of the trees, he heard a low voice saying, turn around. I come from a pagan background. My mother is Wiccan and my husband is also pagan. As James leaves, the husband and I finish our cigarettes. I immediately set out to bless the entire house with sacred oils and blessed salts. I had already done this as soon as we had unpacked the last of our things, but I felt it necessary to do again. I went so far as to bless the entire porch as well. As husband and I are doing this, James texts me that he doesn't feel safe and that something isn't right. When I ask him what he means, he writes that just a few miles up the road, a naked man came charging out of the woods and stopped at the edge of the road. When he locked eyes with James, he simply pointed at the car and kept doing so until he was no longer visible in the rearview mirror. We tried to rationalize that it could be one of many non-paranormal scenarios. We thought it might be a prank, but that didn't quite make sense. It was the beginning of a very cold winter, and it was only about 20 degrees out. It would have been a lot of effort and discomfort for this man to pull a prank like this on passing drivers. Then we wondered if the man needed help or was possibly in danger. But James was sure that this man did not look at all like he was in distress. If he was, the man would have yelled or tried flagging down the car instead of just pointing at it. The conclusion we came to, for the time being, was that he was most likely on some substances. We don't live in the safest of places, and hard substances are very common around here. Then James texted that he had picked up Danielle, and more weird things were happening. I asked him to elaborate, but he said that he would explain it all when they both got home. As their car pulled up in the driveway, husband and I went outside to meet them, but the two of them quickly got out of the car and rushed toward the house, telling us that we all needed to get inside immediately. When inside, James explained that right before he got to Danielle's place of work, he saw something in a cow field that he can't explain. It was tall taller than any human could possibly be, and much taller than the thing that we had already seen behind the house. From what he could tell in the dark, it was gray, and it was running, running faster than he was driving at 60 miles per hour, on all fours. And then it ran into the woods out of sight. When he was driving back with Danielle, before James could explain everything that had already happened, she got a sinking feeling in her gut and made James lock all the car doors. A literal second after James complied, the same creature he had just seen was once again sprinting alongside the car. It was much closer to the road than it had just been minutes before, but it dashed again into the trees before they could get a really good look at it. We were all a bit shaken. It was now close to 1 a.m. and none of us could explain anything that had already happened. We tried to brush it all off, and we probably could have, if it was just one thing that had transpired instead of several. We made the awful decision to go back outside for a smoke. 
The kind of decision that only idiots in horror movies would make, I know. And that's when things got really weird. Off to our right, there's a small strip of woods that separates our property from our landlord's property, where he lives with his daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughters. In those trees, we notice three sets of eyes. They're glowing yellow-green, and they're just staring at us. Husband asks James if it could be deer, as we do tend to see a lot of those around, but we all knew that whatever those eyes belonged to were far taller than deer could be. Then, to our left, there's more, you guessed it, woods. From that direction, in the pitch dark, I swear I heard a little girl laugh. It wasn't boisterous or loud, more like the snicker that a child makes when they're trying to suppress their laughter. Danielle and husband didn't hear it, but James did. Now we're looking at the big tree to our left that stands just before the edge of the woods, and notice that there's this big black mass behind it, as though something was crouched next to the tree. We all try to rationalize that it's just a big bundle of leaves, but I don't think any of us really believed that. James and husband both dart back inside for a moment, and when they come back out, James is holding a hatchet, and husband is holding his crossbow. Without saying anything to Danielle or I, they step off the porch and walk toward our left, where the little girl laughed. Later, they told us that they thought a child was in trouble and they wanted to help. While Danielle and I were on the porch, trying to figure out what the heck was happening, we see something a few yards away. Down the driveway, there's a huge tree in the middle of the property. Out of our peripheral, we swore that we saw something duck from behind the tree. We kept looking at the tree, and yes, there was something poking its head up from behind the trunk, pulling back very quickly as soon as it realized we were staring at it. At this point, Danielle and I wanted to get inside. We're both shivering from fear and cold, and we just wanted this night to be over. But while Danielle and I were in a match of paranormal peekaboo, husband and James had their own very weird experience. For context, I have Tourette's syndrome. This means that I say and do things completely out of my control, and some of my verbal tics are just strange sounds. Some of those sounds include blowing raspberries or popping my lips, which are my two most common verbal tics at the moment. As James and husband are inching closer to the trees, they both hear footsteps through the grass and leaves within the trees. Both of them were too frightened to call out to whoever they thought was in there. Then they hear shuffling. The problem is though, they each hear shuffling coming from different directions that the other doesn't hear. James was walking to the left, husband to the right. James hears shuffling coming from the right, but husband doesn't hear it. But husband hears it coming from the left and James doesn't hear it. So they turn toward each other with their weapons drawn. In their confusion, while they're facing each other, they hear someone running in the woods, full on sprinting through the trees, heading directly toward them. And then it just stops. They take a step back and watch to see if anybody comes out of the woods. No one. But then they hear something in the woods. They hear me in the woods right in front of them. They heard both of my verbal tics, but the problem was I was standing on the porch behind them. Without turning around, husband calls to me and asks if I just had a tick. I told him no. They back away from the woods without taking their eyes off of that spot until they're close enough to sprint into the house, pulling Danielle and I with them. Inside, Danielle and I are able to tell them about the thing behind the tree, and James and husband are able to tell us about how something mimicked my tics to a T. For the rest of the night, we didn't go back outside. We would all, against our better judgment, peek through the blinds out the back door when we passed it. There was still something in the woods every single time that one of us looked. I didn't get any sleep. 
Come morning time, husband and I checked all the places that we had seen or heard something, and there was no sign of anyone or anything. I asked my mother what she thought it might be. In her opinion, it was likely something related to a mimic spirit, a spirit that warps reality to feed on fear, but not having enough power to really hurt anybody. She said that it couldn't be a skinwalker because there were too many things happening in too many different places all at once. Skinwalkers are solitary and territorial things, so it couldn't have been multiple of them. But just one mimic could do all the things we experienced. We still hear the occasional giggle in the dark, get a bang or a knock at our back door. We still even see the thing behind the big tree in the driveway almost every night. But that night was something else. I've seen some things in my life, but never, never have I gone through about three hours of non-stop activity. I've since burned sage all throughout the house and the entire perimeter of the property, as well as using the rest of my salt and oil around the entire house. Husband and I even did a late night EVP session at all of the spots that things had happened that night, but we didn't get a single response to any of our questions. I don't know for sure if it was a mimic spirit, or if I can fully rule out a skinwalker. I don't even really know if the thing was dangerous or not. But one thing's for sure, I will never forget that night. This story might be a bit long, but it's something that happened to me years ago, and I'm still very curious about what it could have been. When I was about 13, I was in a relationship with a girl that I visited pretty frequently, almost every day after school if I could. Due to me visiting her so often, I got to know her and her family, as well as her home. They were very kind people, but just a little off. At the time, I wasn't a very religious person. However, my girlfriend and her family were Satanists. When I first heard that, I thought it was a joke, but soon I realized that they were being serious. I wasn't too surprised or bothered by it. She later told me that the house was haunted, and me being the biggest skeptic kind of just brushed it off and showed interest so we could keep talking. After a while, I started to notice things in the house that were a little bit unsettling, but I was quick to dismiss them. I figured anything had a logical explanation behind it, so why try to claim that it was something paranormal? At first it started with small tapping sounds. To be honest, at this time, I thought it was just the house settling or creaking due to the wind. We live in Florida so it wasn't too hard to believe that some weather could have caused the house to make noises. That's what I believed, since it was the most logical explanation. That was until we heard scratching coming from inside her closet. We thought it was her cat at first, especially because he would constantly bring her into the room and she liked to explore. We also thought maybe she had snuck in and we had closed the door on her, oblivious, and it took her until just that moment to try to get out. Obviously, we got up and opened the closet door, but nothing was there. This was very peculiar, but I shrugged it off and figured that maybe it was a mouse or a rat in the walls. She pointed out, though, that there were scratch marks all over the closet. They weren't high up. If anything, they were about level with a common cat or a small dog. But like I said, the cat wasn't in the closet. It wasn't even in the room. Needless to say, I was weirded out. I wasn't scared, but I was starting to believe that something wasn't right. I don't know exactly what was wrong, but I was starting to feel off after this. Weeks go by and even months go by. Some minor things keep happening. Mostly just the scratching, which has pretty much torn up the paint in the closet entirely at this point. But also other things like the cat acting strangely, and a weird sense of unease when you're in certain parts of the house. Particularly the restroom, the garage, and the master bedroom. I just assumed that it all had a rational explanation, of course. 
I wasn't sure of what it was, but I was stubborn and dumb. One day, though, something was especially creepy. So creepy to me, in fact, that I had actually started to question whether or not there are such things as gods, demons, ghosts, etc. Something that will stick with me forever. One day, my girlfriend had invited me over, so I asked my mom and she dropped me off. I noticed that there weren't any cars in her driveway, which wasn't really weird since her family did work often or were out shopping a lot. My girlfriend opens the door after I knock and lets me in. First thing we did was head to her room to watch Third Rock from the Sun. While we're sitting in there, we make some small talk and go to the kitchen to grab some food. And then we go back to her room to keep watching TV. At some point though, hours later, we end up shutting off the TV and just start talking. Out of nowhere though, we hear her older sister yell her name from right outside her door. We assumed they were finally home from wherever they went and we went out there to check up on them. Weirdly enough though, we didn't see her. We checked everywhere around the house and didn't see her at all. We even yelled back but got no response. We chalked it up to us maybe hearing something else and just assuming that that's what we had heard instead. Like maybe there was a noise and we thought we heard her name. Like I said, stubborn and dumb. We head back to the bedroom and sit down, but this time we leave her bedroom door open just in case her sister really did call for her and attempted to do it again. After a few moments, we hear her sister call for her name again. However, this time it didn't seem like it came from behind the door. It sounded as if the entire house had called her name. Not only was it so loud and so clear, but it didn't change its tone or pitch. It sounded like it was a repeated audio recording from the last time she had called for her. Once again, we quickly bolt up and search around the house as fast as possible. We thought if it was her sister trying to play some kind of prank, we would find her, but we didn't see her. We couldn't even trace where the sound had come from, so we checked in all the areas where somebody could easily hide. Being dumb, we once again said it was probably nothing to worry about. About an hour or so goes by and we hear her dad's truck start to pull up to the house. We check out the window to watch them and the rear passenger door opens. It's her sister. We were baffled to say the least and wondered when and how she had left so quickly. We met them at the door and asked her what it was that she had kept calling for and how she'd gotten out and ended up with her family. She looked at us with confusion and concern. What she and her dad told us makes me anxious to this very day. She said that she'd been gone since six in the morning doing some shopping. We immediately tried calling her bluff, but her dad doubled down and seemed to get a little bit annoyed by this and told us that they were indeed out shopping all day. Right after he told us this, we told her sister that we had heard something that sounded exactly like her voice calling for my girlfriend. And we tried finding whatever it was, but we came up with nothing. Something about this must have really alerted and worried her sister, because after we told her this, she immediately went pale and looked sick. She told me that she would like to speak to my girlfriend in private real quick and brought her to the back porch. I went back to my girlfriend's room and just sat on her bed waiting for her to come back. After about five or 10 minutes, she came back and looked a little concerned while also downplaying what had just happened. I asked her if everything was all right. She said, yeah, she asked if we had gone into her room. I told her I did and she got mad. She told me though that if we ever hear her voice while she's not home to not go in her room. I guess right above her bed is an attic and she told me how one time she was sleeping, she'd woken up in the middle of the night and saw the attic right above her bed was cracked open and she saw her own face staring back at her from inside the attic. This story is entirely true and something that has stuck with me for years. I'm 24 now, and though it's been a little over 10 years, it still feels like it happened yesterday. I 
I don't have many memories of my father because he died when I was just eight years old. However, I do clearly remember the night several years later when he let us know that he was still around and watching over us. First of all, you need to know something about my father. He was fascinated by the supernatural and by the possibility of some sort of existence after death. After it became clear that he would soon lose his battle with lymphatic cancer, he told my mother not to worry. He said, if there's any way for me to reappear after I die, to let you know that I'm okay, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll visit you and the kids all the time. It's going to be so cool. My mother said her response to that was a pointed and succinct, don't you effing dare. It wasn't that she didn't care what happened to him after he died, or that she didn't want him watching over us. She just knew that she wasn't going to be able to emotionally deal with that situation, and she promised him that that's how she would react. My father followed through on his promise. The story my mother told us was that she was in their upstairs bedroom a few months after his death, thinking about him and crying because she missed him so much. Then she suddenly had the distinct feeling that she was being watched. She turned her head and saw my father standing outside the bedroom window on the balcony, clear as day. He looked healthy and alive. He was wearing a bright blue suit and gave my mother a look that said, is it okay if I come inside? My mother said she stared at him for a moment in total shock. She deliberately blinked her eyes to make certain that she was really seeing what she was seeing. And when she opened her eyes, he was still there, smiling and waiting. That's when my mother followed through on her promise. She closed her eyes tightly and said out loud, I can't handle this. I'm sorry, but I need you to go away. And please don't ever do this again. After about 10 seconds, she opened her eyes, and this time he was gone. This next part of the story takes place a few years later, and I kind of have to set the scene for you. I took a bad fall while playing soccer, and the impact totally destroyed my shoulder. I broke it in two places, and every ligament and tendon was torn. The reason that this is important to the story is that my shoulder hurt so bad I couldn't easily walk up the stairs to my bedroom, which was across the hall from my parents' bedroom. I was temporarily sleeping in the guest bedroom downstairs, and my brother had the bedroom we shared all to himself. That bedroom was right above the guest bedroom. In the hallway outside the guest bedroom, there was a sideboard with shelves on top and drawers below and on those shelves was an old mantel clock. It looked a lot like somebody cut off the very top part of a typical grandfather clock, and it was small enough to fit neatly on the shelf. The clock had to be wound every so often with a special key, which was kept in one of the drawers below. And when it was properly wound, the small pendulum would swing back and forth to keep the clock going. My dad loved this clock, and while he was alive, he made sure to wind it so that it never stopped. After his death, though, my mother never wound the clock again, and it eventually did stop. So this clock had been completely silent for years. Late one night, I was trying to go to sleep, but the pain of my injured shoulder was terrible, and it was keeping me awake. Plus, as a kid, I had terrible anxiety. Even with the bedroom door closed to help me feel more secure, I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the unfamiliar surroundings of the guest bedroom and being the only person downstairs. Just as I was finally feeling like I might be able to sleep, I heard something in the hallway outside the bedroom door. I was immediately freaked out and wide awake because my mother and brother were still upstairs. The stairs in this house were very squeaky and I knew for a fact that I had not heard anybody walking down them. It sounded as though someone or something was messing around with the sideboard. First, I heard a drawer open and then shut. After that, I heard a loud click, followed by a strange sort of grinding sound. Then there were a couple of more clicks, and suddenly, the clock that hadn't made a sound in years started ticking. 
That sound I heard before wasn't grinding. It was winding. Someone took the key out of the drawer, opened the clock, wound it, and started the pendulum. Apparently, they also put the key back in the drawer where it belonged, because that's where we found it later. At this point, 11-year-old me was not only wide awake, but I was also scared as hell, and hiding as far beneath my covers as I could go with a broken shoulder. After all, when you're a child, covers are magical and repel all things evil, right? The next thing I heard was somebody walking up the stairs. Then everything was quiet for a short while. Soon, though, I heard footsteps moving around all over the upstairs. I even heard someone directly above me open and close the creaky sliding closet doors in my bedroom. After that, I clearly heard footsteps come down the stairs, someone open and then close the door to the guest room where I was struggling to breathe inside my cover cave, and then soon after, the footsteps returned up the stairs, and finally all was silent, except for one thing. The clock continued with its relentless tick-tock, tick-tock. Eventually, sleep caught up with me, and I didn't wake until my mother came to check on me in the morning. While we were eating breakfast that morning, my mother looked at me and paused for a long time. Finally, she asked, were you up and walking around last night? I told her I was not, and then I described to her all the noises I had heard. My mother told me she heard noises during the night too, and had searched all over the house to see who it was. It was her walking all around upstairs, opening and closing the squeaky closet, coming down the stairs, opening and closing the guest bedroom door, and then going back up. So who made the other sounds we both heard first, we wondered. And why was that clock ticking? Suddenly, my mother's eyes grew wide. Oh, my goodness, she said. Last night was the anniversary of the night your dad died. I think it must have been him trying to let us know that he's still watching over us. And with that, we both went to look at the clock, which was still ticking. Thanks, Dad. Message received. We love you, too. And we miss you. I went to Sydney, Australia and tried the ghost tour at Q Station. Weird things happened there. Despite having a comfortable flight from Manila to Sydney, I still felt tired. After passing through immigration, I immediately went to the arrival hall, loaded my Opal card, and rode a train to my mate's flat in Burwood. It was raining when I arrived in Sydney. At only 18 degrees, the warm shower and the bed were the only two things that I looked forward to. It was still raining when I woke up. The overcast weather made the day bleak and gloomy. Then, I just remembered the things I watched online a few days ago, and one of them was the ghost tours in Sydney. I asked my mate about it, and the next thing I knew, he already booked us an extreme ghost tour on a weekend after my trip to Melbourne. Sydney was not a glamorous city back in the 19th century. Diseases such as smallpox, Spanish influenza, and bubonic plague were prevalent. To mitigate the spread of these infectious diseases, all ships entering Sydney Harbor must be checked by the doctors. Even if there was only one sick passenger on board, everybody was required to stay at the quarantine station for 40 days. Those who were sick were brought to the hospital for treatment. At least 16,000 people were brought here from the 1830s to 1984. 570 people died here. Today, Q Station serves as a hotel, a conference center, and a part of Sydney Harbor National Park. Our extreme ghost tour was scheduled at around 9 p.m. To beat the weekend traffic of North Sydney, we left Burwood at around 6 p.m. and drove all the way to Manly. We had our dinner there before heading to Q Station, located east of Manly Beach. We arrived at half past eight, way too early for the tour. 
so we went straight to the front desk and toured around. Some of the original relics, like tombstones, luggage, and clothing are still there. It felt eerie upon seeing those personal belongings that once belonged to people who got quarantined here more than a hundred years ago. Disclaimer. We met up with the group at half past nine. Our guide, Bob, told us that we should not rationalize everything we would encounter during the tour. Jace and I are both air traffic controllers, and in our line of work, we rationalize everything. This time, we would have to leave everything behind and open up our senses. We were given EMF, or electromagnetic field, sensors. This instrument detects an anomaly of the surrounding electromagnetic field. Experts believe that ghosts manifest themselves as a form of energy. First stop, the chamber. The tour started inside the chamber. There are two rooms. Both aren't that big, with a floor area approximately 50 square meters. We were locked inside for at least five minutes, just to observe everything. I didn't feel anything in the first room, except that it faintly smelled of hay. I didn't mind it because I thought it used to be a barn. But in the second room, I felt something. The surrounding air felt heavy, and I felt an unknown force pressing on my cheeks. It was quite difficult to breathe at some points. As we went out, Bob told us that it used to be a gas chamber. About 40 people were locked inside for sanitary reasons. Now, it all made sense as to why it felt so heavy inside, and why I felt claustrophobic inside the second room. The second stop was the hospital. It was quite a long hike to the quarantine hospital. During the early days, it was harder to get to the hospital. You would need to climb the steep walkways. Basically, when you're on top, you're completely isolated. The hospital is located near the cliff overlooking Sydney Harbor. There are several buildings around, including the quarters of the nurses and doctors. Hospitals, no matter how modern their facilities are, can get creepy at night. But this one was way creepier than I thought. We first entered the doctor's quarters. It was dark, but cold inside the room, and there were three bunk beds inside. As I sat and leaned on the lower bunk bed while listening to Bob's stories, I felt something was pinching my lower back. I shrieked, and Bob caught my attention. I told Bob that it was nothing. I lied. We went into the main hospital room. It was quite big, and there were six beds. Feeling brave, I lied down on one bed and tried to make some connections. I don't know how, but I just closed my eyes momentarily. I felt nothing, and honestly, the bed felt soft and comfortable. I transferred to an adjacent bed near the wall, and the moment that I lied down, it felt weird. It felt like something was pushing me, but not in a forcible manner. The room is connected to another room that had a darker history. Bob told us to open the door and asked if we felt something different. Everyone told him that it was colder in that room, despite the doors and windows being tightly shut. Some of our EMF detectors went crazy. According to Bob, there are four resident ghosts inside this room. Two children who love to play hide-and-seek inside the cupboard. A woman, and a malevolent spirit of an old man. There were stories circulating around that one group who stayed overnight in the hospital decided to record themselves singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and they caught something on the recording. They heard children giggling, a woman saying, wait, wait, and an angry voice of a male shouting, get out. Jace had his EMF detector pointed near the cupboard. It went crazy, so what he did he got his phone and started recording himself singing the same song. Actually, we were all at the center of the room, and we didn't hear him singing. After we went out, we played back his recording. Believe it or not, he caught something on his recording. 
There weren't disembodied voices from children or from the women. But in the middle of his singing, someone was shouting in the background, F you, your singing stinks. Things got real. The third stop is the Gravedigger's House. The Gravedigger's House is one of the most haunted parts of the complex. It's so haunted that Bob won't dig deeper into its bloody history. It used to be the house of, of course, the Gravedigger and a doctor. Just a few steps from the house is the third class cabin. During that time, there were reports of missing girls and children. Eyewitness reports claimed that they saw some kids and girls entering the grave digger's house. More so, the doctor was attached to the girls, especially the young ones. The house is a bungalow. It has two bedrooms with a small living room, dining room, and the kitchen and the bathroom are located at the back part. Bob left us in the house for at least 10 minutes. The first room to the right used to be the bedroom of the doctor. As I slowly entered the room, the atmosphere drastically changed. It felt cold and sad at the same time. I don't know, I just couldn't help but be sad in that room. I went out right away because I couldn't take the sadness any longer. The second room was rather weird. I was about to enter there, but something felt wrong. It felt like there was a force barring me from entering. Some of my group mates checked their EMF and it went a bit crazy. I guess everybody was not welcome to come inside. The back portion, where the kitchen and the bathroom are located, was the scariest part of the house. It was dark, but that part of the house was faintly illuminated by the moon outside. I stayed there for at least three minutes, just to observe. I suddenly felt goosebumps all over my body. As I neared the bathroom, it felt sinister. I didn't go inside because my instincts told me not to. I managed to take photos inside the house. My phone didn't catch anything paranormal, but all the photos are super creepy. When everybody is outside, Bob confessed that the bathroom was the most haunted part of the house. Locals claimed that a girl was brutally murdered inside the bathroom and that she got strangled by barbed wire. Fourth stop was the morgue. Firstly, I never like going to a morgue, especially if it's dark and abandoned. I was very nervous the moment that we entered the morgue. To add to the scare factor, they had a mannequin lying at the center, covered with a white cloth. I know it's staged, but it still creeps the hell out of me. While Bob was talking about history, it started to get cold, but weirdly only on my right side. No one was standing to my right. There was nothing there but a door that led to the laboratory. A cold breeze passed through the door. I wasn't paying attention to Bob's story, because I felt like somebody was standing beside me. I whispered to Jace about it. So he scanned his EMF, and suddenly there was a spike of energy. He told me to calm down, but I was so close to breaking down. As minutes went by, I started to feel goosebumps on my right arm, and I could feel that somebody was actually touching my arm. It was like a gentle caress, but definitely not human. I became uneasy after we went out of the morgue, and Bob noticed. He smiled and said, the resident ghost liked you, didn't he? Really, Bob? The fifth stop was the shower block. The shower block is the most haunted place in the whole Q station. During that time, those who were sick had to take a shower of carbonic acid, not water, at the shower block. The acid killed fleas and ticks in seconds. Two days after, your skin starts to peel off. It was dark and eerie as we entered the shower block. The stench was still there, and I felt lightheaded. The same feeling when you just got out of a boat ride. Bob told us that there are shadows lurking around the dark corners of the shower block. For 15 minutes, we were instructed to roam around and observe. He told us to go to the corner where we felt the most uncomfortable. I had goosebumps as we passed by the center aisle and turned right, since we both felt uneasy on this side. As we were walking back to the center aisle, I felt that somebody was watching us from behind. 
so instinctively we turned our heads slowly, and there we saw a dark figure peering from the corner of the block. I am pretty much sure that my mind was not playing tricks on me. The figure was tall, about seven feet, and it was darker than the dark. All of a sudden, it came right after us. I don't know what happened next, but Jace and I were back at the main door of the block in a jiffy. Whatever that thing was, it scared the crap out of me. The tour lasted for three hours. It was already 12.30 a.m. when we went back to the parking lot, safe and sound. I honestly don't know what to feel after the tour. I was physically and mentally exhausted. Nonetheless, it was a great experience. It finally validated that I am sensitive to the paranormal. I do believe in ghosts, and I don't easily get scared by them. But my experience at Q Station was overwhelming. A lot can happen in three hours. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, that bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work 
in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There is no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go? I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow. A silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically. And then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the imam of the village where I lived, the imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. It was about late November in Colorado, and I was about seven or eight years old. My father got the idea of taking us all for a weekend to a cabin that he was going to rent. My mother thought that it was a great idea for me, my sister, my father, and my mother to all bond. So that's exactly what happened. We rented a cabin for a few days. We took off school on Friday to get a head start on getting there, which I had no issue with. We got there and it was really cold. Well, it was almost December, so I guess it made sense that it was so cold. Anyway, we got all set up and decided where we would all sleep. We ate dinner, and then we all got set up for bed. 
and were thinking about what we would do the next day. We got there kind of late, so we couldn't do much on that first day. That night, though, I heard noises outside. It sounded kind of like footsteps. I looked out the window and saw nothing, so I figured it must have just been an animal. I tried to go back to sleep, but then about 15 minutes later, I heard it again. I woke my sister up. She was about 11 at the time, and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something out there, but we weren't quite sure what it was. We decided that it would be best for it to not see us, so we went back to sleep. I had a really hard time sleeping that night, and so did my sister. But when we eventually woke up after somehow falling asleep, my mother was inside making breakfast and my father was outside. I asked my mom if I could go outside with my dad and she said sure, while my sister stayed inside and waited for my mother to finish breakfast. I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a short chubby man. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran cap. He looked really nervous too, for some reason. He was sweating a lot as well, even though it was freezing outside. I walked over to him and my father. My father looked at me and said, oh, this is my son, and told him my name. The man looked at me and said, nice to meet you, kid. Name's Patrick. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted him back. And it may have been rude at the time, but I was just a kid, so I asked him, You look kind of scared. Are you alright? And he kind of coughed and replied with, Yeah, I'm fine. I uh, just went through shell shock. I'm a veteran. He said this, as though I couldn't tell already with the cap he was wearing. But he seemed normal after that. My father seemed to really like this guy, and I liked him too, at first. He told my father that he had also rented a cabin with his family and that they were really close to us, so he had decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast and he stayed and it was normal. I went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and scraped my knee and started crying. My father was inside at the time, a bad time for him to be inside. My mother was calling for him and he ran inside while I was out there with Patrick, alone. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come with him to his cabin because he had band-aids. I agreed and went with him. I wasn't a very smart kid. I went with Patrick and we talked about what I liked doing and I told him about the video games that I played and stuff like that. Then things got weird. He asked me what shoe size I was and how old I am. I didn't know what my shoe size was, I told him, but I told him my age. He just kind of chuckled and said something like, good to know. Also, his cabin was nowhere near ours. It was way back. It took about 20 to 25 minutes to walk there. I was tired and there was no point in getting the band-aid anymore but I still decided to keep going since I had walked so long. When we entered the cabin, he told me to go first, so I did. As soon as I walked in, I realized something. There was nobody in there, no family. I asked him where his family was and he didn't answer, pretending like he hadn't heard me. He locked the door and then I got kind of scared. He said, I'll be right back with the band-aid, kiddo. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere and then walked back and told me to have a seat and he would put it on. I sat down and he put it on me. He also held my leg with his other hand and kept rubbing it and said, you're a rather muscular kid. I like that. Obviously, I got kind of scared and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong, and I told him nothing, that my leg was feeling so much better. I then thought that my parents must be worried sick about me and that I should hurry back. He insisted that I stayed a little bit longer and that I ate there. I didn't want to, but I was alone, 
and if I ran, I didn't think I could find my way back to the cabin. The door was locked, so I just agreed and decided to eat with him and get it over with. He asked how much I weighed. I guessed and said about 73 pounds. He smiled, nodded, and said, perfect weight. I said, perfect for what? But he just kept smiling. I was really weirded out and asked him if I could go. He told me no, that things were just getting started and I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had such a weird tone when he said it too. Then I heard a big bang come from the bedroom. It was a closed door. Patrick stood up and looked kind of angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. I then heard him yelling, did I effing tell you that you could move? No, stay the F where you are, I have company. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door slowly. Sorry about that, it was just my wife. She's really sick and not allowed to be near visitors today. He was smiling while he said that. I wanted to go. I then looked around the room and noticed that there were clothes everywhere and it was really messy. He must have been living out here. At that moment, his wife walked out of the room. I'm hungry, she said. He looked pissed. Get back in there. His wife was extremely pale and looked like she'd been crying a lot. She was sniffing and had red circles under her eyes. She looked at me and then just walked back into the room. I asked him where his kids were. He didn't answer. He told me that he had kids clothes that he wanted me to try on, and that was the last straw. I knew I had to get out of that situation, but I didn't know how. I started crying, and then he hugged me, and he said, it'll be okay, little one. Nothing's gonna happen. Just try on these clothes. He walked into the back room, and I thought that that was the perfect time for me to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quietly as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I didn't want to take any more chances with Patrick, if that was even his name. I had a feeling that he had been lying. I mean, he lied about having kids, so who knows what else. I was in the woods trying to find my way back. I was still kind of close to his house, close enough to hear the shouting. I heard him yelling stuff to his wife, things along the lines of, where the F did he go? I knew I shouldn't have left him alone. You probably let him leave. I could have sworn I heard him call her a couple of pretty awful names. And then it happened. I stopped in my tracks. I heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and I looked in his direction. He was outside and seemed to be looking for me. I was far enough away to where I could barely see him, but I could tell he was looking for something. He then stepped out into the forest and I heard him shouting, hey kid, it's okay. You can come back now. You don't have to try on the clothes. And I have toys back in my cabin. All you have to do is come back. And then I ran. I ran as fast as I could in a straight line in hopes to find somebody in my family. I was running away and I thought I heard shouting, but I didn't stop to see what it was saying. Then after about an hour of running, I finally saw a cabin, my cabin. I ran to it. My father was outside looking around, looking for me. I ran up to him crying and told him Patrick wasn't a good guy, that he was really weird and was touching my legs and stuff. That's when my father immediately called the person he had rented the cabin from. The owner said he had nobody staying at that cabin. My father looked at me and told me to never follow any stranger ever again. We immediately left that day and asked for a refund for the next day. The guy renting them out apologized. The man that had the cabin rentals called the police and the police went back there and checked the cabin, but there was nobody there, not even his wife. His clothes and belongings were still there, though. Nothing really happened after that. They asked us questions and left. They never called us or told us anything about him ever again. 
Patrick most likely wasn't his real name, and he probably wasn't a veteran. I just really want to know what happened to him and his wife, and how he even got a wife in the first place, if she was his wife, and why they had lived back in that cabin. He seemed to have lived there for a while. I guess he left because he figured the police would be coming after him because he didn't rent the cabin. So many questions that I'll never get answered. I'm just really glad it's all over, and I'm really glad I got out of there. So, when I was about 15 to 16, my neighbor asked my sister, we'll call her Cassie, and I if we could stay at her large century house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said, of course. Cassie slept in the master bedroom, and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now, Cassie and I always loved creepy stuff, always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying we should go in there. I'm glad we never did. One night, Cassie stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. I was sitting on the couch with the dog and kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cassie, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, but she wasn't even home. What scares me is the beep goes off for any door, meaning it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. I brushed it off so I didn't get too scared and continued watching TV, except after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I look to my left and see the dog. I look to my right and see the cat so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day, I went to my neighbor's right after school, and I saw the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. I started to clean her dining room and moved chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it. And as I came back down to the dining room, one of the chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I just brushed it off and pushed it back. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me. So much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back home, she paid us, thanked us, but then asked if anything weird had happened. I explained everything to her and she sort of laughed and said, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying there. She also mentioned I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. She said that's the one place in her house she won't mess with because it just scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there for a few years, at least. Then, after I graduated high school and moved out of my parents, my neighbor offered a room in her house for me to stay, and I said yes. So after I moved in, she let me stay in what she called the piano room, which had a piano in it that came with the house. She took the piano out and moved it into the garage, so I actually had room for my stuff. For the first few nights, I definitely felt weird vibes, 
Maybe it was just because I am biased and had weird stuff happen to me years before, but I always believed I could sense supernatural stuff ever since a young age. Basically, the vibes were off. I would wake up in the middle of the night hearing what sounded like piano keys, but just enough to wake me up, and that was it. A few weeks later, I got myself a cat. I still have her to this day, and she's my sweet baby. Anyway, she would react and stare at things that were invisible to me. And while I know that cats can be weird, I know animals are sensitive to the paranormal. So I got freaked out any time she would meow or paw at something that wasn't there. While my neighbor still lived in and owned the house, she was constantly away on business trips or stayed at her mom's house. At this point, her dog passed away and she had her cat at her mom's house, which is why she had offered me a room, so the house wasn't always empty. I would hear so many strange noises at night coming from the master bedroom and in the kitchen. I remembered a weird one from the kitchen. It's sort of hard to make a good visual, but I'll try. So the basement door was actually next to the fridge, but the door was blocked by my neighbor's dishwasher so that nobody could get in or out unless the dishwasher was moved. I'm standing looking through the pantry, back facing the basement door, and in the reflection of the pantry door, I saw the basement door open up ever so slightly. I swear it felt like a horror movie. I whipped around, locked the basement door, and went to my room. My neighbor and I ended up having many conversations about the weird stuff. She didn't go into a lot of detail about her experiences, but my mom said she told her a few and was genuinely scared and that I shouldn't ask her anymore. I also just remembered another one from a few years before I moved in. I was out sitting by our sandbox in the backyard, and I saw out of the corner of my eye my neighbor go down to her driveway and take her garbage cans back up to the house. And you know that sound of a garbage can dragging along a gravel driveway? Distinct for sure, right? Anyway, I heard the sound stop right by her garage. I looked up to wave, but no one was there. I assumed maybe she had gone inside or something. But then when I went inside for the day, my mom said that my neighbor was going to be home late and asked if I could take her trash cans up to the house. I froze dead in my tracks. I swore up and down that I heard and saw someone doing it already. But my mom chalked it up to the heat of the summer getting to me. That's one I'll never forget. Another thing I should mention that always seemed eerie to me is that my neighbor constantly tried to sell the house. A family would buy it, but would move back out so quickly. This happened for years and years. The listing price wasn't expensive either, especially for being a big home in a decent area of town. As I got older, I now think that the aura of the house is just off and it made everyone move out. Eventually, she ended up selling it again, and the current residents have stayed there the longest. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s. 
to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail, near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the OZ bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around seven o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. 
something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and I'm still at least two miles from civilization, and that civilization in reality was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough though, I heard music, more specifically a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life, no birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush, absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods, certain places have it, but this was different somehow, unique to this place, unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue. The music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another park service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over. Without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. This happened to me when I was in my teens. For obvious reasons, I won't give my hometown's name, but it's located in Wisconsin. When I was 16, two buddies of mine from high school, we'll call them R and T, told me about a cemetery that didn't have any headstones out by the lake. I'm a nut when it comes to anything creepy or unsettling, so immediately, I was in. They were excited that they had actually convinced me to come with them. I was heavily depressed at the time and kept to myself, so it was rare that I got out. After school got out, R drove us to this supposed cemetery. It was nearing summer break, so it was a warm day. And where I live, warm days mean there are creatures out everywhere. We almost crushed a little turtle family on our way there but we made a detour to pick them up and get them off the road so no one else would. The turtles are okay. 
This hopefully shows you that there is indeed wildlife out and about in this area. Now, one thing about this cemetery is that it was essentially in the middle of nowhere. There was a small park with nature trails around it, leading to some pretty lovely sitting areas, stuff like that. There was an old Army Reserve training course to the east, and farther to the northwest was the mental hospital for the criminally insane. When you first come to this place, there's a boat launch where the ferry used to go back and forth across the lake to the city directly opposite us. The thing is, this place was off the beaten path. You had to go down a marked trail for about 50 feet before taking a sharp right through the underbrush and marshland. When we got there, there was a chain link fence and what I thought at first was an empty soccer field. It was eerie to say the least. R turns to me and his voice takes on a serious tone. Okay, he says. So before we go in there, there's a couple things you should know. One, do not go to the back right corner. And two, if you hear someone talk to you, do not turn around and leave immediately. I really didn't think a whole lot of this warning, mostly because R had a penchant for being overly dramatic about a lot of things. So I just agreed. I was eager to get inside the fence and see what this place was all about. As soon as I stepped across the threshold, everything went dead silent. I mean, legitimately everything. No birds sang, no crickets chirped. There weren't even mosquitoes in that place. It really threw me for a loop. My stomach sank immediately, but I didn't want to seem like a chicken. So I didn't say anything. I just looked around. T was a photography student, so he started to take pictures of the trees and everything around us. R followed him for most of the time, while I went off on my own. I was kind of just wandering at this point, but I stopped when my foot sank down farther than expected. At first, I thought I'd just fallen into a critter den or something. I was wrong. Under my foot was a round stone disc, covered in lichens and moss. I could barely make out the numbers 103 etched into it. My heart was in my throat, and a chill shot down my spine, like somebody had dropped an icicle through my skull. I suddenly got that horrible feeling. That kind of feeling when you find yourself somewhere that you don't belong. I was also a stupid teen, and curiosity got the better of me. I walked the length of the field, finding more round stones with numbers on them, all worn and weathered from age. I felt sick. When I looked up, I noticed something, and I was shocked that I hadn't noticed it before. Across from me, to my right, there was a sort of sitting area with an American flag hanging limply on its mast and a massive boulder with a carved base. I went over to look at it and found an inscription, which did nothing at all to ease my anxiety. It said, quote, this monument is dedicated to the 675 unnamed souls interned here. Amongst their number are doctors, nurses, and patients who were claimed during the epidemic. I don't remember the name of it, as well as Civil War soldiers who fought for the Union. I was freaked. 675? It hit me that this wasn't just an unmarked cemetery. It was full-on mass graves, if the numbered stones were anything to go by. I ran at a full tilt back to where the guys were hanging out, hyperventilating and saying that I wasn't okay to be here anymore. They gave me crap for being a baby, but I told them that I would happily walk home if they were going to be jerks about it. I wasn't comfortable walking across literal pits of bodies. I guess that convinced them because they agreed and we started to walk back the way we came. That's when I heard her voice. Behind us, maybe 15 feet or so, a woman cried out to us. 
It was the saddest, most desperately lonely sounding voice I have ever heard in my life. It was only a statement, but it froze me stone still. She just said, don't go. I didn't even breathe. R and T didn't turn around, but they did tell me to double time it back to the car. I don't remember running. I do remember the sudden blast of heat from the car door letting out the heat it had collected under the sun. We were gone in record time. The weirdest thing about it though, I couldn't stop crying. I full on sobbed for at least a half an hour after we'd gotten out of there, like the kind of crying you would do at a funeral. I was so sad and I didn't understand why but I couldn't shake it until we parked at a McDonald's and the guys handed me a bottle of water. I asked them if they had heard what I did when I had finally calmed down enough to speak. They said that they did and they were glad I was okay. I don't know who that was. She sounded like the loneliest woman to ever have existed. I could hear the tears in her voice before I even registered what she'd said. I wished I could know her name, but when she was one in 675, the odds were against me. What I do know, however, is that we were the only people in the park when we got there, and the only people there when we left. I refuse to ever go back to that place. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brother's. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read General Store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. 
I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair, staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-styled dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night. And if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school and he hands me the binoculars and says, look at the cow pasture, tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like. And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell, there was no blood or viscera, and the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moment scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird to say the least.
This incident occurred during the summer of 1983, as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so-called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer, I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile, deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning. Then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day, and I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still. The birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent, so I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs. We prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, very awake and alert. The wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank out windows that were popular in the 70s when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance, the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night. It's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar. To the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep, too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing, silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know, he whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house, down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat. It was not a dog. It was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. 
That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, a low frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed. Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house, a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just going to pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, well, what would you like to know? You know what that was. Your dad knows. I know. We all know. Not much to talk about, other than how scary it was. And frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, that was pretty much the end of it. I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owned this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there, though, because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, 
my close friend's cousin. We weren't really close at the time, and we fought a lot, but surprisingly, we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day, and then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze, and it very quickly climbed this tall tree, and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen, if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried though, I said to my friend that we should leave, and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110% because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive, because there was no movement. But then, it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy, and very quickly, it climbed up a tree a little more, and then went to the next one, and then the next one, getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent, and its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent, and it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear, and once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us, though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us and finally it faded away ahead of us as if it had gone ahead, but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, 
and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse and there would have been had it been raining and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left, but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. When he checked his iPod touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m. We started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed in what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident we discussed it, and we told everything from both of our points of view, and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again, and I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5 p.m. for a very long time. This is my favorite paranormal story, so I wanted to share. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and I needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple. However, I was also getting married, so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. Those who live in Orlando know how expensive it can be, and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So, finally, we found this nice little house. And when I say little, I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal. He didn't really want to spend any time fixing the place up because it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home, and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know that they would be away for a bit. It turns out her mom passed away a few days prior and they were taking her back to the old country, as she put it. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the air about the house did change a little, or at least I thought it did. Shortly after, I got married and we settled into our daily lives. I was working on the front porch one day when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice, so I brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I saw him, figuring it was most likely either Lillian's, his mother-in-law's, or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing, or more to the point, my wife noticed and blamed me for, was that the keepsakes from our wedding got moved around. They were never where she left them. I told her that I had nothing to do with moving them. But her being her, she wasn't having any of it. So we moved them back. A few days later, we come home from dinner and there they were, rearranged again. I looked over at her and said, okay, how did I do it this time? The brooch was still there in the same place on the mantel, but everything else had been moved around. This happened a few more times until my wife finally just got over it and left them wherever they were. One day, I was dusting and I came across the brooch on the mantel. 
I looked at it and a breeze went by. I tried to tell myself it was just the fan, but that got me thinking about all the odd things that had started happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought, and she said that I was crazy. She said, do you really think the ghost of the old lady that lived here is haunting the house and moving our wedding stuff around? I said, well, yeah. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend, the landlord came by to mow and I went outside to give back the brooch, thinking maybe that would change things. His wife was in the truck reading a book and I walked over and handed the brooch to her. Well, she turned about 10 shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I'd found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that it had been her mother's and one day she, the daughter, the wife of the landlord, had been outside playing with it and had lost it. Her mother, Lillian, was very mad at her for having played with it and for losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face she hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window, there was a shadow behind the lace curtains. It looked like a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock and when I got back up, the person wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around, didn't see anything. So I moved on thinking it was a trick of the light through the lace. A few days later, I get home and my wife starts rambling, asking if I smelled the flowers. She also thought we had mice or rats because she kept hearing movement. I told her I didn't smell the flowers. I kind of poked her a bit about it and I asked her if it sounded like little feet or footsteps. She looks at me and then says, footsteps. After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch and I would see out of the corner of my eye movement or a change of light, not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom, which is a straight shot. There isn't any light that can move way back there. There were other things like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom a lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors and it really carries. I decided that Lillian was still here even after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter, but it was still her house. So I figured she was well within her rights to live there too. And besides, I loved the way she messed with my wife. She's so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I would talk to Lillian. I never got a response back, and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids there before we moved on to another city. Shortly after we moved out, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we miss living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down and a new house had been put up in its place that was way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much, and I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the owners crazy, like she did my wife. <laughs>